is for you to have access to those treatments, but that will be covered um, during the sessions. And then tomorrow we have talks on myelin repair, um, fatigue um, uh, research, stem cells, um, and um, how we decide, uh, we, the MS Society, decide um, what research to fund, um, which of course is a big subject, quite complicated. We fund a lot, a lot of research. Um, so, uh, we think this is going to be a fascinating weekend. Um, I'm afraid it does mean you're going to have to look at your very complicated program sheet um, and, and work out what's best for you to um, come and um, participate in. But, you know, do come, and we want you to feel that you're getting all the information you want. So if you're not, go to our hub and ask. Um, go to the research um, center where our researchers will be, and they can help you. Um, and, um, you know, this is, as I said, your opportunity to ask questions, get answers. Um, in terms of the progress in um, MS research, um, you know, in particular, uh, we are at a, a historical moment in um, research into MS. Um, there is a belief amongst the research community that we are um, breaking through. Um, and as I said, um, you will hear about um, our tentative steps, if you like, into progressive research. Um, that that um, is on today. Um, so. Um, please do come to that and, um, and hear that, because I know that's been a, a big subject of concern that we, we weren't addressing um, this really devastating uh, part of MS. Um, so, in, in fact, last month, research was published in The, in the, Lance, the Lancet showing that the cholesterol-lowering drug, um, simvastatin, um, could potentially slow progression in people with progressive MS. And further trials um, are needed, um, and uh, Jeremy Chataway, as I said, will be here to talk about that um, and what is happening. Um, and we have gone into, as I alluded to earlier, um, an international progressive MS alliance. Um, so we're working with partners globally on this whole area of progressive MS and finding um, treatments. Um, so we want to uh, accelerate the pace of research um, because we want to bring the day, we can say, we have beaten MS much closer than it is. Um, we've used this expression before, we're really pushing for it. Um, to do this, we're exploring ways we can significantly increase our income. Um, we're looking towards more diverse sources of income, such as grants and trusts, corporate partnerships, and high-value donors to support our activities. So you will hear a lot more about that, not, not in this um, event, but over the coming year, you will hear um, what we're doing in, in those areas. But this is going to be um, an absolutely uh, scorching um, new way of us raising funds for research. Um, and actually, I, I'm allowed to tell you that we are planning a multi-million pound appeal. Um, it hasn't been done before. Um, well, they did an appeal, I think, in the 80s, um, but nothing big has been done since then. Um, and um, this is something that I personally have been very involved in. I'm, I'm very, very passionate about it. Um, I think that we have a responsibility for the next generation as well as the current generation. So I'm not in any way um, trying to distinguish um, between the two, but the next generation, I want to um, find a way of curing MS, um, although we tend to avoid the word cure, but um, ending MS. So, as, as I've mentioned, you, you will hear more about this in the coming year, um, so watch this space. Um, and um, we really are aiming to have a game changer for MS research in the UK. Let's just briefly, I'll talk about the event, um, because I know that research talks are one of the biggest draws, and we normally get very big audiences for uh, research talks. Um, but there are, of course, many other things going on. And we've been able to learn from previous events um, how to make these more successful. So what we've done this time is to create zones um, to enable 
a more in-depth engagement uh, with subjects of interest to you, like symptom management, work, uh, benefits and services, mood and cognition. Um, so look out for the different um, zones. Look out for the volunteers who are there to help you. Um, and um, we've also got area, areas for carers, for friends, for family, and there are some fun activities throughout the weekend. Um, I'm thrilled that somebody has booked me a massage. So, um, you know, there's the opportunity to have a massage or beauty treatment if you're quick and book it. Um, within each of the zones, there will be delegates. Uh, the delegates can do things. There are some interactive workshops. Um, do take part in them. Um, I know people love the dogs. Um, I know they love the cooking. You'll smell the cooking. Um, and we're delighted that um, in the cooking zone, we have um, one of the participants, one of the finalists from um, the great Cake Bake Off. Um, so um, that's an exciting one to, to go to. Um, and um, if you want a break, um, then you can, as I said, go to the, the spa, but book it. Um, and then right in the middle, there's the MS Hub, which is where you'll find a lot of the volunteers who will be able to help you with any questions. They'll be able to point you in the right direction. Um, and um, I'm told that if you ask them nicely, um, the hub staff and volunteers can give you a sneak preview of a campaign which Michelle, our chief executive, um, talked about last night um, at the opening reception, um, which is um, a campaign we've put together for this coming week, which is MS Week, and it's about improving access to treatments. And um, there is a session also um, this during the uh, program. Um, I think there are in fact two called um, We Have MS, um, at which Stuart Nixon, who was um, on our board and was my vice chairman when I first started, um, is speaking with um, his wife, uh, Mary, and um, Anita Rose. Um, and they'll be talking about the highs and lows of living with MS. Um, we know me, uh, Stuart's a very good speaker on this subject. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we um, are appointing Stuart as an ambassador for the society. Um, and um, he will be working with us on the appeal in Wales. Um, so this is great. We're really pleased he's accepted to do that. Um, and uh, Stuart also got an MBE in the New Year's Honours for his work with MS. So, um, I have to finally thank the, um, the sponsors, um, Visit Manchester, Biogen, whose little film we just saw, Next, Novartis, um, and Genzyme. Um, and um, then I can now wrap up, because I know there's a session coming on straight after me. So, let me just re-emphasize, it's a busy weekend. There are lots of things to choose from. Um, and um, most of all, remember that MS Life provides a unique opportunity for you all to, to learn, um, to mix, to meet each other, to share experiences. Don't be shy, please. Um, and if you want to ask any questions about anything, look out for the volunteers who are wearing the T-shirts, the black T-shirts, which say, can I help you? Please enjoy the weekend. Thank you.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Get Active session. Um, as you can see, I'm Jane Petty. I'm the program lead for physiotherapy with the MS Society. Um, I'm going to talk just a bit of an introduction, and then we have three speakers who are going to talk about research that we have funded or are in the presence of funding at the moment. There was a very good saying that if exercise were a pill, it would be one of the most cost-effective drugs ever invented. Um, the NICE guidelines for MS identified the benefit of exercise with emphasis on community-based programs, and the LIFE study showed that 60% of people would prefer to exercise in the community alongside other people. We did a survey of My MS, My Needs, which showed that a lot of people didn't feel that they were supported in order to be able to get active within their own communities. And so what we've done is um, we've started to look at you know, how we can research and how we can support people to be active within their own communities. The MS Society is supporting research to improve the evidence base for exercise in MS. It's developing, we are developing awareness training for fitness instructors and activity instructors so that they understand the particular issues of pe that people with MS have in order to exercise, so things like the hidden symptoms of fatigue. Um, we've just funded the first two Pilates courses for Pilates type exercise for MS and the Pilates people who are running those courses are here today and if you want to have a taster session of Pilates you can go along as a plug to the Get Active Zone. Um, the Oxford Books, um, we're funded, we've part funded a, a module for fitness instructors around physical activity for neurological conditions. And we're developing partnerships with other leisure providers, people like Extend and Sports and Leisure Centres, so that we can try and get the opportunities out there for you closer to home. We're giving education grants for fitness instructors, physios and people to do the courses. And we're supporting the branches to actually think about how they can provide better and more inclusive activities for people with MS. And we're going to start running some activity days, uh, taster days around the country where people will be able to try out, like they are we're going to be able to try out at MS Life, things like yoga, tai chi, pilates, all these different sorts of activities that you maybe not have thought about. There is archery, the shooting, there's all sorts of things that you can have a go at this weekend. So please go and have a go and talk to the stands like Riding for Disabled and Sportability and look at what actually they can offer you that you can be inclusive. I'm going to introduce the three speakers. Um, Professor John Saxton graduated from Loughborough University in 1990 before embarking on PhD research in skeletal muscle physiology at the University of Wolverhampton, it's a long, long this, and Massachusetts. Following a period of postdoctoral work, he undertook lectureships at Oxford Brookes University and the University of Sheffield before working as a research physiologist in health and safety executive research laboratories in Sheffield. He spent 10 years at Sheffield Hallam University, where he led the Active Health Research Group and was principal investigator for several random controls exercise trials with clinical populations, including cardiovascular disease and cancer. In March 2010, he was appointed to the position of Professor of Clinical Exercise Physiology at the University of East Anglia. Marietta van den Linden studied human movement sciences at the Free University in Amsterdam and gained her PhD at the University of Strathclyde. She has worked as a researcher in the NHS Clinical Gait Analysis Service and is currently a senior research fellow in rehab sciences at the Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. Since 2008, she's been involved in research regarding self-management strategies in people with MS, in particular orthotic interventions for people with dropped foot and Pilates or core stability exercises for wheelchair users. Sarah Thomas is a research fellow and deputy director of the Bournemouth University Clinical Research Unit and a research design service consultant. She obtained her first degree and PhD in psychology from Southampton University and has been working in health service research for over 10 years. She's particularly interested in psychological aspects of chronic conditions and designing and evaluating complex interventions. Recent research activities include the development and manualization of a non-pharmacological group-based intervention for multiple sclerosis fatigue or facets. And at the moment is leading a pilot study called Me Vitalize, exploring physiotherapy supported home-based use of the Nintendo Wii for people with MS. I'd like to introduce John Saxton to start talking. You're number two, is it? Sarah, Sarah, yeah. talk about We Vitalize. <laughs> Hello.
Kia everyone. As, um, as uh, Jane said in the introduction, my name is Sarah Thomas and I'm from Bournemouth University. I just wanted to say how excited I am to be part of such an amazing event and have the opportunity to present here today. I thought a good place to start is to explain why we've called our study Me Vitalize. Well, as you can see there, there's that character. Can you see the resemblance? Yeah, that's supposedly me, as you can see. I've had to change my hair on my me character because I had a bit of a haircut recently. But so the me there that you see is a virtual caricature character that's specific to the we. And we wanted to call our intervention Me Vitalize to convey that it's a self-management intervention. And the vitalize aspect uh, captures the sense of fun, energy and uh, activity that we're hoping to promote with our intervention. Now, research always involves teamwork, and I'm part of a fantastic team, and I just wanted to acknowledge all the other people that are taking part in this, that, that are working with me on this research. So there we have Louise Fazakali, and she's a physio, and she is running the study on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'd also like to do a shout-out for Sarah Collier and Sarah Brenton. They're both the physios who are delivering the Me Vitalize intervention. And I'd also like to acknowledge Jo Hickson and Kelly Saunders, who are people with MS, who were involved in the original workshop and have now joined our steering committee. So I'd like to acknowledge that this uh, research is funded by the Multiple Sclerosis Society. Um, it's been approved by the NHS ethics system. And we have a couple of people working as safety monitors. Um, and that's Mark Cosborn, who, Cosburn, who's a neurologist, and Kate Jupp, who's a physio. And lastly, but not, by no means least, thanks to all the participants who've participated in it, in the study so far. So here's the we. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but you can see that there's a, a game console and a remote control and a balance board there. Now, the Wii offers the potential of active gaming in the comfort of one's own home, and it uses the movement of the player to control gameplay. And so it offers the ability to do activities using virtual reality that require similar functional movement as they would do in the real world. So for example, if you're playing a game of golf, you swing the Wii, Wii remote like that, or if you're playing baseball, you get into the position and you hit like that. So it's been designed for the general population, and we need to bear that in mind, that it was originally designed to promote fit fitness at, at home. The, the balance board is a pressure sensitive board and it measures the user's weight and their center of gravity. And you use the balance board by shifting your weight to the left, right, forwards and backwards, and you can control the gameplay by using that. So I wanted to just think about what some of the potential benefits of the Wii might be. Well, it's low cost. It's very cheap to buy now. Um, it's, you can buy it off the shelf. It's easy to set up. There's no need to put on sports clothes. For example, you can get up in the morning with your pajamas on, not need to get washed or get dressed and, and use the Wii. It's fun, so there's a wide range of games and activities. Some of them are competitive, some of them aren't. Some use both mind and body. Some can be played in a sitting position. The Wii gives a lot of feedback. Um, you can play with other people. It's suitable for across the age ranges and you can use it for brief bouts of time in the home without needing to travel, and it's quite easy to take rests when you need to. The balance board seems to be particularly good for balance and core stability. And I've put gateway there to emphasize that maybe it's a gateway to lead to more physical activity for people. So, but what are the disadvantages of the Wii? Well, there are risks, so it could lead to injury. So there's Things such as uh, the wee knee has been reported in the literature, also nintendonitis. And these kinds of injuries often come from playing games excessively and also things like wee tennis, which you can get quite over-enthused about. So although there are issues like this, these are generally quite rare. Uh, the Wii isn't everyone's cup of tea, so not everyone likes these kinds of games. Some people are very outdoorsy and, and prefer to go outside to get exercise. Now, the feedback that the Wii gives, as I've said, it was designed for a, the general population. Now, I did a body fit test the other week, and it said, do you find yourself tripping a lot when walking? And it described me 
on another occasion as unbalanced. Now, I would think if I was a person with MS, I might be not too happy if I had balance issues and I tried really hard and it then asked me whether I tripped a lot. So we wanted to explore whether the feedback would be demoralizing or upsetting for people. There's also the hassle factor. You might have to move a coffee table in your living room to accommodate it. You sometimes need to sync the remote controls. And it can be quite hard to use the remote control as a pointer. Sometimes that's quite difficult. And there's also sometimes issues with others in a family monopolizing it. So maybe the kids are on it all the time and the parent can't get a look in. And the novelty can, can wear off. So we wanted to explore that. So the aim of our research was to develop an intervention using the Wii. And a good starting point for that is to do a, a literature search. And so we looked at the Wii literature, and it has been expanding rapidly since we first started the study. It's been used in a wide range of chronic conditions. So for example, stroke, Parkinson's, diabetes, and knee replacement. And there's lots of small scale studies but, and, and the results so far have been promising, but there is a need for more larger studies. And a recent pilot study in MS suggested that there was a need to encourage and support people to change and maintain their behavior in the longer term, a need to do research using the Wii in the home setting rather than just in the hospital and outpatient setting, and to follow people up in the longer term. So we held, a, we held a workshop with people with MS who were regular Wii users to get some ideas about how to design our intervention. And we asked them all sorts of questions about how they use the Wii, the benefits and drawbacks, problems they encounter, what makes them continue to use it. And I've just got a couple of quotations from people here to illustrate the kinds of advice that people gave us. And these quotations were used in, in the guidance materials that we've developed for our intervention. So I'll just read this. You've got to prepare yourself before you even set foot on it and say, well, this is what I'm going to achieve today for me. My MS is different from anybody else's. If the we gives me negative feedback, I just think it doesn't know my world. And another one here. Don't expect to improve each time. Don't take it to heart. We all fluctuate with good and not so good days. It's important to do a game rather than get through all the levels. Focus on the positive effects of feeling stronger and get a sense of achievement and feeling of well-being from attempting the game. So I've, talk I've talked a lot about Me Vitalize. I'm now going to explain what the intervention is. Well, it, it, as I say, it's a home-based intervention supported by a physiotherapist, and the general approach is one of a partnership between the participant and the physiotherapist. Now, although I've described it as home-based, because we had some safety, safety concerns, we have included two sessions at the hospital that people come and meet with the physiotherapist, and it gives them a, tr gives them a chance to get used to the, the Wii equipment. So in this first session that they come to the hospital, the benefits of physical activity are described. They're given a demo of some of the games. They get, they're, allowed, they're given the opportunity to get familiar with the controls, and they create their own me, like the one you saw that, of me. And then in the next session in the hospital, the uh, physio helps the individual to try out activities with supervision and support, considers activities that seem appealing and that they'd like to try, and start considering goals with the individual. And then they can jointly make a plan for a program of activity together to start off with. And, and then the Wii is installed in the home with the participants' t television. And we give them three sets of software to play, Wii Sports, Wii Sports Resort, and Wii Fit Plus. And we, we don't stop them from using other games. If they want to borrow games or buy games, we say that's, that's fine. We're just interested in how they use them. And then after that, they're, they're encouraged with ongoing support and monitoring. So the physiotherapist visits them two times at home to see how they're getting on over the six months and also provides monthly telephone support. And we give them a personal activity workbook. And this is a place where they can keep a record of their own progress. So they can write down their goals, write down safety considerations, games they like and don't like, 
questions that they have faced and ideas for overcoming challenges and questions for the physio and write down their contacts that they've had with the physio. So we hope that providing these resources will engage participants in the process, help them to be actively working with the physiotherapist and encourage behaviour change and maintenance. And I've just got some examples of some of the materials here. So this is an example of a, a goal that somebody set. And I'm not going to go into too much detail because of time, but you can see that people set goals using the resources. And here's an example of a coping planner to cope with challenges that somebody faces. And here we have a games descriptor. And, and this is a place where people can write down notes about how they've got on with playing a game. So then we went on and ran a pilot study to find out how people get on with Me Vitalize. And this is with 30 people with MS. They either received Me Vitalize immediately or after six months. And what did we measure? We measured problems that people experienced, so whether they had any falls or near falls, whether they experienced dizziness, pain, or any difficulty using the Wii. We measured their balance, stepping, and timed walking, measured their hand coordination, levels of physical activity, their confidence, fatigue, and well-being, how they used the Wii, and we got feedback from participants and physios. So what feedback did we get? Well, on the downside, and I should say this is preliminary feedback to give a flavour. We haven't formally analysed any of our interviews yet. But on, to give you a flavour, uh, people said that not all the games were suitable, only so many games you can use with MS. People said you can sometimes get away and get carried away and overdo it, do too much. And we've had one lady who got very carried away with a hula hooping. She, she got very enthused over that. Um, you can experience pain sometimes. There's a hassle factor of going through the same menus. And weather can be a problem as well. In the hot weather, sometimes it, it, it can make it difficult to use the Wii. But somebody said that she, she was happy to wear her shorts and vest when using the Wii, which she wouldn't have felt comfortable with in a gym. And also the time aspect, incorporating it into your own life. So the, the feedback on the upside was people said it increased their levels of physical activity, that it was fun to do and convenient in the home. It enabled interactive time with other family members. Some people had some weight loss. It improved coordination and balance, hand dexterity. Um, one person said that they'd noticed they could peg their washing out on the line a lot easier since using the Wii. So people said they feel more energized. It helps link your brain with your feet gives you a buzz, and really challenges you. And just to end, I've got a quotation here from somebody who attended, who said, it's been really nice because of all the contact and encouragement that you get, and I do think that that's important. I don't think that you could just say to someone, there you go, there's your we, get on with it. Thank you. I think we'll take questions at the end of the three sessions, if that's all right with people. Great. Okay, um, it's great to be here today. Lovely venue and um, enjoy it. There's lots going on. I certainly will be after this uh, talk. Um, I'm here to talk about a, a randomized control trial, uh, which we did in Sheffield um, a year or two ago. I'm just going to set my stopwatch so I don't go over time here, Jane. Um, you got BDI on me. Um, and it was basically, it was about a practi it was a practic it was designed to uh, provide a practical approach to providing accessible exercise for people with MS. So the rationale for doing this study, firstly, um, Long-term supervised exercise can be costly, can, can be cost ineffective. So there's a major challenge. A major challenge is to develop exercise programs which are accessible, which are pragmatic, and which can build confidence for people to go away and do exercise on their own and maintain it for long-term periods of time. So you get long-term benefits from exercise. That was the challenge of, of Exim, Exims. 
So the first thing we did was we got some local funding to do a pilot study. Uh, and this involved 28 people with MS. Uh, we randomized them into two groups. One group got the exercise, one group were controlled so we could compare against. Um, and what the exercise is, <coughs> it was partly supervised. So, and the exercise itself involved uh, moving around a gym and doing little kind of bites of aerobic exercise. So maybe um, four or five different types of aerobic exercise for about three to five minutes, but having like, you know, two to three minutes rest between each bout of exercise. Um, we also incorporated things like resistance exercise, such as, you know, light weight training uh, and balance. So this pilot study showed um, that people with MS, MS found this exercise accessible, could do it, and then we, when we um, analyzed the results, um, we got some nice quotes. So things uh, people, that people were saying after the exercise where it made me feel better and woke me up if I was feeling sleepy, um, eased aches and pains, um, improved my strength, stamina in my legs, uh, made me more awake and perked me up, was sleeping better, more energy, gave me vitality, better refresh. So we had lots of positive, good positive feedback from the pilot work. Um, and from that, we were very uh, lucky and fortunate to um, receive funding from the MS Society to do a larger scale randomized trial um, to, to test um, um, the benefits of this exercise over a longer term period of time, up to nine months. So these were the research questions. So in this trial, we had 120 people with MS. So we recruited 120 people. Um, and we randomized them into two groups. So half of them, 60, got the exercise and half got standard care. Uh, this is the way you have to design experiments so that you can compare whether the exercise is actually better than standard care. So it was a 12-week intervention. It was partly supervised. In weeks one to six, we offered two supervised exercise sessions in that, in that, se in that setting that you just saw. So uh, people, the participants, came to the little potted lab, potted uh, exercise suite, and did two supervised exercise sessions with short bouts, short bites of aerobic exercise, resistance and balance training. And we prescribed one home exercise session. So we talked about them, uh, to them about what they could do at home, and we prescribed one home exercise session, which mirrored what was going on in the, in the, um, in the research lab. In weeks um, seven to 12, we swapped it around. So we only offered one supervised session um, and we prescribed two home exercise sessions. So what we were trying to do, we were trying to put the onus and, and build um, independence and confidence so that the participants felt more able to do home exercise so that they weren't dependent on the supervised exercise sessions. And you can see the, the types of exercise that we um, included. We also uh, bolted on or used what are known as cognitive behavioral strategies. So during the exercise sessions, we, we kind of educated participants about the benefits of exercise, the safety aspects, warm up and cool down. And then week, weeks three to four, we asked them what they'd learned, how they felt they were benefiting from exercise. Um, we educated them about training principles. And then as it, as it moved on to sort of week seven to 12, we started thinking about, okay, what, how can we give participants a plan to carry on exercise? So after the 12th week, they were pretty much on their own. Um, you know, what could we do to help them uh, build confidence for self-directed exercise, independent exercise? And so we started thinking about goal, goal setting, um, you know, what, what facilities are available in the home environment, what support structures do you have, uh, significant others, partners, how can they get involved, that type of thing. So we measured these health outcomes at uh, baseline after the 12-week supervised part of the intervention. And then when people were then left on their own for another six months, we measured them again at nine months after they um, joined the study. So it, the last follow-up measurement was nine months. We measured things like physical activity behavior, um, neurological functioning, um, and function, six minute walk time. So like we did an aerobic six minute walk test. We measured fatigue and we measured quality of life. We also did some focus groups. So we wanted to really get a, an understanding of what the full range of benefits were to participants of engaging in this program. 
So this is all looks very scientific, but basically all, all it means, all it shows is we had high adherence to the, to the exercise. So we, we had um, um, adherence, which means how many uh, patients, uh, how many people um, attended the sessions was very high. So of all the sessions offered, of all the supervised and home exercise sessions prescribed, you can see that generally about 80% of the exercise was achieved by the participants. Don't worry about this. The, the messages here are, I looked at how much aerobic exercise did, did the participants achieve. In total, it was about 800 minutes over 12 weeks. Now, if you divide that by 12 weeks, you get something like 70 minutes a week. Now, the, the current, uh, current government recommended levels of phys physical activity are 150 minutes a week. So what the message here is participants were achieving about half that. In fact, if you look at the, the moderate intensity physical activity, it was about a third of that. It was actually about 47 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity was being achieved. That's about one third of the current government guidance for physical activity. So that, that's an important message because uh, this is another um, in interesting message is what, what were people doing at home? So effectively people were doing community-based walking, um, people with lower levels of disability were using um, public facilities, things like gardening, that's what people were doing at home. So what we found was that self-directed exercise improved after 12 weeks. So people in the, in the exercise intervention were doing more exercise off their own back. They were more confident, independent exercises. At nine months, we were, we're not sure. The objective measure suggested not that they'd gone back to where they were before, but the subjective questionnaire, you know, what are you doing more? They said, yes. So we're not sure about nine months. Fatigue, we found that the exercise group um, the number of people who were experiencing clinically important levels of fatigue went down from about over 70% of, of, of the people in the, in the group to less than 50% were experiencing clinically important levels of fatigue at three months after the supervised exercise. This is very complicated, but if you can see the yellow, where, where I've colored them in yellow, that means a positive effect. And what, these, what this, these sli this slide is showing is all the domains of quality of life that were improved by exercise. So if you see yellow, it means it was a positive effect in relation to the control group. There was a lot of quality of life improvement after 12 weeks, after the part supervised, supervised session. At nine months, it had kind of regressed back, but there were three aspects, emotional well-being, social function, and overall quality of life was still elevated at nine months. I'll move, it, I'll move it on a little bit now because we're getting towards 10 minutes. Uh, we've just looked at the qualitative al analysis. So we did focus groups and semi-structured interviews to find out what the perceived benefits were for, from people in the exercise group. And we're just about to submit this for publication. So there are a number of different themes. Um, the first one, the experience of MS um, exercise-related advice and support. And there was a lot of variability. So, so some people were saying, I don't recall any professional mentoring or anything about exercise. So some people were saying they didn't really um, get support for exercise in, in their treatment for MS. So there were no advice. And I hope that with trials like this, that will change and that more physios and um, health professionals will uh, become attuned to the benefits of exercise and will start promoting exercise more. Um, so what was the participants' views of taking part? So the people were generally grateful to have had the opportunity to, to engage with this. Um, people generally enjoyed it. So you can see some quotes, very good, I needed it. I did enjoy coming, um, you know, just everything about it. I enjoyed coming so much I look forward to attending. So people generally enjoyed participation, participating in the program. So what were the perceived benefits? This is the final two slides, Jane, I promise. 10 minutes is up. But, um, so what were the perceived benefits? Fatigue was, was one aspect. I feel as though I'm less fatigued. I don't have many floppy days. I still get the odd one, but nowhere like, uh, where like it was. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read these. <clears throat> Outlook. 
I think when you've got your, um, you know, your MS, you put on your world becomes smaller. You think, I can't do that. I might feel tired before I get far. And then you realize you can. So outlook, general outlook improved. That was another theme that came out of the qualitative analysis. Physical benefits. I do find simple things like turning over in bed, which isn't a very easy task, and picking things up on the floor without collapsing. Things of that nature are a lot easier. So physical benefits were noted. Family impact. So um, participants experiencing you know, positive um, experiences with their family. My little boy will be surprised when I say, yeah, all right, we'll go swimming, or yeah, I'll go for a walk. So it had a family impact for some people. Confidence. For, think, for me, I think it was taking the mystery out of exercise and giving the confidence that it's safe to do this and you'll benefit from it. And I think that guided exercise in the initial stages was the key. So that's a key thing. It's good to get some guidance early on in an exercise program. Social impact. I really enjoyed the social aspect of meeting people and talking because you don't always get that when you have MS. You tend to be at home a lot on your own, so I enjoyed coming. And I miss not coming. So conclusions. Exims had a lot of positive benefits, certainly after the part supervised program. Longer term, I think we need better methods of keeping in touch with people, keeping them motivated to exercise, because after nine months, it seems that some people had maybe gone back to where they were before. So we need to keep contact. We need to keep people motivated to exercise. I'd like to acknowledge the research team. This was a, was a big effort from a lot of uh, different universities, a lot of different health professionals. Jane was involved as, uh, providing physio support and a lot of other people. And I'll just leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Well done, that's all right. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> I can live with 12 minutes. There is. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marietta van der Linden. I've been asked by the MS Society to tell something about the research we did uh, on Pilates for people uh, who use a wheelchair. So first, what is Pilates? Not to be confused by pirates. Uh, Pilates is aiming um, to improve core stability. It aims to uh, make you more aware of your core, the muscles uh, in the trunk. These are the deep muscles, so not the six packs, but the muscles underneath and the muscles around the spine. And if these muscles are working better or you're more aware of these muscles, you've got a better stability of your trunk. And if you've got a better stability of your trunk, you may be able to move your arms and your legs easier. Pilates also uh, improves, um, um, pr promotes um, good posture. And again, posture is a big problem for some people, and it promotes flexibility. It does a lot of flexibility exercises. So there are two, roughly two types of Pilates. One is just using a mat or a chair. Uh, can be done in group settings, can be done at home. And the other one is using Pilates machines. Um, I've got to say that the name Pilates comes from Joseph Pilates, who was um, lived in the early 1900s and developed uh, some exercises for people uh, rehabilitating from their war injuries. Uh, so it's, it's quite old a type of exercise. And the, the picture you see at the, at the bottom is of some patients with, their, with some machines they, he developed already in, in that, that time. So it uses pulleys and springs to get into postures which uh, sometimes might be a bit tough, uh, difficult on your own. The second type, the, the Pilates machines, of course, is harder to at home, and it's usually done on a one-to-one -one basis. But both of them uh, are being used for people who use a wheelchair. So why Pilates for people with MS? Some people with, Pilates, um, with MS might have problems with their balance. So the focus of Pilates on core stability and balance might improve your feeling of stability and control. Secondly, uh, the focus on flexibility might help people who are experiencing some stiffness or uh, have some spasticity. And finally, although Pilates does make you work hard, the risk of overheating might be slightly less than uh, for other types of exercises. So why Pilates for people who use a wheelchair? Uh, well, long term use of a wheelchair might compromise your posture. You get pain in your neck, in your shoulders, your back. And again, the, the focus of Pilates on core stability, on posture, um, might um, reduce the pain, might be able to, if you've got a stable 
uh, sitting position you might be able to reach or transfer. And we had one, one, one great example of, of the trial we did that after a few sessions, one of the participants was able to dress her bottom half again because she, she wasn't only stronger, but she was more aware of how to use her core muscles to stabilize herself. And um, exercises can be adapt to every level. Um, it can be done in a chair, it can be done on a mat, lying. Uh, so that's a very good thing about Pilates. So these are very good um, suggested benefits, but is there any evidence? So, so far, there have only been two studies, uh, one in the UK and some in Iran, I think. Some of those studies compared Pilates with other types of exercises, but they all found that after eight to 12 weeks training, people had a better balance, better posture, improved muscle strength, both um, upper limb and bow, uh, lower limb, improved their walking uh, performance, and one study also uh, in, uh, reported a reduced fatigue after um, eight weeks of Pilates training. But none of these studies included people who use a wheelchair, and they're all quite small-scale studies. So in 2010, we were funded by the MS Society to uh, carry out a small-scale study into Pilates for people um, who use wheelchairs. We measured uh, sitting balance and other people how to move sideways. Um, but also looked at uh, people's pain. We asked how people, um, if there's any activities of daily living who improved or are not improved. And we asked about people's fatigue and quality of life. So we took part, again, a quite small scale study. Um, 14 used a wheelchair, one used a scooter for getting around. Some people had wheel electric wheelchairs as well, I think about four or five. Seven transferred independently, but other people, uh, the others used um, a slider board or um, the help of one other person to transfer. So our Pilates program lasted 12 weeks, and similar to Professor Jackson Saxon's uh, research, the first six weeks were um, twice a week, and home program at home, and the second six weeks was once a week. Uh, just to see also what people could do, whether it was feasible to do two, two sessions or one session. There were quite small groups, um, also because there's not much space in some of the community centers where we did the, the study. Um, and they were, of course, led by a qualified, uh, qualified Pilates instructor. But I have to say, it was not a real-world scenario. Um, for those people who uh, needed it, we uh, arranged taxis to and from the classes, and the funding paid for the, for the taxis. So what we find, similar to previous studies, we uh, found an improved sitting balance. People were more stable and able to move sideways and forward. They were slightly straighter up in, the, in their chairs, and they reported quite, uh, quite um, dramatically uh, reduced pain in shoulders and, and neck. There was also a reduced impact of MS on daily life. However, we didn't find any um, uh, changes in fatigue or breathing capacity. We also measured how the lung function, because if you are uh, more upright, you might have a better lung function, but didn't find any effects on that. We asked about activities people find difficult and whether had the Pilates program has changed that. Um, well, quite a um, few activities people found uh, easier, like dressing bottom half, transfers, and balance. Focus groups, I think it was a very important part of our research because people could actually uh, tell us in our own words what they thought about the, the study, or about the program, the Pilates program. People, f well, these are some, some quotes like we had in the previous um, presentations. I have a better idea of my balance and be able to reach more. They just find small differences, um, just a wee bit, and that made it easy to do the walking and all these kinds of exercise just help me to have the stability to do that little bit more. Sometimes it's, it's hard to, if you do a scientific study, to, to measure these things, and, and people in the focus groups also said, well, it's probably, if I filled in the questionnaires, they're all the same, but actually I feel slightly better. Just these small things are, are very important. Another important theme was, um, it emerged from the focus groups, what, that they really valued the social interaction. 
and they felt that if they had to do a home program on their own, they might find it more difficult to stick to that. But not everybody benefited equally. I found not much difference. I enjoyed doing it, but I don't think I was doing it properly. So it's very important to get a good instructor and, and keep getting the feedback. I've got problems with my rotator cuff muscles and sometimes came away worse. However, these, those, people, those two people had these quotes. When we were asking, would you consider continuing the Pilates classes, they both said yes. The two no's were from somebody who experienced quite a lot of dizziness and a lot of exercises were almost impossible for him to do uh, because it improves, uh, involves some moving. And, um, and the other person thought it would be too expensive for him to pay for the classes and, and the travel. So anybody would please let's get started with Pilates. There are several options. One to one is probably the most effective one because the instructor can focus on your weaknesses and, um, and issues. Uh, but it might be, it's also more expensive, of course. Our study used a group-based um, exercise um, session. And the, the instructor who did the session with the who did the sessions for us, she said that it might be good to have first a couple of sessions on your own with the instructor, and then you know where to focus on, and then join a, a group session. Home programs, of course, are the cheapest. You don't have to travel, you can do it in your own time. But I really should emphasize that you shouldn't, probably shouldn't really start doing it without getting some um, Pilates instructor uh, instruction first. Um, not only for safety, but also that you know how to do the exercises properly. I, I've started with a book, and I found it very difficult to, to know if you're doing it properly. So go to a class at least first and see what exercise you can do. So options for community-based classes. Well, I'm very pleased that actually you can actually ask the, the people uh, in the Get Active uh, Hub. Uh, we also, oh, yeah, local UM society branches, MS therapy centers sometimes organize it. In Edinburgh and the Lodians, there's a, a new uh, initiative called Kick Active, and it organizes exercise programs, not only Pilates, but also yoga and Tai Chi, for people with long-term health conditions. And I know quite a lot of people with MS go there, and also people who um, use wheelchairs. So some acknowledgements. The MS Society funded the study. Um, my colleagues at Queen Margaret University, Tom is an exercise physiologist, Kathy is a physiotherapist and organized the focus groups. Paula and Julia are physiotherapists and, and, and chess, and Paula is a Pilates instructor as well. And Jane Christie did the Pilates um, classes. And of course, most important, the participants. And I'd like to leave you with this quote, which was, well, make, sums it all up, which is very nice, you doing this kind of research. Whoever came up with this idea of doing this, it was a very good idea. And made you see that although you're in a wheelchair, you can still do exercise. Thank you. I'd like to thank all our speakers. Has anybody got any questions? Um, I, 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 I'm assuming that the, the presentations will be available on our website after MS Live. But, but um, the, 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 um, the speakers have all agreed that they will be around for the next hour or so. So if people want to talk to them individually and get any information from them, they're very happy to take, yep. get information. Um, you can also, as I say, um, we have got the people who are doing the Pilates type exercise training for us are in the Get Active Zone. So certainly, you know, please go and talk to them. And if you want to try out some seated Pilates sessions, you're very welcome. Can I ask, I mean, especially for, yeah, the, yeah. for, the, for the last two, I noticed both of you said that certainly you found that the social aspect is is a big part of this and certainly i i find that i mean i go to a a water aerobics class on a thursday night and it's i find it hard to work out which is better than just that i'm getting out the house and the social so i'm wondering on a scientific level you clearly need to make some kind of delineation between those and i was wondering how you do that yeah, yeah. That, that's a very interesting question. And actually, we've been applying for funding to actually do two types of session, an exercise session and a, a non-exercise session. 
and then compare those two groups. Um, so that's a, a very important point, and that's why we don't know either, and we'll need to find out what's best here. Yeah, I, w I would agree with that. And um, we did a study in breast cancer survivors on that, where we did a, a placebo exercise condition, where we compared aerobic exercise with just coming in and doing some stretching, and you know, it was kind of a placebo exercise. And we found that the, the, the attention um, control group, that's what they were, so they were controlling for social attention interaction. They did improve some, actually, on some of the psychosocial indices, but the group in the exercise group improved about uh, as much again. Yeah. So, so there is some um, attention effect going on, um, you know, and, and, and the fact that you're, you're getting that attention, you, you, you're interacting with others, you do get social benefits, but I believe that exercise you know, sort of <coughs> imp improves uh, again by, you know, probably as much again. So yeah. it's a good point, though, yeah. 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 <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the talk, so, which <clears throat> I found very interesting, actually. Um, can I just ask, in particular, I'm obviously living in the wrong place. I should perhaps be living in Sheffield or, or in Edinburgh, but anyway, there we are. Um, is it... I suppose that exercise is never too late, in a sense, because it's always good, but um, obviously I use a wheelchair myself these days. Um, has any research been done as to the possibilities through the programmes which have been referred to this morning um, about the reduction of disability through exercise, in particular the ways in which um, the presenters talked this morning? Thank you. Um, I think there's, there's a study going on in Scan Scandinavia where they're looking at exercise and they're doing lots of uh, neurological scanning to see if it actually impacts on progression of, of MS, that type of thing. Um, and, but there's also a systematic review. And I think at this point, I think the consensus is that, that may, maybe there is some potential for retarding progression. Now, now the problem if you, is if with something like MS, it, it probably uh, makes you become more sedentary anyway. That's a problem because becoming sed when you're sedentary, you start to detrain. And so, you know, you get the effects of um, sort of atrophy, muscle atrophy, and becoming less fit. So w whether exercise can retard the progression of, of, of MS or whether it's just that, you know, you maintain better what you have from the, from, from, by doing exercise, we, we don't know yet. It's an interesting question. Are you seeing any increase within NHS physiotherapy departments either to have dedicated MS physiotherapists or general physiotherapists who know the, you know, the problems that MS sufferers have? Is that for me? <laughs> um, no, I think is the answer. I think, um, I think that it's, it's a problem with access to neurophysio pretty much everywhere. It's a bit of a postcode lottery. Um, but I also think that um, physiotherapists have a responsibility as well, is that, you know, once people have had a course of physio, is actually how they then support that person to stay active or become active. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a need, I think, for physios maybe to move out, out actually of the protected NHS setting sometimes and actually maybe go with somebody to a gym or go with, you know, and do that MS awareness training. And what the MS awareness training that we're just developing Developing at the moment is, is aimed at that physiotherapists will deliver it to fitness instructors and activity instructors and support them to set up exercises and activities for people with MS, knowing the issues and the awareness of that. So I think for me it's around, you know, physiotherapy when people need it, but actually it's never going to, we're never going to have it, it's never going to be tight, you know, forever, you know, it's always going to be time limited. But for me, what I would like to see is physiotherapy that's goal orientated, so you have it for as long as you need to achieve the goal that you jointly you know, set. But after that, I think, you know, the NHS and the, and the physios have a responsibility then is to look at how they can move into the community and actually support people to become active or stay active. Oh, hello. That's interesting. I came in part way through the presentation, but I caught about the a lot of people don't get advice on physiotherapy and activity when they're diagnosed with MS. I was diagnosed 10 years ago, and I was at the Queen's Medical Nottingham, which is good reputation, but nobody ever really looked at the multidisciplinary team aspect of it. And nobody ever said, no, you've got weaknesses here, so you're going to have to do this. 
So what work is being done, or is it possible for the MS Society to do some work, not just with the physios, because it needs to be at a higher level than that to get the funding, to make sure that the multidisciplinary team aspect is done at that stage? Because if I knew what I knew now, back then, I would probably, possibly, not definitely, be mm. in a better position than I am now. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a lot more work needs to be done with the more newly diagnosed people so that, you know, we, we, you know, we should, you know, what we're trying to do is promote things like newly diagnosed courses that actually promote um, exercise and activity as part of, that, as part of that, that course so that people, you know, when they are diagnosed, do get the advice. You know, in the past, people were often told, you know, you don't exercise, it might make things worse, it might make your fatigue worse. Well, now we have got the evidence that exercise will improve those things. So I think it's really important that, yeah, we do. And I think people do, you know, the NICE guidance says that everybody should get a multidisciplinary assessment. And I I think that's part of our campaign and is that everybody should have access to that. Yeah, I think mostly it's the clinics where they, they see you once a year and they tick a box so you're doing all the mm. right things and you're okay. <coughs> I think that's got to change somehow. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Hello there. Yeah, thank you very much for those talks. They were very, very good. Um, could I just ask if one is interested in being involved in trials to help out with exercise and MS, how one actually gets into the loop because I f feel rather isolated in that, you know, anybody sort of, n n you know, wanting you to help out if you can. I think it depends where the trials are running, really. Um, I mean, uh, there's a lot more multi-centre trials these days being organised because recruitment is always an issue. And, and, and I think for exercise trials, you know, normally you get a, a sort of 30 to 40 percent recruitment rate. So, um, and a lot of people are already doing other in, um, in, uh, research, or they're just not interested, or they want to travel. Um, I think if there's a if there's an exercise trial at a given site, the researchers there will be doing everything they can to engage you and to, to make you aware of that of, of that trial. They'll be putting posters up. You know, the, the neurologists will know about it and what have you. So, it's just a case of, you know, if it's an exercise trial. I'm sure you'd get to know about it, but it's, you know, we need, we need more exercise trials, I guess. That, that's the... Yeah. Certainly, if, if you go on the MS Society website um, for the trials that we're funding, um, it, there is a thing that you can tick on where it says get involved, and it will tell you what's, what's happening, um, what we're funding, what's, what's, you know, what they're recruiting to. And certainly you can, you can, you know, through that website, you can actually say you would like to be involved and you'd like to be taking part in research, yeah. Any more? In that case, I'd like to thank the three speakers for their you know, brilliant pro you know, presentations. Yeah, I hope it gives you a bit of a flavour of the fact that you know, what the MS Society is trying to fund around helping people manage their MS. If, I, I will plug again the Get Active Zone. Please come and join us. We don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be doing exercises on my own. I'd actually quite like other people to do exercises with me. Um, and they, all the present presenters are going to be around in the different zones and in the research area. So if you have got other questions that you want to ask them, you know, please go and find them out. Thank you very much. in the groove.
sitting squarely in the groove. sitting squarely in the groove. sitting squarely in the groove.
sitting squarely in the groove. Early in the groove. Early in the groove.
sitting squarely in the groove. Well, in the groove. Well, in the groove.
squarely in the groove. Squarely in the groove. Squarely in the groove.
squarely in the groove. Squarely in the groove. Early in the groove.
squarely in the groove. Uh, what promises to be a very exciting session today on progressive MS and research into progressive MS. I'm Susan Kohas. I'm head of biomedical research at the MS Society. Um, and today we're going to hear from Dr. Jeremy Tataway, uh, who's a consultant neurologist specialising in MS at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London at Queen Square. Many of you might have heard Queen Square instead of that. Um, Jeremy's been in, involved in designing and running clinical trials for progressive MS for many years now. Uh, and it will be great to hear what he has to say and updates he has from uh, a recent trial that he's just published and also some, trial that he's, uh, some trials that he's starting. Um, Jeremy's talk is going to be followed by a Q&A session with the panel. So what I will say before we start the session, and I'll say it again as well, is um, this session is being broadcast um, live on the web. So if you do have questions, can you please use the microphone so that everybody can hear them? Um, before we start, um, I was asked to talk for a few minutes on what the MS Society is doing about progressive MS. Um, and actually, we've been working on this for a really long time. We have uh, funded research into progressive MS for a long time. So in the early 90s, we funded a clinical trial looking at alemtuzumab to see if it was effective in people with secondary progressive MS. Now, unfortunately, as happens with clinical trials sometimes, the drug didn't work. But that was kind of one of the early things we did, really, to tackle the issues with progressive MS. And since then, we've been doing a lot of research into the fundamental science of progressive MS and trying to improve our understanding of that. Um, last year, we completed a program of work um, with a number of other organizations looking at identifying the top 10 research priorities for MS. And these are priorities that were identified and um, ranked by people affected by MS and by healthcare professionals. Um, and it wasn't a surprise to us, and I'm sure it won't be a surprise to anybody else in this room, is that progressive MS and treatments for progressive MS ranked as the number one priority. Now, this has unofficially been a high priority for us for many years, but now it is our number one research priority. Um, we've been working um, on finding treatments for progressive MS for lots of years. So lo all of our major investments, so the Cambridge Center for Myelin Repair, the Edinburgh Center for Translational Research, the MRI unit at Queen Square in London, where Jeremy works, um, the MS Society Tissue Bank, and the UK MS Register will all, we hope, make things, make major contributions to the field of progressive MS. Many of those programs of work have already made major contributions. Um, we've also been working a little bit behind the scenes with people like Jeremy um, to through, through our clinical trials network to design and develop uh, trials for progressive MS. And this is something that we started, I think it was at 2007, Jeremy, before I started the MS Society, um, and you know, has culminated in the development of the MS Smart Trial, which Jeremy's going to talk about a little bit. So we funded all of the underpinning work that was required to get that trial funded, and I'm really proud to say that we're also part funding the trial as well. Um, it's a trial in 440 people with secondary progressive MS testing three different drugs against a placebo. Um, but we know that nobody can solve um, progressive MS on their own. And that's why one of our key roles, I think, as a research funder is to promote collaboration throughout the UK, um, but also internationally on an international scale. And that's why we've been involved in setting up and uh, now are one of the main funders of the International Progressive MS Alliance. Um, and this is a coalition of MS societies from around the world and coordinated by MSIF to fund research into progressive MS and mainly to fund research that we know we couldn't fund alone. So we are working together with other charities internationally to fund the best research and to tackle the big, um, big remaining questions into progressive MS. And I'm very hopeful that that will make a big difference to our understanding of progressive MS and how to best run trials in progressive MS as well. Um, 
now I'm going to hand over to Jeremy, who's going to talk a little bit about developments in the field over the last few years and what you think the future will hold. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed, and thank you very much for coming to this talk. And this is uh, a great occasion, um, MS Life. Uh, and I think it's particularly pertinent because I think uh, the pendulum has really swinging almost swung entirely to looking at progressive multiple sclerosis. This is the time to really get a, a grip on progressive multiple sclerosis to try and find treatments that have anti-progressive effect. And I think that's been because of the huge success in relapsing remitting, the dozen drugs that now exist for relapsing remitting MS uh, that Gavin Givenoni would also outline a bit later this afternoon. But now we have to crack the hard nut of progression. And what I want to do is talk about progression, what it is, how we think about it, how can we develop drugs that have anti-progressive effect and make sure they really do have anti-progressive effect. And I think the UK MS Society um, has been uh, pivotal in this. And it's now an international effort, the International Progressive Alliance with the MSIF, because it requires um, a, global, a global effort to crack it. But I th we'll, we'll get there. And I just, I think in this next half an hour, maybe outline the map of how to do it. I, I guess it's a bit of a rough guide. I'm sorry my talk won't be as exciting as these. We won't be going to the world party uh, in Rio, much as we'd like to, uh, <laughs> or the Rolling Stones, um, another thing I missed last year. But uh, just sort of think about it as a rough guide to trials, because I need to explain to you about what trials are, because we have to do trials to make sure that a drug really works. We'd all like to just try things out and hope it works. We had to do it scientifically, we had to do it properly, and legally we have to do it that way. So I'm going to talk to you about this. What is progression? And that's tricky, much trickier than perhaps you might think, because you might just think, oh, things are getting worse, a deterioration is obvious progression. But it's hard when you come to define it, which you need to for trials, to really define progression. Talk about a trial, look back at the work that has been undertaken, and actually plenty of work has been undertaken in progressive MS over the years. But I think now is the time really to kind of bring it to the boil and devote, I'd almost say, all of our energy into progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, I'll talk about the Simvastatin trial um, that we published in The Lancet a couple of weeks ago, talk about new trial design, how we can get there quicker, how we can get there more efficiently, it's an urgent issue, how we can do it, and then what's coming up. I'll talk about the MS Smart trial that we'll do this year. So progression, you know, one, you could say it sounds good, it sounds optimistic. One's life is progressing, one's career is, you know, it's all good, aspirational and all of this. But we know when we talk about it in multiple sclerosis, we mean that things are getting worse. And the question is, what is progression? What is getting worse? We spend a lot of our time thinking about walking, walking getting worse. So a couple of years, you go on a holiday and then you come back two or three years later, the walking is less good. There has been progression in mobility worsening. Cognition, it could be the thinking, it could be the memory, the cognition getting worse. Balance, and this is not me, the balance. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> Balance getting worse. So it can be many things, and that's part of the problem. You know, the slippery elephant of multiple sclerosis. What is getting worse? Is it many things getting worse or one thing getting worse? How do you define the worsening? Because if you can't define what you want to go after, then it actually becomes very difficult to make sure that your medication or your potential medication is actually working. So it is very complex. We all know that multiple sclerosis is very complex, but we can boil it down so that we can start to make inroads into it so we can get anti-progressive treatment, DMDs for progression, is what we want, don't we? Even prediction of progression is very, very difficult, and people have spent years, decades, trying to map it out and trying to work out what's a good factor, what's a bad factor to try and predict progression. It's really, really hard on the individual person to predict it sitting in clinic. You could have a look at it on the scan. I'll show you some scans later. Is progression... Could you, could you measure it on the scan, the brain slightly changing, slightly shrinking? 
that you can get a handle on progression. And that's actually quite useful when you start to design trials, the mid-phase trials that you need to do to get to the final disability trials. So a biomarker. Mechanistically, there's all sorts of mechanisms, and you'll hear about this from the scientists, all sorts of things happening, which I don't understand, but they do. All sorts of things happening in the brain with progression. But the problem is, of course, we can't see those in life. We can't do brain biopsies and sample the brain to work out what's happening in progression. Although maybe specialized MRI scans, spectroscopy, things like that, could give us a handle on progression. So progression, actually, is really, really hard. And as I said, what we want to do is mimic the success of this dozen drugs that we now have in relapsing, remissing, inflammatory multiple sclerosis, which began 20, 25 years ago with the beta interferon, moved on to the oral agents, alemtuzumab, natazilumab. It's a completely different landscape than how it was when I was training as a junior doctor. It's amazing, and I think amazing things will happen to progression. But we all have to work hard to get there, because this really is a tough nut. As we move from inflammation, the relapsing, remitting inflammation, and I think about it like this, as the fires die down, then the embers uh, continue to burn, moving from inflammation into progression. But I don't want us to forget all of the symptomatic treatments, because there's plenty that can be done while we're waiting for an anti-progressive drug. And it's very important that these things are done, and they are done systematically, because they will make a person with MS's life better. Really good treatment of bladder function, so that you don't have to get up at night all the time. Proper treatment of the neuropathic neurological pain. Depression, plenty of treatments for depression. Spasticity, huge changes in the way that spasticity is being changed. Proper access to neurological physiotherapy. This is really, really important. And I think sometimes one can get caught up in all the drug treatments and forget this and many other things that I could think about. So let's not forget those because these are here right now and need to be accessed to improve daily quality of life. But let's think about what a trial is, because you need to know that, because that's how we're going to make sure and how to get to the treatments that work. What is a trial? And I think about it as a horse race, as some of you may have heard before. We're running a horse race. We want to pick the winning horse. And we have to do a comparison of two horses, a dummy horse, a placebo, and the active drug. We want to see who wins the race. And the race is the trial, which might last for two years, and we want to measure the race, measure what the finishing line is. Is it an improvement in the scan? Is it some measure of walking? Is it some measure of cognition? Whatever your trial is designed to answer, it is a race to see if your new drug can beat the comparator, which in progressive multiple sclerosis, because there isn't any treatment at the moment, would be the placebo or dummy drug. And this is an established method, and it's also a regulatory and a legal method for bringing uh, medication to market. So it is a horse race, or it's a rocket race, which is going to get the highest. You, you hear a lot about this, this word that we call placebo or dummy, and you might say, well, why do you do trials with placebo? Why don't you just have active drugs? all the time. And the problem is we know that taking part in a trial, people in itself feel better. This is well established and that's why I encourage people to take part in trials. Because even taking part in trials, even if you happen to be on the dummy drug, and generally people don't know which they're on, you will feel better. But we have to make sure that our real drug or the drug that we're interested in is better than a dummy drug because taking medication can come with side effects. We want to make sure that what we're using really does have effect over a dummy. And even in surgery, um, sham operations or dummy operations are done because to prove that something really does work. And this placebo effect might be about 30% of the effectiveness. So how do, you, how do you grow a trial from the acorn to the oak tree? There are different what are called phases. So phase, there's the, all the scientific work, then there's the 
early phase, the phase one, to make sure it doesn't have some dramatic side effect. Tried out in 10 or 20 people. Then we move into the middle phase, the phase two, like the simvastatin trial, to show that it has an effect on something that you think is really relevant to the illness, such as the scan, to the final phase, that it really does slow down, let's say, the rate of progression, however you're measuring it. So it would slow down the change in walking. It would slow down the change in memory or bladder. And these are the different phases of the trial. And th there are no shortcuts. These have to be done. I cannot just set up a trial without doing this. It is illegal. And we have to measure what we've done, whether it be a questionnaire or a scan or a walking test or a memory test. And this is um, important of it. So let's think about how a successful drug for relapsing remitting was arrived at. So this is Tysabri, Nathazilumab. This is a very successful drug, but it had to go through the different phases. This is, what, this is its mid-phase trial. And what it showed is, using MRI, here are the new lesions, the new bits of inflammation on the dummy part, and this is what Tysabri did. It dramatically reduced the amount of inflammation on the brain scan. It passed its phase two trial, and the rest is history. And when it went into its late phase trial, yes, it actually reduced relapses dramatically by 70%. And this is its comparison against the standard treatment at the time, which was Avonex. And then it was actually, in one of these trials, added to Avonex, and you can see how it reduced down. Of course, as we know with trials, unexpected things can happen. And as we know, ultimately, there is this rare side effect, this viral side effect of the PML. Trials are necessary to show that something works and also will tell us about unexpected things. So what about progressive multiple sclerosis? So this is the simvastatin trial that uh, we published um, a couple of weeks ago. And this is the phase two trial in progressive multiple sclerosis. So it's an example of a successful phase two trial in progressive, this was secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. And I'll just tell you a little bit about that. And uh, when you finish a, tr uh, a trial, it had to be said, it, it is quite euphoric because it's a huge amount of effort and this was a, by all of these investigators, there are about 20 of us and many others. It's a charity funded trial. This took seven years um, from start to finish. It's a huge effort. And so I do feel sometimes like Jason Robinson, you know, when he scores his try. And you may say to me, well, simvastatin, that's all a bit strange, isn't it? Because that's cholesterol and reducing cholesterol. And it's well known. So it was an attractive drug because it was widely available. It's been used in millions of people around the world. It's um, very safe. But apart from lowering cholesterol, this is how it blocks cholesterol, it does many other things on the side which could be nerve protective. And some earlier studies seem to suggest that. And that's why we chose it. It could be nerve protective and perhaps a bit anti-inflammatory. But really in progressive MS, we're not so concerned about the inflammation. The flames have died down and it's really about nerve protection. And it does lots of things which are very complicated. Again, I won't understand that about how you stop white blood cells getting through and perhaps increasing the blood supply in the brain. It could be doing all sorts of things. But it seemed a very attractive drug to use and there was a pedigree to it. And it's what we call a repurposed drug. That is a drug that's used for something else that could be benefited in a second indication. So another example of a repurposed drug that you'll be well aware of is aspirin. So aspirin is a painkiller, but it's also used for millions of people around the world to prevent heart attack and stroke. So something completely different. And that's what we mean by repurposing. So we choose to repurpose simvastatin, which is an anti-cholesterol drug, but could it be a nerve protective drug? So we used as our marker of the race scans. And we know that all of our brains are shrinking. In MS, it's a little bit more. It shrinks by about 0.6% per year. And we wanted to see if we could reduce that rate of what we call atrophy. So this is an example of some scans from the trial. So this is at the beginning of the trial, and that's two years later. 
And if you flick backwards and forwards, you can see that a little bit of gaps have appeared. For example, here. So if I go back and I go there, it's wide, the, that space has widened a bit and there's been some brain atrophy. Then we can measure it and we can quantify it. And then we can say that that's what we're interested in. So if simvastatin reduced that rate of brain atrophy, it would be significant. And we know that brain atrophy from these graphs happens probably across the whole trajectory of the illness. So it's a very important measure. This is just how we designed a trial over two years. We tried to make it simple with an MRI scan at the beginning, the middle, and the end. We measured walking. We measured some of the patient questionnaires, various safety issues. We blinded it. So people in the trial, some of whom I've met today and keep in contact with, didn't know which they were on, and nor did the doctors, to reduce the bias to see if there's a true effect because we have to do this to prove that something really does work rather than we want it to work. And this is actually the seven-year slide, which I'll show you in this picture. So if we look, say, here, these are the rates of shrinkage, and that's the dummy, and then that's the real. And this difference here is about 40%. So it has a dramatic effect on reducing the rate of brain shrinkage. It is a successful mid-phase trial, phase two trial. And also, maybe unexpectedly, because it wasn't, as we say, powered enough to show it, it did seem to improve some of the disability and slow the rate of change. So that getting worse is in red on the dummy, getting worse is ready on the active, less people got worse on the active drug compared to the dummy drug. And that was something we weren't expecting because it, was, it wasn't designed for that, but we were very gratified to see it. And some of the, the patient reported outcome also improved. Didn't have any effect on the immunological, immunological marker. So it's a non-immunological effect and we're still trying to work out how it works. Is it blood supply? Is it protection of cells? But it's not your standard immunological effect which actually makes sense because, as I said, we're not in an inflammatory situation in established progressive MS. We can do lots of other things. We can look at proteins. We can measure the memory. So we can do and we can gather lots of information, but this is how we do and how we did a phase two trial in MS. And around the world, there's a lot of activity. People really are doing lots of work in progressive multiple sclerosis because it is well recognized that this is the problem. Sometimes we might think that no one's doing any work in MS, progressive MS, but actually the whole pendulum is doing lots of work. And so this is just from one of the websites. There are lots of different compounds being trialed in progressive multiple sclerosis. So uh, you may not be able to read it, but things like lithium is being trialed, things like rituximab is being trialed, there's a T cell vaccine is being trialed. And I'll show you about one of the trials we're going to do and, and launch this year. So this is phase two. We want to make it more efficient. We want to run more horses at any one go. And we did a lot of work with the MS Society, as Susan said, over the last five years in trying to redesign future generation of trials to run not just one horse race, but what about three or four horse races at the same time? So we'd get to choose the winner quicker. These are called multi-arm trials. And so starting soon, of course we'd want it to start sooner, but it's a complex trial, but soon we'll start this trial, the MS Smart trial. Where we're going to trial three drugs against a dummy drug very similar to doing the simvastatin trial, but it's like three simvastatin trials rolled into one, but we're going to choose three different drugs so we can start to develop a real pipeline of drugs, repurposed drugs, to tackle progressive multiple sclerosis. You won't have heard of these drugs necessarily. Uh, this drug's an asthma drug used in Japan. This one's a drug for motor neurone disease. This is a drug for blood pressure. So all sorts of different uh, indications. 
But with the MS Society, we spent about a year sitting for about 30,000 trial reports to try and come up with the very best drugs we could think of which could have an effect, seem biologically plausible as an anti-progressive drugs to develop that pipeline. And we'll be doing this up and down England and Scotland. So you may say to me, well, that's great with simvastatin. You've done a mid-phase trial. You showed an effect on MRI. That's super. But what are you going to do next? Because that doing a phase two trial doesn't give it a license. It doesn't give it a label. You can't now suddenly prescribe it. We've got to take it to the final phase the, to have an effect, a proven effect on disability. And then I'll just briefly talk about what these are. These are the final phases of a trial, the phase three. So alamtuzumab, for example, which is now successfully available, went through its phase three trials. Some of you may have taken part in the CARE 1 or the CARE 2 trials. All drugs must take part in these trials. So what do we do? So this is an example of a cancer trial, a phase three trial in cancer. And sometimes on the news you hear about these trials and what they do. And they have an effect on reducing the progression of the cancer. So here in the blue would be over time the survival on the standard chemotherapy. And this is this new drug that was trialed and you can see that it extends, it reduces the progression of the cancer. And this is what the sort of thing that we need to think about when we do phase three trials in MS. When we're talking about, can you stop someone progressing? Progression-free survival. That's what we do in MS. Can you stop someone getting significantly worse? So for example, you could say that about halfway through, the survival on the standard treatment was about nine months, and the survival on this treatment was almost double. So that's the sort of thing. Those are sort of the, the concepts that we do when we run late-stage trials in progressive multiple sclerosis. A lot of work has been done. These are trials which have been carried out in progressive MS over the last 25 years. It is not as if no one has done anything. So these are from around the world, about 8,000 people with MS, Many things have been trialed, and these have all failed. So people have tried immunosuppression drugs. They tried the beta interferons. They trialed um, cannabinoids in the Cupid trial. So it's a hard nut to, tr to track, to crack. But I think to start with, you need a successful phase, mid-phase trial, and then trial it out. Things are coming up. So for your diary, these big trials will report in progressive multiple sclerosis in the next one or two years. And some of you may have taken part in them. So the INFORMS trial of Fingolimod in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. The ASCEND trial of Tysabri in secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Ocrelizumab, Siponimod, so these trials have taken place, and these results will come out over the next one or two years. And we hope, obviously, that at least one of these will be successful. But they may not be, but we hope they will be. But by taking part in these big trials, we can make the progress, and we can find out the drugs that do work. So we keep working on it in its different myriad ways. We keep climbing that mountain, and then we will achieve a disease-modifying treatment for progression. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel, uh, and, and they will introduce themselves a little bit. So um, to my right, we've got Pierre Benneke, who, who is chief executive of, the, uh, of MSIF, so Multiple Sclerosis International Federation. We've got Jeremy Chataway, who we've just heard from. We've got Roger Basto. Um, we've got uh, Dawn Harrison and Denise Winterbottom. And, and I'm just going to ask each panel, panelist to introduce themselves briefly um, and their role. So we'll start with you, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pierre Baneke. I am uh, CEO of the Multiple Sclerosis International Federation. So that's the umbrella which tries to link the work of the MS societies around the world. 
Um, I have been for seven years living in this, uh, in working in, in this organization. Uh, I'm a Dutch national. My father had MS, um, so uh, I know what, what MS means. And uh, our work is to make organizations work together in any field, and in this relation, particularly in the research field, to together get the very best results. So I'm Jeremy Shatter. I'm sure you've had enough of me by now, but uh, a consultant neurologist at the National Hospital, uh, obviously interested in trials and trial design. Uh, I'm Roger Basto. Uh, I've been diagnosed and lived with Mottlesbrough with primary progressive MS for 17 years. Um, I've been involved with the MS Society as a research network member for much of that time. Um, involved in numerous projects ranging from the buddy scheme in the early days uh, to increase understanding between researchers and MS patients to being a patient representative uh, on the steering group for the MS Smart Trial Design and uh, the MS, MS JLA Top 10 Priority Setting Partnership. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say a few words on what uh, my uh, time has been with the um, MS Smart Trial, if that's uh, okay with yourselves. Yeah. Um, as an MS patient, uh, having an input into the design of such an important project as the MS Smart Trial, it's been very interesting and immensely encouraging that my views matter and can help. You know? um, my part was basically to put over the patient view um, regarding such things as clinical trials, lumbar punctures, you know, um, etc. Making sure that the problems um, also such as fatigue, which many of us suffer from you know, you know, daily, um, were understood and taken into a consideration when uh, the likes of Jeremy were, do, were doing the timelines um, for the trial. Yeah, okay. Uh, I personally think the research is very important and we need to find the answers. Uh, and research into, pre, into progressive MS is definitely moving forward. And hopefully the MS Smart Trial will give us some positive answers. Thank you. My name's Dawn Harrison. I'm a neurophysio, and for the last three and a half years, I've worked for the MS Society over in Northern Ireland. But um, I've been involved with neuro rehabilitation for probably about the last 20 years. My name's Denise Winterbottom. I'm an MS specialist nurse. I used to work at the Greater Manchester Neurosciences Centre. And, pride, and I'm presently working in Halifax. I've been an MS nurse for 10 years, and prior to that, I worked in neuro rehab for 10 years. Okay, so before we start, have we got roaming mics? Can the people with roaming mics stand up to just to make sure? If you do have a question, please make sure you speak into the microphone so that people watching online can hear. Um, and are there any questions? Okay, we've got a couple. Thank you. Um, you've talked extensively about the trials primarily for secondary progressive MS. How does that information transfer? Does it transfer to primary progressive MS? And what specifically is being done for primary progressive MS? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I suppose the first thing is the INFORMS trial, the Fingolimod trial for prime progressive MS, a thousand patient trial, will report over the next year. So that's a vital phase three trial in PPMS. I think with, as you say, a secondary and primary progressive MS, it's difficult to know, isn't it, how to, how to play it and when I was, I thought, I've been thinking a lot about this um, with the simvastatin trial. So that was a secondary progressive MS trial. And you might say to me, well, why didn't you put them together, both PPMS and SPMS, which would be a very reasonable point of view. I suppose my point was that particularly in mid-phase trials, it's so difficult to find anything at all that works and that we must try and reduce the variability, try and reduce the variability and try and make it a 
because the purer the population you have in a trial, the greater the chance of success, because there's so much noise around anyway. And so I elect to try and make it purely secondary or purely primary MS trials. But other people would argue the opposite, and you must mix them together. So then your, your question is, does simvastatin try and translate into a PPMS? And of course, one would hope that it would do, but of course, we don't know until we do a PPMS trial in simvastatin, which would be, I think, very important to do. So I'm not ignoring PPMS, far from it. But I do know that there's the INFORMS trial, which will report over the next year, which will be very exciting. And there are other PPMS trials coming through. But I think the most important message, as I said, is to be involved in a trial, if you can be. And many big neuroscience centers run trials. And there's the clinicaltrials.gov website, which all trials around the world have to put, uh, uh, sign up to. And the MS Society runs a trials web page as well. And there's it's the, the World Trials Day in about two weeks' time. Because by doing trials, we'll make progress. Thank so it's a long answer, but I hope I've covered the point. And can I just add to that? We do have a web page um, dedicated for how you can get involved in clinical trials and links to other websites where we have, um, they have information about trials. And you can search for type of MS or area or location. So. Um, if, if you haven't done that and you're interested in taking part in research, then I would recommend you come to our web page for that. Um, just um, following on from that, I wonder if um, Dawn and Denise could potentially talk a little bit about what people with MS can do now, people with progressive MS can do now to help manage their MS. So let's start with, let's start with Dawn and then we'll move on to Denise. Um, for me, I think, well, there are lots of things that we would be looking at people doing and I would be encouraging people to do with secondary progressive MS. Um, I suppose a lot of the emphasis on uh, what I would be looking at would be looking at things like people's posture and how people are moving and, um, and then from then on trying to use the activity that people have and also um, within Northern Ireland, we've been involved in setting up some exercise classes um, for people with varying levels of mobility. So one of the other things that I would be encouraging people to do would be to exercise as much as they can within their limits. Um, and I think we've found that, you know, for a lot of people, that the exercise classes have been beneficial as well. As an MS nurse, I think it's really important that um, we can see patients on a regular basis. We can talk about symptom management. We can signpost you into the right directions. We can suggest and prescribe drugs. We are very well educated by the MS Trust, and that actually enables us to pass that information on to you. And we're aware of the trials that people like Jeremy do. So I think it's important that, again, we maybe discuss these in clinic with you in consultation, that we go through symptom management and we come up with action plans and actually we can make a difference, as can all the health professionals involved and the um, charities that support people with MS. Okay, uh, are there more questions from the audience? Okay, um, have we got a microphone? Yes, is, uh, okay. is the microphone live? Can yes, everyone hear me? Um, I have a question for Dawn Harrison. Um, and I've been looking at physiotherapy for some time and lots of people have sort of banded about this word neurological physiotherapy and I've struggled somewhat to, fu to, to understand the fundamental difference between straightforward physiotherapy and neurological physiotherapy. Now I, I imagine this is like a two hour answer <laughs> but in a nutshell can you, can you um, let everyone know the, the sure. fundamental basics and the sort of exercises we might be looking at as averse to conventional physiotherapy. Sure. Um, yeah, I think it is something that is quite complicated, and so, yeah, that's a great question. Um, ultimately, to try and be as brief as I can, all physios would go through the same degree qualification um, and would do kind of uh, what we would call a general rotation, so they would work in all areas um, at the beginning. And then I suppose what would happen would be that then what people would do would be that they would specialise in a certain area. So people would maybe specialise in sports injuries or neuro or 
orthopedics or respiratory care or whatever. So I suppose it's over time as a specialism. There are as well quite a lot of postgraduate um, courses that people would do with regard to neurophysio. So uh, that probably most of the people who would call themselves neurophysios would have done some postgraduate um, work with regard to the treatment of people with neurological problems. Um, again, without getting too complicated, I suppose the, the difference that I see or one of the things that we would be looking at would be that I think maybe if, say, for example, you have a sports injury, you treat the specific area of, of injury. Um, and I suppose the, the big difference that I would see within neurophysio is that we would be looking at what we would call normal movement. So we would have movement patterns which are ingrained into our nervous system from when we are small to when we're developing. Um, and so we would be looking much more at how people move generally the whole of their body rather than just the knee or the ankle or a hip or an arm or an elbow so and again like I was saying before <coughs> excuse me um, we would be looking at people's posture in the fact that kind of the better your posture is even if we're looking at someone in sitting the better your posture is the easier it is to kind of say for example use your arm to reach whereas if maybe you're falling out of your chair a little bit so you're holding yourself up with your arm then that's much more difficult to do functional activities so um, a lot of what we'd be looking at would be um, kind of trying to help people access the movement patterns which are already within your nervous system, encouraging people in their everyday functional activities, so whether it's sitting, whether it's transferring, whether it's walking, however it's doing it, how, whatever they're doing, to do it to the best of their ability and access as much of their original movement patterns as they can. Does that... Great. Thanks. We've got some more questions? Susan. Susan. Yes, absolutely, one? Roger. Step in. Go ahead. Could I just say something on that? Yeah. Just from my experience, sure. I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But from my experience on physios, yeah, the difference between a sports physio and a neurological physio is a sports physio tells you, tells you that you've got to move your leg. Yeah. Because you, and that's it. Yeah. A neurological physio knows that you can't move your leg. Yeah and they help you move your leg, yeah? And that's my experience, okay? And that is, is basically it. Both of them are very, very good physios, yeah? One has the experience of knowing what the problems of MS are, mm -hmm. yeah? And they know that they can tell your leg all day long, move, 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 yeah? But it doesn't move, <laughs> yeah? So for instance, you're laid on bed, and so what do you do, yeah? You put, put a sheet of plastic underneath your leg, yeah? Put a sheet of plastic underneath your leg, and with your finger, they can move your leg on the plastic, yeah? Okay, yeah, simple answer, yeah? And it's as easy as that. That's the difference between a neurological physio and a sports physio. I think... <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Sorry about no, that no, one, no, but no, there you go. Fine. I I'm think um, I can. We can demonstrate it, Jeremy. Okay, let's go, man. We'll do that separately. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose just to follow on, really, from what Roger was saying, like you say, sometimes people are saying to things move and it doesn't work, yeah. and that's kind of from here down, isn't it? And the only things or the thing that we can do is through our handling and through helping people to move, see whether we can help them to feel that movement again. So we're kind of going in from the sensory side, and I suppose I kind of think of us as being a computer, kind of what goes in is what you get out again, So if, and that's the only way. We can't kind of go in here and alter what people can do motor-wise, but if we can give them the feeling and help them to get that feeling, the sensory information and the motor information kind of work together, and that there, there is a possibility that things, you know, kind of start to change from there. Okay, great. I, sure. I'm just aware we, we probably need to move on because we've got lots sure. of questions. So there's one here and then there's one here. So let's go with that one first and then... On the uh, Simvastin uh, trial, um, obviously there are many uh, Simvastins on the market for cholesterol. Mm. This has a side effect of myopathy in some cases and also muscle wastage. 
obviously one of the problems of MS is that your muscles do not work and can waste. Have you got any means of detecting between the myopathy and the benefit of Simvastin to MS? So as you say, so it's interesting, there are about seven different statins. I know, uh, I've tried available. them all. Um, Simvastatin was chosen because it's the most brain penetrant mm. statin of them all, as opposed to, say, a torvastatin, although both have been trialled in early stage. All statins can cause muscle problems, myositis. Uh, but gratifying in the trial, there was no difference between cramps. And there was certainly no extreme myositis or muscle wasting, but there was no difference in the cramp rate between the dummy group and the active group. Okay. Of course, people had to be carefully monitored and kidneys and liver and all the rest of it, but there was no serious adverse events in this phase two trial. Okay, shall we move on uh, over here? Dr. Chatterjee, I wonder if you could br uh, briefly comment on the relationship and the conclusions that you've drawn on your trials yeah. on uh, brain and elsewhere, because although you talk about the brain shrinking by 0.6% every year. My family probably think my brain is shrunk by about 10% every year. <laughs> but I personally think my brain is probably as rubbish as it's always been, but my mobility clearly is not. And I, I wonder, therefore, whether the conclusions you've drawn from the trials on the MRI scans on the brain are as applicable to, say, mid-thoracic no. uh, inflammations and progression there. So I think that's very interesting, isn't it? So how can we get a handle on the totality of multiple sclerosis in terms of scanning? So it's not just the brain, it's the spinal cord. Um, we chose the brain because that was an easier place to scan because um, detecting small differences is easier on the, on the big volume than it is on the small spinal cord. Though perhaps you know, another time around we would have done spinal cord scanning and now it's more developed. Um, so the rate of shrinkage in People without MS is 0.1 or 0.2% per year. With MS, it's about 0.6% per year. With Alzheimer's, it's about 2% per year. And we know, do know that epidemiologically, that that rate is seen through the whole of MS. So it seemed, although crude, a reasonable handle. And one would hope then, and the evidence suggests that it would do, that that would translate into disability or some relationship with disability. It doesn't need to be an exact relationship. You just got to know that you're going in the right direction in a mid-phase trial because the late stage disability trial, which will say, yep, it slowed down the rate of walking. But we were encouraged by, we did see some improvement as you saw on a couple of the disability measures. So yeah, it gives a, a good signal we're going in the right direction, but it's not the final proof which requires the late stage trial. Okay, have we got some more questions? Here, okay, nice over here. Um, going right back to the beginning with trials, um, it's about using animals. Are they harmed in any way and does it hurt them? At the very beginning it said about using animals. Yeah, um, I'm not an animal scientist, but there are very strict home office rules about the use of animals in experimental work. So I... For, for you for human benefit. I mean, I, I can step in there a little bit as well. So um, the Home Office is the kind of regulatory body that um, regulates animal research in the UK. Um, and they require that before any research is done on animals that the best efforts are taken to reduce the number of animals used in every experiment and to refine experiments um, so that they don't need to use animals or use less animals. Uh, and then to replace the use of animals in research wherever possible, so to, to use lab-based models uh, instead of animals wherever it's possible. Um, that's not always possible to do because sometimes to test out treatments you need to see how it works in the whole body of an animal. And the, the view is that uh, in order to avoid harm to research participants and people with MS, that you sometimes need to use animals to test out treatments before that early phase clinical trial. Um, so, I mean, that, that's what we have to say, but the MS Society as well um, makes sure that wherever possible that animals are not used in research um, unless it's absolutely essential for the research to be successful. I think the good news about repurposed drugs is they've been through their animal trials many, many decades ago, and they've been used in 
millions of people, millions of humans. So no further animal work is required. Okay, we've got a question here. Yes, th thank you. Um, can I ask about the international dimension? We've heard um, about the effects of uh, using trials internationally over 25 years or whatever. Um, clearly, uh, from a lay perspective, one understands that the, uh, certain parts of the world are better resourced than others, uh, thinking of the states in particular. And I just wonder to what extent there are sim sim sorry, similar trials going on in the states um, on primary aggressive multiple sclerosis, for example, uh, which um, one might look to over the next year um, in a comparable way to what Jeremy has described in this country. Thank you. So I, I'm going to send that question to Pierre and then maybe to Jeremy to talk a little bit about uh, the collaboration as well. So Pierre. I think I can, I can speak about the collaboration. I'm, I'm not a scientist uh, or a researcher. So in terms of the overview of the trials and where they're taking place at this moment, Jeremy's better placed for that. But what we are trying to do in the international collaboration between the member societies of MSIF and other organizations is trying to, to get to the, the early stages of, and the tools and break through the barriers actually to do the good trials uh, together. And just to give an example, around the world, the MS societies around the world probably raise around uh, 70 million pounds a year altogether. And I would think that the Americans probably raise half of that. So what we are trying to do is the progressive alliance at which the, uh, the, the MS society here stood at the root of development of that uh, in late 2010, is that we're trying to pool those resources to get the organizations to work together and to some extent connect the field and connect the experiences of the trials um, but to connect also the very best knowledge, to find out more, to understand progression. As Jeremy has said, it's, it's not understood. Uh, to get better measurement of it. Uh, where he said in the horse, where, where's the finish? Where's the finish? How high do you want to go? You've got to have a clear line. That's not easy. To get those measurements. Uh, and also to do the trials. And then last but not least, to work together and combine that, that combined knowledge and combined spending power uh, to encourage research into the symptoms and rehabilitation. Um, and uh, we have had our first calls for, for proposals, in fact, in the field where we're trying to stimulate new thinking, um, which we, we issued this call um, at the beginning of the year. And we got some 190 requests for funding from 22 countries around the world. So what we're doing really is stimulating the field to be very active. Uh, and I think I hand over to Jeremy mm. to talk more about some of the specific trials in the States, because he knows much more about that than I yeah, do. And I agree totally. I think the Progressive Alliance is a fantastic uh, collaboration which has come to being over the last one, one and a half years. And you've heard about the early uh, scientific calls. I mean, certainly, for example, in the MS Smart, one of the drugs is, is called a Budalast, and there's a sister uh, trial in the States at the, through the Cleveland Clinic um, called Sprint MS, and we've met up. We met up explicitly last year uh, to, so that we would have the same basic measurements, so that we could ultimately combine the trials together. So, and uh, those big trials, like Informs and Ascend, these are global trials. Um, which we'll report over the next year. So it is an international effort, a truly international effort, uh, to, to crack the nut. Okay. There's another question here. Yep. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of what you think about the drug Fampridine for pro secondary progressive. So Fampridine is a symptomatic treatment to improve walking. So that's not a disease-modifying treatment, we don't think. So. It's not actually going to help mm. it's going to the progression, but it's, it's just going to... Yes, it's, 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 it's license um, is to improve walking, but it's not having a fundamental anti-progressive effect. It's a symptomatic treatment. It's a right. bit like giving, say, oxybutynin to reduce bladder frequency. Right. It doesn't affect the underlying disease, as far as we know at this moment in time. Thank you. Okay, we've got one up here. Oh. This might be a slightly naive viewpoint, but if um, simvastatin is 
obviously looking quite good and is relatively safe, should it not be prescribed routinely to all secondary progressive? Because yeah. presumably you can just go to your GP and ask for it if it's already licensed. I think that's a very nice question. Um, the answer is no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and your GP won't prescribe it. Uh, not because he may not want to, because he may be very sympathetic, but doing a phase two trial does not indication. There's no legal label to prescribe it. And also, was the, the dose in the trial was higher? Yeah, the dose we used was high dose, 80 milligrams of simvastatin. and the standard cholesterol dose is 40 milligrams. Of course, if someone had raised cholesterol and multiple sclerosis, then I would have thought simvastatin would be a very reasonable thing to be on. But that would be the standard dose that is entirely safe but requires certain monitoring and blood tests. So you're right, in a way, it's, it's, it's the right question. It's a frustrating situation to eat, and then simvastatin didn't work after seven years of effort. So, yeah. Oh, we've got a question. Um, five years ago, I was told I had a primary, secondary progressive MS. And just recently, I've been told that I've just got progressive MS. So how do you distinguish between primary and sec secondary? 25 years ago, all progressive patients were called chronic progressive MS. There was no demarcation. I think with the use of more advanced scanning, we can see certain indications that look more secondary than categorise. But, but we maybe have to move beyond the label and think about well, what can we... I don't know if you want to comment on, on rehabilitation. And Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose from my point of view, um, I think I agree with Jeremy. The people that I would see... To a certain extent, for me, it doesn't matter on what they feel their symptoms are, what they feel they want to achieve, and how they want to kind of manage those things. So, um, maybe have had a mixed mixed yeah. diagnosis, um, but all the, the problems yeah. and the symptoms and the symptom yeah. management. Like to say the same really that um, MS nurses can look at managing your bladder symptoms, make suggestions, make referrals on. We're staying at the level that you are and maintaining that level. But it's also helping with that emotional change when the MS changes again and it comes in with a, a, another wave of symptoms and actually it's helping people establish them. Um, For MS, like relapse and remitting, um, in your view, would it be, if people are on, say, Copaxone, would it be also beneficial for them to be on a statin as well? That's a really good question. In fact, trials were done in relapsing remitting MS where statins, both simvastatin and atorvastatin, were added to beta interferon, and they were neutral, they were negative. I think the reason is, not that it may not have some effect, I don't think it has a majority effect, and also the trials weren't big enough. If you do a small trial, you'll never show an effect. If you do a trial with 10 people, you can never show an effect. And these trials were done with hundreds of people, and they need to be done with probably thousands of people, and they weren't done. So they're made in the situation. OK, and then one last question. My question's for Dawn. Um, in that we've found Wayne's been diagnosed with MS for nearly 10 and a half years now. And when he was first diagnosed, he, was, he went into rehabilitation for five weeks, which was absolutely wonderful, and they got him walking really, really well. Um, and then after he came out, we had nothing. They told us that they were going to, oh, we'll have physio, we'll keep up with it. We had nothing for three years. And then this, he went back into rehabilitation. By that time, he was, he was walking a little bit, but had, was in a wheelchair for long distances and everything. And after that rehabilitation, we've had nothing, absolutely nothing in the, for the, you know, and we, find, we feel that... If, if some of these... So why in some areas people are getting the physio and in other areas they're not getting the physio? And we have continuity at that time. You know, you might still be walking now. You know? Benefits of, of physio, um, I'm completely aware of that kind of situation and I think it's one of the things that um, get the lottery of care and there is a postcode lottery within health and social care, I think, across the whole of the UK. Um, obviously, um, specifically, but, yeah... I think I would see people's frustrations of, like you say, maybe having some inpatient stay and then maybe there being either nothing community-wise or people having to wait. Um, 
I don't, the access to treatments is patchy around the UK, so that, uh, that is disease-modifying treatments, but also symptom management treatments like physiotherapy, uh, and it's something that we are working very hard to address, and I'm sure you will be hearing more about in the coming weeks. Um, that's all we have time for, for, I'm afraid, but just before we finish, I wanted to say that um, the speakers will, uh, the panelists will be around um, for the next couple of hours. Jeremy will be in the science zone. Roger, are you coming to the science zone as well? I thought you were. Yeah, Roger will be there as well. Um, I, I've been working for the MS Society for just over five years, and I am really amazed at the progress that's been made in progressive MS research and progression. Um, it's been one of our priorities for a long time. Squarely in the groove. Early in the groove.
sitting squarely in the groove. Squarely in the groove. Squarely in the groove.
sitting squarely in the groove. Well, in the groove. Well, in the groove.
early in the groove.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the theatre. Um, we are about to start the session on emotional well-being and MS. Um, people with MS um, experience emotional and psychological symptoms as well as more well-known physical symptoms. And we're starting to get an exact handle on um, how many people with MS experience things like anxiety and depression, as well as developing new strategies and treatments to help people cope with it. So I'm really excited to have this session today. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. We've got two fantastic speakers here to help talk about the issues. Firstly, you're going to hear from Karina Jones, who's an Associate Professor of Health Informatics at the College of Medicine at Swansea University. She leads the UK Register, um, MS Register, which brings critical data together, um, clinical data and um, straight data reported through the website. And if, you're, if you have MS and you're not on it, I really strongly urge you to register. I've been using it uh, since it started, and I think it's a brilliant resource. Um, we're then going to be followed uh, by Nadina Lincoln, who's Professor of Clinical Psychology at the University of Nottingham. She's carried out research into cognitive rehabilitation for memory problems and the effectiveness of adjustment groups for people with MS and low mood. Nadina will talk about psychological problems being developed and tested in people with MS, as well as her research into group-based therapy to help improve low mood. So without much ado, I'd like to welcome you to the stage, please. Thank you. You've got the clicker there. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the talks. I'm really enjoying MS Life. Um, the last time, two years ago, was my first MS Life, and I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great conference. Um, so I've only got 10 minutes, so I mustn't speak too long, actually. Um, if you do want to come to the MS Register stand, we're just down the far end in the science, science zone, uh, quite near to the cafe. So, we're going to look at anxiety and depression in people with MS. And this is just a, a screen print, really, of the front of the paper from which the information that I'm going to talk about comes from. And it was published in PLOS One. It's on open access, so anybody can get to it. You don't have to have a subscription or anything like that. And the research we did was based on the responses that people with MS gave via our internet site in response to the hospital anxiety and depression scale. It's a very commonly used scale to measure anxiety and depression in all sorts of people. It's got 14 questions, seven for anxiety, seven for depression, and there are four options for severity. So, for example, not at all, sometimes, uh, frequently, off, very often, that sort of thing. And so the scores for anxiety can range from naught up to 21, because the scores are zero, one, two, or three, and the same for depression. It can be from naught up to 21. We looked at the responses from people with MS and compared them with a general UK population uh, sample. Because it's a widely used scale, you can get data on the general UK population as well. And you can see there, I think you can see if I can point at it. If you look at, um, if you look at the Yes, the um, UK reference group, the average anxiety score is just over six, whereas for people with MS, it's just over eight. And for depression, it's about 3.7. And for people with MS, it's 7.6. And there's a, a positive relationship between anxiety and depression. That means that as anxiety goes up, depression goes up as well. We looked at the proportions of people that report that they're suffering symptoms of anxiety and depression. And there's a cutoff point of seven or below is considered to be in the normal range for anxiety and depression. And eight or above is considered to indicate at least mild symptoms of anxiety and depression. And what we found was over half the people with MS scored over eight for anxiety and almost half scored over eight for depression. There were more women suffering symptoms of anxiety than men, and there were more men suffering symptoms of depression than women. Anxiety was most frequent among people who reported they had relapse in remitting MS, and depression was more frequent among people who said they had secondary progressive. And only a third of the people, and there were 4,700 people, 
only a third of them reported they didn't have symptoms of either anxiety or depression. This, this is a, a, a slide that shows the levels of anxiety and depression in people that have got anxiety or depression. So for example, this one over here shows the levels of anxiety in people who've got a depression score more than eight. So people who have got symptoms indicating they're suffering from depression, these are the proportions of people suffering from anxiety as well. And the blue is the people whose anxiety score falls into the normal range. So only about a quarter of the people suffering from depression are not suffering from anxiety. The rest have got mild or moderate or severe effects. Similarly with this one, these are the levels of depression in people with an anxiety score of more than eight. And here, there's 34% of people, about a third of people who um, have got an anxiety score of over eight, only that many haven't got symptoms of depression, all the rest are suffering from symptoms of depression. So you can see it's quite, it's quite prevalent and it, it's, 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 it's often thought that it's underreported and I think this shows that at least in this sample of people, which is you know, 4,700 people, it's quite prevalent. We looked then at some of the relationships between the scores, because as well as looking at the proportions of people suffering from symptoms, we wanted to look, well, how high are people's scores? And we looked at relationships then between some of the things that you may think, we may think, um, could be related to anxiety and depression. And we looked at um, anxiety and depression in relation to the time since people have had their first symptoms, or time since the diagnosis was confirmed, or since age. And apart from age, in which there was a negative relationship, there was very little relationship between them. So it didn't automatically follow that people become more anxious or depressed when they've had MS for longer, which I think is, 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 is a positive thing. And there was a weak negative relationship between anxiety score and age, where people, as they got older, actually become slightly less anxious. This shows the anxiety and depression scores by gender. As we mentioned, there were more people, more women suffering from anxiety, more men suffering from depression, but this shows how the differences in the actual levels uh, show themselves. So this shows um, anxiety. So you can see that women have higher anxiety scores than men, but men have higher depression scores than women. We also looked at it by the MS type or disease course and found that people with relapsing remitting have higher anxiety scores and people with secondary progressive have higher depression scores. We were also aware that there are differences in the types of people who have different types of MS by gender. So the distribution of the types of MS varies by gender. And this shows that um, with this one, you've got far more women with relapsing remitting and smaller proportions with primary or secondary progressive. And in this one, you've got, although it's still the major type, there are fewer men with relapsing remitting and more with the progressive type. So what we did then was we controlled for gender and we controlled for the disease course to see if we could look at the differences so to avoid the confounding effect of gender or disease course. And these are the, what we found for the different types of MS. I mean, you can see the numbers here. I'm conscious I haven't got a lot of time. But basically, the summary is that women had higher anxiety scores than men across the types of MS, and men had higher depression scores than women across the types of MS. And if you control for gender, you find that women's anxiety scores differed with type of MS and were highest in relapsing remitting. There was no statistical difference in men's anxiety scores by disease course. And depression scores varied for MS type for men and for women, with the highest being in secondary progressive. So in terms of a summary then, um, we found that anxiety and depression rates among our respondents were notably high, with over half scoring over eight for anxiety and almost half uh, showing symptoms of depression. And only a third of people didn't show symptoms of either one. Women with relapsing remitting were more anxious than men with this type and women with other types of MS. 
and within each gender, men and women with secondary progressive MS tended to be more depressed. In conclusion, we can say that these conditions are highly prevalent. There are many factors that may influence the rates, but it seems that um, it, they may be, be underestimated sometimes, which may mean that people are not getting the best help and advice and treatments that they could have. We're aware that there are limitations, of course, because the data that we use is self-reported data collected via the MS register, and we're just conscious of that with any survey-type data um, of possible bias there. And the MS disease courses themselves are self-reported. And of course, as we all know, sometimes it's difficult because people with relapse and remitting may develop secondary progressive in time. And so there are possible discrepancies there. Um, but we just want to be conscious of that. And also people seeking help may be more inclined to fill in a questionnaire about anxiety and depression because of the, the thought that this will be beneficial and lead to some help. Um, but as we build up the data on the MS register, we'll be able to address bias then. Just as a, as a final slide, I think I'm okay actually. Time. Yep. Just to give you an idea, um, I wasn't going to put this one in the main slides in case I didn't have time, but just, although we're conscious of the bias, this is the profile of our respondents. Um, we have approximately 70% men, 30% women, which is a ratio of 2.4 women to men, which is what you tend to find in prevalent MS populations. Um, among the disease courses, our proportions of people with primary progressive is, is approximately right. Relapse and remitting is okay. I think our secondary progressive proportion is a bit low. And DKs don't know. And this doesn't mean the answer wasn't given. It means people said they didn't know the type of MS they've got. The mean age of our respondents is about 51, which again is about right for a prevalent population. And these are uh, confirmed diagnosis mean is 12 years and having had symptoms for uh, 16 years. And just as a further uh, example, we looked at the characteristics of our uh, respondents in relation just to educational attainment, something that we don't think there'd be any reason to think there should be a difference between people with MS and the general population. And we found that they were very, very similar that people in the UK population in general with a first or higher degree was 31%, 33 in people with MS is very slightly but not significantly higher. And people who only went as far as secondary school level, that's also very close as well. But we'll be able to do more with validation as we build up the data. And those are just acknowledgements. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much for whizzing through that. Um, it was fast, very <laughs> it was brilliant, thank you. Um, I'd like, like uh, to welcome to the stage uh, Professor, um, sorry, my brain, <laughs> Professor Nidina Lincoln, if that's, please. Right, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today. What I'd like to do is to talk about some of our research on emotional well-being. We know that, I'm just going to move a bit closer because I'm struggling to see the slides from here. Right. We, we know that, um, so my apologies for pausing, I'm just working out how I can try and see that at the same time as, uh, has been in the mic. Ah, that's, there's one there. Thank you. And it's helpfully pointed out to me. That's better. Right, we know that lots of people suffer various levels of distress. And what we're talking about is not just anxiety and depression, but a range of emotions that people can experience. Anger, guilt, frustration, fear. So people will get um, all sorts of things happening to them. These are things that happens to everybody any time they're under a significant stress, but when it becomes of particular interest to us and of particular concern, it's when it gets to such a level that it interferes with people's everyday lives. Some people with MS are affected very early after diagnosis, so the initial shock of the diagnosis, they will have concerns, they will have worries about the future, they will get depressed because they feel they have a, a long-term progressive condition and gradually they adjust to that and they learn to cope with it. 
but then sometimes other people will have no problems or relatively few problems early on. But later on, as their symptoms progress, as new symptoms emerge, then they have to go through that whole cycle again, and sometimes it causes more difficulty uh, later on. As we've already heard, this affects quite a lot of people, and the rates in different studies will vary, but they're certainly high enough that there are a substantial number of people that would be benefiting from some sort of intervention. The other reason it's important is that if people are experiencing significant levels of distress, it will affect their overall quality of life so that their whole lifestyle becomes affected. It also affects people's ability to cope with additional stressors. So if they are distressed anyway, and then something else happens, their ability to cope with that additional stress becomes less. People will have more difficulty coping with social difficulties when they're in a level, high level of distress. There's also concern that if people are highly distressed, it will put a burden on other people. If you live some, with somebody else who's miserable, it tends to make you miserable and you feed on each other and the level of distress goes up in both people. And a further reason we need to do research is that there's some evidence to suggest that if people have very high levels of distress, it can actually exacerbate the symptoms of MS. So what can we do about it? Um, there are drug treatments available so that people with severe levels of depression may be given antidepressants and they can be helpful. People can be drug given drugs to reduce their level of anxiety. Uh, but some people don't want to take drug treatments. And often, although the drug treatments can be very helpful in people to, with moderate to severe levels of distress, for people with mild to moderate levels, they may not be the optimum treatment. Psychological interventions have been evaluated, particularly with people with mild to moderate levels of distress. And for psychological treatments, essentially we have two strategies. We can either wait till people get distressed, identify them when they have high levels of distress, and then treat the problem. Or we can intervene before they become distressed in order to try and prevent distress developing. So in terms of the former, there's a series of studies that have been conducted on cognitive behavior therapy as a treatment for those people who experience low mood. Now, cognitive behavior therapy is a psychological intervention that really focuses on the interaction between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So if you feel, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, the future looks very grim, it makes you feel bad, and then you tend to do less, which makes you feel even worse, and you get caught up in this vicious cycle. And the aim of the therapy is to interrupt that vicious cycle to stop it getting feeding onto itself. The other strategy for people who are not significantly distressed is to provide them with emotional support at a time when they're coping and to teach them strategies to stop them um, encountering significant difficulties when they are put under further stress. And so it's actually to try and prevent, teach people the skills they need to cope with distress before they experience significant levels in hopes that they'll be able to cope better. Various studies have been conducted, and I've just put a couple of examples up here. So Rona Moss Morris um, conducted a study funded by the MS Society recently that looked at identifying people with MS who had significant problems with low mood and compared nurse-led cognitive behavior therapy with a supportive listening, which this was a trained listener to uh, talk to people. They had eight sessions and demonstrated that the people who had the cognitive behavior therapy had benefits in terms of their mood for up to a year after they were recruited. And the intervention was particularly beneficial in the people with the highest levels of distress and also with people with lower levels of social support. So if you didn't have a family member to support you, you were more vulnerable to having significant distress. In terms of support groups for um, everybody, uh, Sally Rigby conducted a study in Liverpool a few years ago where she identified 
147 people with MS, allocated them either to a psychotherapeutic group, this was essentially a cognitive behaviour therapy intervention where people were taught strategies to cope with distress and to identify when they were under significant strain, a social support group where everybody got together, had cups of tea, had a chat and it was all very nice and uh, encouraging but they didn't do the specific techniques, and a third group who had information booklets about how to cope with stress. And the two interventions where people actually met as a group uh, resulted in significantly less anxiety than simply having the information in a booklet. So it seems to be that group support is something that's quite important. So this was really the background to our study where we were interested in whether if we identify people with high levels of distress, whether we can provide group support to help address that. So the aim was to evaluate a support group in those people with high levels of distress. The overall design of the study was to identify people with MS, so we contacted people known to the neurologists and the community rehabilitation teams. We sent them questionnaires, uh, including the hospital anxiety and depression scale, which you've heard about, to identify those people with significant levels of distress. And then we allocated them into two groups. We had a usual care group, which for most psychological interventions means no psychological intervention. Very few people receive much psychological support, and certainly in our service, um, that was very limited. And the other group got the usual service plus a group treatment program. And then we looked at how they were getting on four and eight months after they were recruited. The treatment consisted of six sessions of about an hour and a half long. The content of the treatment was defined in a manual, which is now available through the MS Society. The materials were all put on PowerPoint slides. Uh, there were handouts available, and all that material is now available to enable other people to deliver the groups. So this is just one or two examples from some of the sessions. So the initial session was very much about getting to know people, so there was an introduction to the group, introductions to each other. If you're going to start talking about problems with how you feel, you need to feel comfortable talking to these people in the room, and therefore you need to get to know them a bit first before you're prepared to disclose what your worries are. So there was quite a lot of uh, getting to know each other, and then in the first session, people were asked to just identify specific problems they encountered that they wanted to work on. And the session ended with a relaxation uh, exercise where people were taught relaxation uh, techniques to enable them to apply those at times when they would uh, come under levels of distress. Um, the emphasis in the group was that the purpose of the group was to not for the therapist to tell people what to do, but to share ideas, to share ideas about how people have found ways of coping with different problems, sharing information, sharing access to support. And also it was hoped that the groups would provide a supportive network for the group members. And the most successful groups were those where actually after the intervention ended, people carried on meeting and carried on in contact with each other. And there was certainly one group that I was well aware of that after our sort of formal research ended, they used to meet on a monthly basis um, to continue supporting each other. And the aim of the group is that we weren't going to be able to enable them to solve the problems. What we were trying to do is to give people a few strategies to help them to adjust to the symptoms of MS that they were experiencing. And we tried to make the groups enjoyable. It's very difficult <coughs> if you have, you know, you're dealing with depression and anxiety, it can get all a bit um, negative. Um, we tried to make it lighthearted and actually about how we cope rather than emphasizing the negative aspects of it. Um, each session had a recap of the previous week, a topic for the week, and then a group discussion, and people were given tasks to do in between the sessions. Um, the six sessions had a different topic, so the first one was about, uh, was really a getting to know you uh, session. We then had a session on problem solving, how to identify problems, how to brainstorm problems. 
We then had two sessions which were called worry and gloom. We wanted to get away from this label of anxiety and depression, which tends to have a medical connotation and, and in terms of diagnosis. Um, worry, I think, was fine, and it was a reasonable thing to use instead of anxiety. People didn't like the term gloom. I think we should have called it misery or sadness or something else. Um, but that's the reason we've tried to avoid the, the words anxiety and depression. And then the last two sessions, one was about looking at how mood impacts on partners, families, colleagues, friends, or how you cope with people in general public. Um, and the final session was about preparing people for the future. What strategies have you learned in this group you can then go out and apply when you start to realize that you're um, becoming anxious or becoming depressed? Um, so there were various um, techniques that we taught people. So this is in the problem-solving session. We're trying to teach people to, um, probably won't be able to read it, uh, say what the problem is, try and look at it from all sides. So, OK, you think this is the problem. How would your family think the problem is? What would NHS professionals think of the problem? What would the man in the street think of the problem? Are there other ways of looking at this problem? Brainstorm all sorts of possible solutions weigh them up, decide the pros and cons, and then decide what strategy you're going to do. Try that out. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, go and try on something else. So it was trying to get people to identify problems and think about things that they could do and to help each other think about things they might do. Um, this is a slide from the anxiety session, highlighting how things feed into each other. So somebody with a fear of falling, thinks more and more about falling, worries, they become tense and anxious, so they become more unsteady, so they avoid walking because they're getting more unsteady, they get less practice, and therefore they become more likely to fall. And about how to try and intervene at the level at which anxiety is building up so that it doesn't exacerbate the physical problems. People had homework to do, this wasn't compulsory homework, but it was to try and encourage them to try and apply the strategies in their everyday life. Um, so, for example, after the session on gloom or misery, you know, what things, try and think about things that make you happy, can you identify more of these things that you can do? So, to come back to the research, we um, identified just over 300 people of whom 151 had significant levels of distress. So that's both anxiety and depression. So it's about half, which is quite a high percentage. And 72 of those were allocated to receive the treatment and 79 to their usual care. We followed people up for eight months. Some people dropped out during the course of the study, but by the end of the study, we had 58 people who received the treatment and 71 in the usual care group who returned the questionnaires. The people who took part were on average uh, in their mid-40s. Um, we had about three quarters who were men and a quarter, sorry, three quarters who were women and a quarter who were men, which was consistent with what you might expect. About two thirds had relapsing remitting MS. We had about a quarter in full-time work, and most of them were able to get time off work in order to attend the group sessions. Um, we tried to schedule the group sessions at, so that they minimized the amount of time they had to have off work. And the majority of people lived with another person, so they, in terms of the relationship session, had somebody who they um, were going to be living with to discuss these, the topics with. So the first thing we did was to compare the people who received the treatment with the people who went through the usual care. And we found that at four months, so that was just after the end of the intervention, the people who had had the treatment had less, lower levels of distress. They had less depression and less anxiety. They had higher levels of self-efficacy. This is the, the people's perception of their ability to cope with their distress and they had a higher quality of life. By eight months, so this is after the end of treatment, we looked at the, how long these treatment effects persist. 
we still found differences in mood. So eight months after recruitment, people were still less distressed if they'd had the treatment. They still had higher self-efficacy. There was no difference on the quality of life measure, but on the impact of MS on their everyday life, the people who had treatment did better. So this seemed very encouraging. The group seemed to be uh, the feedback from the groups was positive, people found them helpful, and we could demonstrate beneficial effects in terms of people's mood. There were two additional aspects that we were interested in. One was that we were aware that not, if you have a group intervention, not everybody is going to attend. Not everybody's going to attend every session. That's like if you join an evening class, you don't go every week. You will go most weeks, but there will be some weeks where you can't go. The same is true for a psychological treatment group. Not everybody goes every week. And the other issue is about if this is going to be implemented in the NHS, how much will it cost? So in terms of attendance, we just looked out of the six sessions at how many sessions people attended. And about, only about a quarter of people attended all six sessions. Um, so it's not surprising people missed some sessions, but half attended five or six sessions. So in terms of our outcomes, it means that we are getting beneficial effects on mood, even though half the people, are, only half the people are getting most of the treatment. And in fact, there were a quarter of people who didn't come at all. And the outcome assessment still includes those people who didn't attend, because what we want to know is, if you offer a group to a range of people, what is the overall benefit for that group of people? So the question is, why didn't people come? And there are all sorts of reasonable reasons for not turning up. Um, and they are things that um, there were a few people we couldn't contact. The few people decided after being offered the treatment, well, they decided it wasn't for them. There were other commitments, whether they were childcare commitments, work care commitments. Um, some people simply forgot to come and clashes with other things. And for a few people, it was relapses in their MS. So there's a whole range of reasons, but there was no one particular reason that stood out in terms of why people said they didn't come to the sessions. We also looked at the characteristics of the people who attended a lot and the people who attended very infrequently. And the only thing to emerge um, was that men tended to attend less well than women. Um, the, there are various possibilities. One is that in each group that we had, the groups had six to eight participants, there tended to be only one, quite often, only one man. And it may be that they didn't come because they felt that they were the only one and that actually it would have been better to have groups specifically for men. Um, but the men in the audience might have some ideas why uh, the men are less likely to attend. The other thing is the cost effectiveness, because if it's going to be implemented in the NHS, we need to demonstrate that it's going to save the NHS money. Um, to provide the intervention required uh, some time from a clinical psychologist, a qualified clinical psychologist, to supervise the delivery of the treatment. Assistant psychologists actually delivered the groups, and we had two people there at each session, one to run the sessions, but another person available to help if somebody got upset or if somebody needed help with uh, some of the... Uh, practical tasks we asked people to do. Um, we had some room hire costs because we tried to hold it in venues that were nice to go to and not in hospital premises. So we had a university arts centre which had a nice um, downstairs room with accessible toilets and then a cafe next door so that people could come to the group session and then go and have their lunch in the cafe. And it was a nice environment to be in rather than in uh, NHS premises. Um, we provided tea and, um, tea and biscuits, and there were costs of the materials of providing handouts and um, summaries of each session. And we also paid people's travelling costs for coming to the group sessions. So the overall running cost was um, over, just over £17,000, which worked out as a cost of about £250 per person. So to decide whether it was worthwhile, we looked at the total cost of the intervention group, so that's the cost of the treatment, plus the cost of the clinical services they were receiving in the eight-month period, so this is 
visits to GPs, visits, visits to the MS nurses, consultant appointments, uh, physiotherapy, and also the drugs they were taking. And what we found was in the intervention group, uh, the overall cost of the treatment for the, for the group of people as a whole was about just over 88,000. By eight month follow up, there was a reduction and there was an overall reduction in cost of about 33,000, which is about 470 pounds per person. In contrast, in the usual care group, they had roughly comparable um, levels at the beginning, but they had a slight increase in the cost of the services they were using, and the average per patient was an increase of 23 pounds. So it meant that overall, there was a savings of 493 pounds per person, or roughly 500 pounds per person was saved as a result of providing the intervention. So that was encouraging that it was worth, uh, not only in terms of the support it provided, but from a financial perspective. So the conclusions from the study was that the treatment improved people's mood, it reduced the impact of MS on their everyday lives, it saved the NHS 500 pounds per participant. But we conducted the study in one centre, it was carried out in Nottingham, we had one therapist, maybe that therapist was particularly good and nobody else could deliver it as well. So really what we need to do now is to run the study again using lots of different therapists in lots of different centres to make sure it's applicable across a range of settings. But the information could be used to support the development of psychological services for people with MS because in many centres there's very limited, certainly in terms of specialist psychological support. The real challenge now is that we know from several studies, and not just this study, that psychological treatments can reduce mood problems and they can improve people's quality of life. But the problem is there's a very limited availability of psychological interventions in a lot of uh, centres. So really the, what we need to do now is to ensure there's increased accessibility within clinical services so that people can benefit from these types of interventions um, rather than struggling on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know about all of you, but I've got a list of questions myself to, to ask you about this um, study. Um, we've got about 10 minutes to uh, Q&A, so um, if you'd like to put your hands up. We've got some people with microphones um, over there. Um, are there any questions? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll start with mine then. <laughs> Brilliant. Have you got a question? Sorry, I can't see you with the lights. Brilliant. Quite close into the mic. Okay. Um, uh, I'm interested in the point you made at the end there about the limited accessibility of uh, psychological interventions. Do you think there's any scope to deliver any of this virtually? Sorry, I missed the end of the question. D Is deliver there any, scope? A any psychological interventions virtually online? Um, certainly some of the studies have done telephone administered psychological interventions. There were a couple of studies in the States that did cognitive behaviour therapy but over the telephone. So it reduced the problems of um, transport and in, the idea was the, a cost effective way of delivering it. Um, there, have, there, there are a lot of self-help programmes of um, using cognitive behaviour therapy in particular through books, online and so on. But the thing that emerged from people's feedback was what they found helpful was actually being in the room with other people with a similar problem and doing it together. Now, to some extent, what we found will be is probably partly a reflection of the sort of people who would have joined our study are the people who like doing things in groups. Um, so I think there's probably scope for both. There are some people who would be able to work through these things on their own, probably find it helpful to do it online, and there are other people who like doing it in a group with other people with similar problems, and it's about matching the mode of delivery to the person's preferences. And that, certainly one of the things that we've been discussing now in terms of future research is to look at having a combination of individual 
and group therapy available and people can mix and match rather than most of the, most of the research has been either all individual or all group. Um, and I think it's personal preferences. Some people like groups, some people don't. You have a question over there? Hello, thank you. Yes, um, I work with the uh, Wigan branch of the MS Society with sufferers and uh, close family members in a counselling capacity. Um, you mentioned that the research that you've just been presenting to us might be uh, offered in uh, different venues, places, and I wondered if I could perhaps be involved in this in some way. I'd be very interested in uh, offering my services. Uh, thank you. I think we would be delighted. What, what we've done is to, for the, for the group that we evaluated, that the, the manual for the group, that all the materials, all the handouts, all the exercises are, are produced and available for people to try out. And we certainly ran a, a training session for people who wanted to deliver the group activity. And I think we had about 12 people there. It was run last year. And there are plans for running other sessions so that if people are interested in delivering these, in, these groups, then we would be delighted to hear from them. Just on that note, I'm assuming if you cut out the clinical psychologist's involvement, you reduce the overall cost of running the workshop because they're on. Sorry, I didn't if you cut out, sorry, if you cut out uh, or you stop working with the clinical psychologist in the actual workshop itself, the overall cost of the program will go down because you've not got paid staff involved. So I'm trying to work out how to reduce the 500 uh, per head cost for the workshop. Yes, I, I think I think the answer is we don't know what level of expertise people need to deliver the group. We delivered it with a clinical psychologist supervising assistant psychologist because we wanted to feel comfortable that we were providing a treatment that we were convinced could be um, delivered in a way we thought was necessary. But we don't know whether people actually need that level of training and whether because somebody can pick up the manual and just deliver it, um, whether there were quite a few MS nurses who were interested in delivering it. Um, I think the key thing is probably not about having that supervision to deliver it necessarily, but having the availability of somebody to whom you can pass on, uh, pass people on to if they have particular difficulties, or who you can seek advice. Because what you never know when you start these groups and you start talking about depression and anxiety is suddenly all sorts of problems crop up, which may be nothing to do with people's MS. It may be to do with all sorts of other life crises. And you need to be able to direct them into the services. So it's really about having a pathway where if something crops up in the treatment sessions that is not appropriate for that treatment group, you can pass it up to somewhere else. Thank you. Any other questions? This gentleman at the back. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm from the Czech Republic. I'd like to ask if uh, you uh, thought about possible co cooperation with uh, any institution abroad, uh, not from UK. Uh, is, are there any ideas regarding possible co cooperation in um, handling these um, therapies somewhere? Did you hear that? Did you think about there any international collaboration with another country? Yeah. So, um, yes, I mean, w there are various centres that have been evaluating these treatments. I think what we haven't done and, um, is to try and do multi-centre trials of, across different countries to evaluate it. I think, I think probably we're struggling to try and identify the effective treatments. Now that we have some effective treatments, there is certainly scope for doing international research of, of these interventions. Um, but I'm not aware of any... Um, international psychological intervention studies. Hello. Um, so you've proven that through your study that um, this kind of therapy is effective and that it's also cost effective. So I'm just wondering um, how 
how available this kind of treatment would be. Um, I presume it's kind of experimental at this stage. I mean, is it a case of you now having to convince um, NHS trusts around the country that this should be offered to people with MS? That's my first question. And the second question is, um, I can't remember, one or other of you referred to the fact that um, um, the need for treatment should be offered as a preventative measure uh, at the stage perhaps of diagnosis or pre-diagnosis. Um, and I certainly think in my case it would have been very helpful to have that at the point of diagnosis, um, to have that support immediately offered to me just in case I did fall into depression, anxiety, etc. Um, and, and it certainly wasn't for, in my situation. Mm. Yes, I mean, certainly the... The, the implementation in the NHS is really now about convincing people who commission services that it's worth paying for, which is why we included the cost effectiveness information, because that's going to sway commissioners more than evidence of you know, people feeling less distressed. Um, it takes a long time for these interventions to get from research into clinical practice. We are gradually beavering away trying to convince people that actually they could provide some of these. And this is why the material is available. But it's a slow process. So we're, we're trying, to, trying to convince people that the services need to be more widely available. In terms of um, using the groups as a preventative measure, people have, um, I think quite a lot of people who are, when they're first diagnosed, will go to some sort of um, early diag you know, sort of a group session immediately after diagnosis. But then there's a sort of gap, and there are people who are struggling to cope but not yet significantly distressed who could probably benefit from learning the strategies to cope with their mood before they become a major problem. So it's picking up people when they're slightly, slightly anxious, slightly depressed, to try and stop them tipping over into the extremes before it actually happens. And it's, the difficulty is knowing how to identify those people and getting people to come forward at a point where they're beginning to feel a bit distressed as opposed to waiting until they really get desperate. Thank you. That's really interesting, that last point you made. I've, I've had various treatments and done CBT and things like this, and it's been fantastic when I've been feeling not too bad. But when I've suddenly, when I have gone low, and with someone like MS, it quite often suddenly goes low, um, trying to get some help has been really, really hard for me. Um, there's been long waiting lists. Um, consultants don't, not, not the MS consultants necessarily, but the other people don't put you through to the right people, to the GPs and so on. And I'm a bit stuck, really. I'm, I've, I mean, I've been sort of going around here crying today because I'm at that sort of low mood and don't quite know what to do about it, really. Mm. And I'm sure there'll be lots of people who do get that to that state. And it's like, well, help. You know, how, how, can, how can I be helped now? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. And I think, I think it's about awareness. I think um, one of the problems is people um, are that are not sure about how effective these treatments are in people with MS. And they tend to think, well, you know, the treatments were developed for people with depression and not for people with a physical condition as well. And it's, it, it's about awareness of that actually there are things that can help and making sure they're accessible. And, I mean, I'm aware within our local service there are lots of people who are unaware that there are treatments available to help. Um, so it's you know, publicity. When you're a person who's, who is suffering with it, it's then a battle to try and get the treatment and the help. And because you're quite low, it's hard to fight for that. Yeah. And I'm, I don't really know what to do next, really. I think one of the things would be to join the MS Society campaigning group to help campaign for better have, services. That, that's a good, yeah. a good step forward, but it is very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just to get on to your GP. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, in that which I'd like to thank you both very much for it's been absolutely fascinating and really informative. Uh, thank you very much for your time.
and I'm, I'm sure you'll be around for a few minutes afterwards if anyone wants to um, talk uh, more one on one. Thank you. the digital team at the MS Society. This weekend, along with the rest of the team, we'll be at MS Life 2014 in Manchester. We'll be bringing the MS Life experience to you on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll be interviewing speakers, reporting on events and capturing all the best bits. But we can't be everywhere at once, so we need your help to decide where we should go. How? Check the schedule, then use the hashtag SendStew to direct me via Twitter and our Facebook to anywhere at MS Live 2014. For example, send Stu to the wheelchair dancing in the Get Active Zone, or send Stu to watch the ice cold chef cooking demo in the MS Live kitchen. Obviously, we'll try to meet your requests within reason. If you say send Stu to Cornwall, Coventry, or Guadalajara, we may not have the time or budget to do it. If you're coming to MS Life, get involved by letting us know what you've been up to and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. Most importantly, we want you to be ready to join in, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and YouTube. See you at the weekend. and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. What? <laughs> 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 Welcome to MS Live 2014 in Manchester. So here we are. Um, tomorrow, when all the action will be happening, you'll be able to watch the research talks. We'll be live streaming them, so you'll be able to watch them as they happen. Um, go to the website for more details to see what the talks are about and what time they're on. You'll be able to watch them live. And yes, if you have any questions, go to the website. And if you want to see something here, but you can't be here, I'm Stuart. You use the hashtag send Stu and you can send me to see a bit of MS Life that you can't see and I'll maybe go there. Thank you. I'm going to ask him how he feels about MS Life. Craig, are you excited about MS Life? Yeah, he is. So, um, yeah, moving on.
Welcome to MS Live 2014. I'm with Shana Pizarro, um, who is going to be doing a talk, Escaping Labels. Um, hello, Shana. Hello. Could you tell us a little bit about the talk and what you're going to be talking to people about? Well, I'm going to be talking about a postcard that I entered into a project called Postcards from the Edges. And the brief was, um, what would you want to say to the world about being disabled? put it on a postcard and um, I, I sort of laughed and, and there was a picture of me smoking in a back alley and I wrote I, I drink, I smoke, I swear I f um, on it, sorry and um, sent it off and it got a lot of press attention and, and uh, it's been you know travelling around the country in an exhibition and ended up in Parliament um, fortunately I know a lot of politicians quite well um, and uh, just said oh, it's what you'd expect from me and, and they laughed so, um, yeah, so I'm talking about that, and I'm talking about why I did that postcard and actually what's behind it in terms of dealing with a diagnosis with MS, coming to terms with being disabled and, you know, the way that MS affects, you know, my life and the way that I've kind of overcome that to make sure that I still get to be me. Now, the talk you're doing is escaping labels. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what labels you're... That you're thinking of escaping? Um, well, I talk a bit about how disabled people are represented in the media, because I think that, that, that very much there's sort of three categories that, that the media present disabled people in, and one is uh, Paralympian super gods, um, the, the second is liars and scroungers and benefit cheats, and the third is sort of tragic cases that, that need to be pitted. And I don't think I'm any of them, um, and and I actually I don't think most disabled people are any of those, and so yeah, I want to talk about a bit about that. Um, also in the talk, um, it's talking about low self confidence. Um, could you could you give some tips about low self confidence and how to overcome that? Um, yeah, I was in a um, uh, marriage to someone who couldn't cope at all with the diagnosis of MS. And he um, very vocally would tell me that I was disgusting because I was disabled and that he couldn't find me sexually attractive knowing that I had to catheterize. Um, you know, he was really very abusive. And in fact, my divorce got put through as um, a priority case on the grounds of, of abuse. I knew that I couldn't handle that myself and you know I I couldn't see how I could ever ever sort of regain my self-esteem and my self-confidence without getting professional help and so I went off to a counselor and I found the counselor that was right for me and I spent six months um, with him and at the start of it I said I want to I want to believe that I'm still me and that I am sexy and that I can you know still be found attractive and and through seeking that professional help that was the thing that really really changed things for me so I think that would be my my real advice to people is seek out and accept the help that you're offered. Thank you very much and I think everyone could agree that Shana's looking very sexy today. Close your eyes. 
closed. Keep them closed. It's just you and me. There's something following us. No, no, no. Don't look. How do you do that? You see things that aren't there. What, well, you don't believe in magic? I think I'm a little old for magic. It's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Cozy. I shouldn't have brought you here. Why not? Because we're still at the stage where we're trying to impress each other. All oh, right. And um, I'm messy. No. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. I thought we were trying to impress each other. <laughs> Fine. Next stage is where we tell each other everything that's wrong with us. You were just a bit early. I don't think that's very fair. Why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you. ask you a few questions before we go through for the scan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any heart surgery before? No. Pacemaker in your heart? <laughs> any jewellery? Have you got a watch on or a chain? Got, okay. Yes, please, yeah. Smith needs to be on Dr. Siegel. I'm the uh, consultant neurologist here at the hospital dealing with your case. And we found the diagnosis uh, definitely inconclusive. I need for you to attach the nervous signal to pass less effectively through your body, resulting in some of the disturbances you've been experiencing. There are clear areas of demyelination in your brain and spinal cord. Sometimes. Do you, do you something? No, other side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, um...
I left this. Yeah, I, I wanted to say I don't think we should get too involved. I don't, I'm not looking for a relationship. I've I've got a lot on my plate at the moment and I'm But you like me? I'm just not feeling it. I mean you're you're lovely, but I'm just not feeling Stop it. Stop saying that. Fine. Fine. There are some things in life which aren't magic, Karen. Okay, knives and forks down the end. Cheers, love. Next. Cheers, can I have five minutes, please? Yeah, sure, problem. I have multiple sclerosis. For the last couple of months, I've had blurred vision. I get these pins and needles in my hands. I mean, sometimes my legs go wobbly. Now, I don't know what's coming next, even the doctors don't. I might suddenly get worse, or maybe I'll just disappear a bit every day. Or I might be okay, and nothing much will happen, but I'll always be scared that it will. You and me, it is magic, but this, well, this is the opposite. Then it was really good to see you. Will I get wobbly legs when I know I'm gonna see you? And I get pins and needles in my hand because you sleep on it, but I really don't mind. And I have no idea what's coming next either, but I'm in. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Stuart from the digital team at the MS Society. This weekend, along with the rest of the team, we'll be at MS Live 2014 in Manchester. We'll be bringing the MS Live experience to you on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll be interviewing speakers, reporting on events and capturing all the best bits. But we can't be everywhere at once, so we need your help to decide where we should go. How? Check the schedule, then use the hashtag SendStu to direct me via Twitter and our Facebook to anywhere at MS Live 2014. For example, send Stu to the wheelchair dancing in the Get Active Zone, or send Stu to watch the ice cold chef cooking demo in the MS Live kitchen. Obviously, we'll try to meet your requests within reason. If you say send Stu to Cornwall, Coventry or Guadalajara, we may not have the time or budget to do it. If you're coming to MS Life, get involved by letting us know what you've been up to and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. Most importantly, we want you to be ready to join in, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus and YouTube. See you at the weekend. and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs>
Welcome to MS Live 2014. I'm with Shana Pizarro, um, who is going to be doing a talk, Escaping Labels. Um, hello, Shana. Hello. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the talk and what you're going to be talking to people about? Well, I'm going to be talking about a postcard that I entered into a project called Postcards from the Edges. And the brief was, um, what would you want to say to the world about being disabled? Put it on a postcard. And um, I, I sort of laughed, and, and there was a picture of me smoking in a back alley. And I wrote, I, I drink, I smoke, I swear, I f um, on it, sorry. And um, sent it off. At, it got a lot of press attention, and, and uh, it's been, you know, traveling around the country in an exhibition and ended up in Parliament. Um, fortunately, I know a lot of politicians quite well um, and uh, just said, oh, it's what you'd expect from me, and, and they laughed. So, um, yeah, so I'm talking about that, and I'm talking about why I did that postcard and actually what's behind it in terms of dealing with a diagnosis with MS, coming to terms with being disabled and, you know, the way that MS affects, you know, my life and the way that I've kind of overcome that to make sure that I still get to be me. Now, the talk you're doing is escaping labels. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what labels you're, that you're thinking of escaping? Um, well, I talk a bit about how disabled people are represented in the media because I think that, that, that very much there's sort of three categories that, that the media present disabled people in. And one is uh, Paralympian super gods. Um, the, the second is liars and scroungers and benefit cheats. And the third is sort of tragic cases that, that need to be pitted. And I don't think I'm any of them. Um, and, and I actually, I don't think most disabled people are any of those. And so, yeah, I want to talk about a bit about that. Um, also in the talk, um, it's talking about low self-confidence. Um, could, you, could you give some tips about low self-confidence and how to overcome that? Um, yeah, I was in a um, uh, marriage to someone who couldn't cope at all with the diagnosis of MS. And he um, very vocally would tell me that I was disgusting because I was disabled and that he couldn't find me sexually attractive knowing that I had to catheterize. Um, you know, he was really very abusive and in fact my divorce got put through as um, a priority case on the grounds of, of abuse. I knew that I couldn't handle that myself and, you know, I, I couldn't see how I could ever, ever sort of regain my self-esteem and my self-confidence without getting professional help. And so I went off to a counsellor and I found the counsellor that was right for me and I spent six months um, with him, and at the start of it, I said, "I want to, I want to believe that I'm still me, and that I am sexy, and that I can, you know, still be found attractive." And and through seeking that professional help, that was the thing that really, really changed things for me. So I think that would be my my real advice to people: is seek out and accept the help that you're offered. Thank you, Mike. And I think everyone could agree that Shana's looking very sexy today. Close your eyes. Closed. Keep them closed. It's just you and me. There's something following us. No, no, no. Don't look. How do you do that? You see things that aren't there. What, well, you don't believe in magic? I think I'm a little old for magic. 
Mrs. Shine. <laughs> Breakfast? Yeah. It's cosy. I shouldn't have brought you here. Why not? Because we're still at the stage where we're trying to impress each other. All oh, right. And, um, I'm messy. No. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were trying to impress each other. Fine. Next stage is where we tell each other everything that's wrong with us. You were just a bit early. Well, I don't think that's very fair. Why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you. ask you a few questions before we go through for the scan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any heart surgery before? No. Like pacemaker in your heart? <laughs> any jewellery? Have you got a watch on or a chain? Got, okay. Yes, please, yeah. Smith needs to be on Dr. Siegel. I'm the uh, consultant neurologist here at the hospital, the owner of the place. And we found the diagnosis uh, definitely inconclusive. I need you to attach a nervous signal to pass us effectively through your body, resulting in some of the disturbances you've been experiencing. There are clear areas of demyelination in your brain and spinal cord. Sometimes. You, you something? No, other side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, um... I wanted to say I don't think we should get too involved in, I don't know, 
Not looking for a relationship. I've... I've got a lot on my plate at the moment, and I'm... But you like me? I'm just not feeling it. I mean, you're, you're lovely, but... I'm just not feeling Stop it. Stop saying that. Fine. Fine. There are some things in life which aren't magic, Karen. Okay, knives and forks down the end. Cheers, love. Next. Cheers, can I have five minutes, please? Yeah, sure, problem. I have multiple sclerosis. For the last couple of months, I've had blurred vision. I get these pins and needles in my hands. And sometimes my legs go wobbly. Now, I don't know what's coming next. Even the doctors don't. I might suddenly get worse, or maybe I'll just disappear a bit every day. Or I might be OK, and nothing much will happen, but I'll always be scared that it will. You and me, it is magic, but this, well, this is the opposite. And it was really good to see you. Will I get wobbly legs when I know I'm going to see you? And I get pins and needles in my hand because you sleep on it, but I really don't mind. And I have no idea what's coming next either, but I'm in. Yeah, yeah. Ten, ten. Yeah, yeah. I'm Stuart from the digital team at the MS Society. This weekend, along with the rest of the team, we'll be at MS Live 2014 in Manchester. We'll be bringing the MS Live experience to you on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll be interviewing speakers, reporting on events and capturing all the best bits. But we can't be everywhere at once, so we need your help to decide where we should go. How? 
Check the schedule, then use the hashtag SendStu to direct me via Twitter and our Facebook to anywhere at MS Life 2014. For example, send Stu to the wheelchair dancing in the Get Active Zone, or send Stu to watch the ice cold chef cooking demo in the MS Life kitchen. Obviously, we'll try to meet your requests within reason. If you say send Stu to Cornwall, Coventry, or Guadalajara, we may not have the time or budget to do it. If you're coming to MS Life, get involved by letting us know what you've been up to and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. Most importantly, we want you to be ready to join in, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and YouTube. See you at the weekend. and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs>
um, who is going to be doing a talk, Escaping Labels. Um, hello, Shana. Hello. Could you tell us a little bit about the talk and what you're going to be talking to people about? Well, I'm going to be talking about a postcard that I entered into a project called Postcards from the Edges. And the brief was, um, what would you want to say to the world about being disabled? Put it on a postcard. And um, I, I sort of laughed, and, and there was a picture of me smoking in a back alley. And I wrote, I, I drink, I smoke, I swear, I f um, on it, sorry. And um, sent it off. At, it got a lot of press attention. And, and uh, it's been, you know, traveling around the country in an exhibition and ended up in Parliament. Um, fortunately, I know a lot of politicians quite well um, and uh, just said, oh, it's what you'd expect from me, and, and they laughed. So, um, yeah, so I'm talking about that, and I'm talking about why I did that postcard and actually what's behind it in terms of dealing with a diagnosis with MS, coming to terms with being disabled and, you know, the way that MS affects, you know, my life and the way that I've kind of overcome that to make sure that I still get to be me. Now, the talk you're doing is escaping labels. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what labels you're, that you're thinking of escaping? Um, well, I talk a bit about how disabled people are represented in the media because I think that, that, that very much there's sort of three categories that, that the media present disabled people in. And one is uh, Paralympian super gods. Um, the, the second is liars and scroungers and benefit cheats. And the third is sort of tragic cases that, that need to be pitted. And I don't think I'm any of them. Um, and, and I actually, I don't think most disabled people are any of those. And so, yeah, I want to talk about a bit about that. Um, also in the talk, um, it's talking about low self-confidence. Um, could, you, could you give some tips about low self-confidence and how to overcome that? Um, yeah, I was in a um, uh, marriage to someone who couldn't cope at all with the diagnosis of MS. And he um, very vocally would tell me that I was disgusting because I was disabled and that he couldn't find me sexually attractive knowing that I had to catheterize. Um, you know, he was really very abusive and in fact my divorce got put through as um, a priority case on the grounds of, of abuse. I knew that I couldn't handle that myself and, you know, I, I couldn't see how I could ever, ever sort of regain my self-esteem and my self-confidence without getting professional help. And so I went off to a counsellor and I found the counsellor that was right for me and I spent six months um, with him, and at the start of it, I said, "I want to, I want to believe that I'm still me, and that I am sexy, and that I can, you know, still be found attractive." And and through seeking that professional help, that was the thing that really, really changed things for me. So I think that would be my my real advice to people: is seek out and accept the help that you're offered. Thank you, Mike. And I think everyone could agree that Shana's looking very sexy today. Close your eyes. Closed. Keep them closed. It's just you and me. There's something following us. No, no, no. How do you do that? You see things that aren't there. What, well, you don't believe in magic? I think I'm a little old for magic. It's a shame. 
Breakfast? Yeah. It's cosy. I shouldn't have brought you here. Why not? Because we're still at the stage where we're trying to impress each other. All oh, right. And, um, I'm messy. No. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were trying to impress each other. Fine. Next stage is where we tell each other everything that's wrong with us. You were just a bit early. Well, I don't think that's very fair. Why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you. ask you a few questions before we go through for the scan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any heart surgery before? No. Pacemaker in your heart? <laughs> any jewellery? Have you got a watch on or a chain? Got, got a yes, please, yeah. Transmission is beyond Dr. Siegel. I'm the uh, consultant neurologist here at the hospital dealing with this case. And we found the diagnosis uh, definitely inconclusive. I need you to attach the nervous signal to pass up pressure to the CA body, resulting in some of the disturbances you've been experiencing. There are clear areas of demyelination in your brain and spinal cord. Sometimes. You've something. No, other side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, um... say I don't think we should get too involved. I don't, I'm not looking for a relationship.
I've I've got a lot on my plate at the moment and I'm But you like me? I'm just not feeling it. I mean you're you're lovely, but I'm just not feeling Stop it. Stop saying that. Fine. Fine. There are some things in life which aren't magic, Karen. Okay, knives and forks down the end. Cheers, love. Next. Cheers, can I have five minutes, please? Yeah, sure, problem. I have multiple sclerosis. For the last couple of months, I've had blurred vision. I get these pins and needles in my hands. And sometimes my legs go wobbly. Now, I don't know what's coming next. Even the doctors don't. I might suddenly get worse, or maybe I'll just disappear a bit every day. Or I might be OK, and nothing much will happen, but I'll always be scared that it will. For you and me, it is magic, but this, well, this is the opposite. And it is really good to see you. Will I get wobbly legs when I know I'm gonna see you? And I get pins and needles in my hand because you sleep on it, but I really don't mind. And I have no idea what's coming next either, but I'm in. Okay. Hi, I'm Stuart from the digital team at the MS Society. This weekend, along with the rest of the team, we'll be at MS Live 2014 in Manchester. We'll be bringing the MS Live experience to you on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll be interviewing speakers, reporting on events and capturing all the best bits. But we can't be everywhere at once, so we need your help to decide where we should go. How? Check the schedule, then use the hashtag, SendStew, 
to direct me via Twitter and our Facebook to anywhere at MS Life 2014. For example, send Stu to the wheelchair dancing in the Get Active Zone, or send Stu to watch the ice cold chef cooking demo in the MS Life kitchen. Obviously, we'll try to meet your requests within reason. If you say, send Stu to Cornwall, Coventry, or Guadalajara, we may not have the time or budget to do it. If you're coming to MS Life, get involved by letting us know what you've been up to and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. Most importantly, we want you to be ready to join in, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and YouTube. See you at the weekend. and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs>
Could you tell us a little bit about the talk and what you're going to be talking to people about? Well, I'm going to be talking about a postcard that I entered into a project called Postcards from the Edges. And the brief was, um, what would you want to say to the world about being disabled? I put it on a postcard. And um, I, I sort of laughed, and, and there was a picture of me smoking in a back alley. And I wrote, I, I drink, I smoke, I swear, I f um, on it, sorry. And um, sent it off. At, it got a lot of press attention. and. And uh, it's been, you know, travelling around the country in an exhibition and ended up in Parliament. Um, fortunately, I know a lot of politicians quite well um, and uh, just said, oh, it's what you'd expect from me, and, and they laughed. So, um, yeah, so I'm talking about that, and I'm talking about why I did that postcard and actually what's behind it in terms of dealing with a diagnosis with MS, coming to terms with being disabled and, you know, the way that MS affects, you know, my life and the way that I've kind of overcome that to make sure that I still get to be me. Now the talk you're doing is escaping labels. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what labels you're, that you're thinking of escaping? Um, well I talk a bit about how disabled people are represented in the media because I think that, that, that very much there's sort of three categories that, that the media present disabled people in. And one is uh, Paralympian super gods. Um, the, the second is liars and scroungers and benefit cheats. And the third is sort of tragic cases that, that need to be pitted. And I don't think I'm any of them. Um, and, and I actually, I don't think most disabled people are any of those. And so, yeah, I want to talk about a bit about that. Um, also in the talk, um, it's talking about low self-confidence. Um, could, you, could you give some tips about low self-confidence and how to overcome that? Um, yeah, I was in a um, uh, marriage to someone who couldn't cope at all with the diagnosis of MS. And he um, very vocally would tell me that I was disgusting because I was disabled and that he couldn't find me sexually attractive knowing that I had to catheterize. Um, you know, he was really very abusive and in fact my divorce got put through as um, a priority case on the grounds of, of abuse. I knew that I couldn't handle that myself and, you know, I, I couldn't see how I could ever, ever sort of regain my self-esteem and my self-confidence without getting professional help. And so I went off to a counsellor and I found the counsellor that was right for me and I spent six months um, with him, and at the start of it, I said, "I want to, I want to believe that I'm still me, and that I am sexy, and that I can, you know, still be found attractive." And and through seeking that professional help, that was the thing that really, really changed things for me. So I think that would be my my real advice to people: is seek out and accept the help that you're offered. Thank you, Mike. And I think everyone could agree that Shana's looking very sexy today. your eyes. Closed. Keep them closed. It's just you and me. There's something following us. No, no, no. Don't look. It's watching us. How do you do that? You see things that aren't there. What, well, you don't believe in magic? I think I'm a little old for magic. It's a shame. <laughs> <laughs>
Breakfast? Yeah. It's cosy. I shouldn't have brought you here. Why not? Because we're still at the stage where we're trying to impress each other. All oh, right. And, um, I'm messy. No. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were trying to impress each other. Fine. Next stage is where we tell each other everything that's wrong with us. You were just a bit early. Well, I don't think that's very fair. Why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you. a few questions before we go through for the scan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any heart surgery before? No. Like pacemaker in your heart? <laughs> any jewellery? Have you got a watch on or a I've chain? Got, I've got a ring. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Smith Mookie on Dr. Siegel. I'm the uh, consultant neurologist here at the hospital dealing with this case. And we found the diagnosis uh, definitely inconclusive. The only piece of the task, the nervous signal, the task less effective with the body, resulting in some of the disturbances you've been experiencing. There are clear areas of demyelination in your brain and spinal cord. Sometimes. You've got something. No, other side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, um... <laughs> say I don't think we should get too involved. I'm not looking for a relationship. I've, I've got a lot on my plate at the moment and I'm... But you like me? I'm just not feeling it. I mean, you're, you're lovely, but I'm just not feeling Stop it. Stop saying that. Fine. Fine. There are some things in life which aren't magic, Karen.
know if some forks down the end. Cheers, love. Next. Fiers, can I have five minutes, please? Yeah, sure, go I have multiple sclerosis. For the last couple of months, I've had blurred vision. I get these pins and needles in my hands. And sometimes my legs go wobbly. Now, I don't know what's coming next. Even the doctors don't. I might suddenly get worse, or maybe I'll just disappear a bit every day. Or I might be OK, and nothing much will happen, but I'll always be scared that it will. For you and me, it is magic, but this, well, this is the opposite. And it is really good to see you. Will I get wobbly legs when I know I'm going to see you? And I get pins and needles in my hand because you sleep on it, but I really don't mind. And I have no idea what's coming next either, but I'm in. Okay. Hi, I'm Stuart from the digital team at the MS Society. This weekend, along with the rest of the team, we'll be at MS Live 2014 in Manchester. We'll be bringing the MS Live experience to you on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We'll be interviewing speakers, reporting on events and capturing all the best bits. But we can't be everywhere at once, so we need your help to decide where we should go. How? Check the schedule, then use the hashtag SendStew to direct me via Twitter and our Facebook to anywhere at MS Live 2014. For example, send Stu to the wheelchair dancing in the Get Active Zone, or send Stu to watch the ice cold chef cooking demo in the MS Live kitchen. Obviously, we'll try to meet your requests within reason. If you say send Stu to Cornwall, Coventry or Guadalajara, we may not have the time or budget to do it. If you're coming to MS Life, get involved by letting us know what you've been up to and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. Most importantly, we want you to be ready to join in, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google Plus and YouTube. See you at the weekend. and sharing your thoughts and photos by using the hashtag MSLife2014. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs>
and I'll maybe go there. Thank you. I'm going to ask him how he feels about MS Live. Craig, are you excited about MS Live? Yeah, he is. So, um, yeah, moving on. Welcome to MS Live 2014. I'm with Shana Pizarro, um, who is going to be doing a talk, Escaping Labels. Um, hello, Shana. Hello. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the talk and what you're going to be talking to people about? Well, I'm going to be talking about a postcard that I entered into a project called Postcards from the Edges. And the brief was, um, what would you want to say to the world about being disabled? put it on a postcard and um, I, I sort of laughed and, and there was a picture of me smoking in a back alley and I wrote I, I drink, I smoke, I swear I f um, on it, sorry and um, sent it off and it got a lot of press attention and, and uh, it's been you know travelling around the country in an exhibition and ended up in Parliament um, fortunately I know a lot of politicians quite well um, and uh, just said oh, it's what you'd expect from me and, and they laughed so, um, yeah, so I'm talking about that, and I'm talking about why I did that postcard and actually what's behind it in terms of dealing with a diagnosis with MS, coming to terms with being disabled and, you know, the way that MS affects, you know, my life and the way that I've kind of overcome that to make sure that I still get to be me. Now, the talk you're doing is escaping labels. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about what labels you're... That you're thinking of escaping? Um, well, I talk a bit about how disabled people are represented in the media, because I think that, that, that very much there's sort of three categories that, that the media present disabled people in, and one is uh, Paralympian super gods, um, the, the second is liars and scroungers and benefit cheats, and the third is sort of tragic cases that, that need to be pitted. And I don't think I'm any of them, um, and and I actually I don't think most disabled people are any of those, and so yeah, I want to talk about a bit about that. Um, also in the talk, um, it's talking about low self confidence. Um, could you 
Could you give some tips about low self-confidence and how to overcome that? Um, yeah, I was in a, um, a marriage to someone who couldn't cope at all with the diagnosis of MS. And he um, very vocally would tell me that I was disgusting because I was disabled and that he couldn't find me sexually attractive knowing that I had to catheterize. Um, you know, he was really very abusive. And in fact, my divorce got put through as um, a priority case on the grounds of, of abuse. I knew that I couldn't handle that myself and, you know, I, I couldn't see how I could ever, ever sort of regain my self-esteem and my self-confidence without getting professional help. And so I went off to a counsellor and I found the counsellor that was right for me and I spent six months um, with him and at the start of it I said, I want, to, I want to believe that I'm still me and that I am sexy and that I can, you know, still be found attractive and and through seeking that professional help that was the thing that really really changed things for me so I think that would be my my real advice to people is seek out and accept the help that you're offered thank you Mike and I think everyone could agree that Shana's looking very sexy today your eyes. Closed. Keep them closed. It's just you and me. There's something following us. No, no, no. Don't look. It's watching us. How do you do that? You see things that aren't there. What, you don't believe in magic? I think I'm a little old for magic. It's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Breakfast? Yeah. It's cosy. I shouldn't have brought you here. Why not? Because we're still at the stage where we're trying to impress each other. All oh, right. And, um, I'm messy. No. Well, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Thought we were trying to impress each other. Fine. Next stage is where we tell each other everything that's wrong with us. You were just a bit early. Well, I don't think that's very fair. Why? Because I don't think there's anything wrong with you.
questions before we go through for the scan. Mm -hmm. Have you had any heart surgery before? No. Pacemaker in your heart? <laughs> any jewellery? Have you got a watch on or a I've chain? Got, I've got a ring. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Continuity on Dr. Siegel. I'm the uh, consultant neurologist here at the hospital dealing with this case. And we found the diagnosis uh, definitely inconclusive. The only piece of the task the nervous signal is a task less effective with the body, resulting in some of the disturbances you've been experiencing. There are clear areas of demyelination in your brain and spinal cord. Sometimes. You, you something? No, other side. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, um... Yeah, I, I wanted to say I don't think we should get too involved. I'm not looking for a relationship. I've I've got a lot on my plate at the moment, and I'm. But you like me. I'm just not feeling it. I mean, you're you're lovely. Uh, I'm just not feeling Stop it. Stop saying that. Fine. Fine. There are some things in life which aren't magic, Karen. Knives and forks down the end. Cheers, off. Next. Fears, can I have five minutes, please? Yeah, sure, go I have multiple sclerosis. For the last couple of months, I've had blurred vision. I get these pins and needles in my hands. And sometimes my legs go wobbly. Now, I don't know what's coming next, even the doctors don't. I might suddenly get worse, or maybe I'll just disappear. 
a bit every day. Oh, I might be okay and nothing much will happen, but I'll always be scared that it will. For you and me, it is magic, but this... Well, this is the opposite. And it is really good to see you. Will I get wobbly legs? When I know I'm gonna see you. And I get pins and needles in my hand. Because you sleep on it, but... I really don't mind. And I have no idea what's coming next, either. But... I'm in. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Mitchell, the Chief Executive of the MS Society. And uh, thank you so much for staying on for the last session of the day. Um, as they say, you often uh, save the best to last. And I'm hoping this afternoon's session really will be very lively. And I've been promised entertaining with a slightly new format that we're proposing. Um, you will know yourself that We've seen treatment options rapidly growing for people with relapsing and remitting uh, MS over recent years. And in the recent past, we have three new drugs licensed, giving more treatment options than ever before. So absolutely delighted to Im invite two very prestigious speakers uh, to talk to you in this session. Um, I'm particularly thankful to Dr. Jeremy Chatterway, who has stepped in for Alistair Coles at very short notice. Uh, unfortunately, he can't be with us, but we're absolutely delighted to have Jeremy again, and, and also uh, particularly delighted to have Professor Gavin Giovanni, Giovanni uh, whose current research is focused on the Epstein-Barr virus and the possible causes with MS. Um, also, we have Mary Burke, who has MS herself, and she's going to talk to us about some of her experiences, and Nick Reike, who's the Director of Research at the MS Society. Today's subject um, is very, very dear to our hearts and fits very nicely with the campaign that we're about to launch to mark the beginning of MS Week on Monday called Treat Me Right. And at the heart of this campaign is really about getting excellent access to those treatments that are available, but that we know we as a country, we across the whole of the UK, have a poor record on access to treatments, one of the lowest rates in Europe, and that the variations that are there throughout the UK are really quite unacceptable. But before we talk about that, perhaps in, 
in questions. And if you do have further interest in the campaign, we're having a workshop on it tomorrow afternoon at two. I'd be very keen to hand over to our speakers. And uh, Gavin, I think you're going to start. And my understanding is Jeremy is going to join you as a devil's advocate or potentially a Jeremy Paxman-like figure. So let's see how this goes for us. Yeah, we'll ask the difficult questions. Okay. So I was asked to give you a, uh, an update <clears throat> on disease-modifying treatments, and I was going to follow Alistair Coles from Cambridge. He was going to talk to you about the development and the history of alemtuzumab, Lemtrada, that's been given a European license for treating relapsing-remitting MS in adults. Uh, and it's also been given a green light by NICE, so hopefully NHS England will give us a green light as well and we'll be able to start using this drug in the UK. But he's been involved in it for a long period of time and they made a wonderful little YouTube video on the history of map, which is called Campath 1H, that's worth watching. So just to let you know that the <coughs> disease, DMT stands for Disease Modifying Therapy or Treatment and the pipeline is very rich. And this is an example of all the compounds that are available or in pipeline in, the, in development. And I'm, I haven't got time to go through each into one, one of these. And I'm not going to focus this talk really on individual drugs. What I'd like to talk about is treatment philosophies and the change in the way we are using these drugs. So obviously the ideal disease-modifying therapy, this, this, this identifies it. We need something that the maximum reduction of MS disease activity, no problems with safety, easily tolerated and used, and has a, main, uh, a minor impact in everyday life and no issues on pregnancy or fertility, maintains the quality of life for people with the disease, keeps you independent and keeps you at work, uh, and works in the long term. That's the therapeutic ideal. Unfortunately, nothing works like that. Uh, and I like using the analogy of the horse race because it's horses for courses. Every person with the disease is different and has different characteristics, and therefore, a different drug would suit them, depending on what stage of the disease and what their profile is. So that's the important message, it's personalizing the treatment choices. And there's always the benefit-risk balance. <clears throat> we have to get the benefit-risk balance right. In other words, the benefits have to outweigh the risks of the treatment. And for that to occur, we have to know about the disease and the individual patient. So the treatment strategy has evolved, and maybe Jeremy disagree with me, but um, most people now in the field have accepted or adopted the early treatment paradigm. We should try and treat MS as soon as possible in the course of the disease to have the biggest impact long term. If we treat the disease too late, too much damage is accumulated and we're less likely to have a long term impact. So the, the concept we've adopted from the stroke literature uh, is that time is brain. And if you have active MS, you're better off being on a treatment so we can get the disease under control than waiting too long. Do you disagree? Show another slide. <laughs> <laughs> right. So one of the, ex the best examples, because it's the hardest outcome, is the very, very first trial of interferon beta. And this was done in the 80s. And this was positive and led to the first licensed drug for MS. And in this trial, there were people given interferon and people given placebo. And the people on placebo were given the drug about three and a half years after the start of the trial. So they had a delay in access to treatment by three years. And they were followed up uh, at 21 years. And the outcome they looked for was being alive, mortality, death, which is a very hard outcome. And the ascertainment was extremely high. It was almost 100%, 98.4%. And the death certificates were analyzed. And three quarters of the people in this, these trials who had died had died of MS-related complications. And the results were pretty stunning <clears throat> in the sense that if you'd gone on to interferon, doesn't matter how you split the data, okay, three years earlier, you had a 50% chance, a greater chance of being alive at 21 years. And we know that mortality, death from MS, is linked to all the other outcome measures. So this is just an example of uh, why early treatment is important. Okay, so, so Gavin, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come in here and I want you to tell me the problems with these long-term registry trials, because in 21 years all sorts of things can happen. And is it true or not true that the beta interferons really have an effect on disability when you look at registry data? The, the, I think there's, this particular study was overcome by the highest attainment. So the, there's only one single site that wasn't prepared to put forward 
their patients for this long-term follow-up, and yeah. those four patients were from one site. Every other site tracked down all of the participants. This was essentially 100% ascertainment. And they were looking at only one variable. Were the, were the patients in the trial, study subjects alive or dead? And that's a hard outcome. There's no, uh, there's no soft outcome. No, I agree with you on that. What about disability? So they did an analysis at 16 years, and they, and they did show that um, those people who were exposed to interferon the most over that 16-year period had a much 40% lower chance of reaching disability outcomes. But there are general problems in registry yes. data, aren't there? There are. In terms of lots of things happening through This that. is why I quote the study, though, because it's much harder. Okay. So the, the, the message is, if this would interfere, now interferon is a, what I would call a moderately effective therapy. So if interferon can have such a major impact at 21 years, what would, be, what would the impact of the more effective therapies have? And I think that's the question that we have to wait to see. What it, I'd be I wouldn't be surprised if it's a lot more. <clears throat> so then this is the consequences of an increasing disability. This is why we need to treat this disease earlier. And this is a pan-European study looking at unemployment rates in people with the disease. And you can see all the European countries involved. And the figure I want you to get in your head is that half of 50% of, of people with this disease are unemployed when they have a disability score. This is our disability score of three. And if you have a disability score of three, you wouldn't be overtly disabled. You'd be walking and functioning normally. So this disease is having an impact on employment in Europe uh, at a very low level of physical disability. And we think what's driving that are problems with cognition and fatigue and mood. And that occurs about 10 years after the onset of this disease. So what we really need to do is to treat people with this disease long before they become physically disabled. In other words, when they are well and healthy to prevent this from happening. So Gavin, can you just talk through the figures, what 4, 5, 6, 6.5 mean? So as soon as you go above 3.5, it starts affecting your ability to walk. For example, just over 4, you can't, you, you just manage it about 500 meters. Once you get to 6, you're needing a walking stick, 6.5, you're needing two sticks, a seven is a wheelchair. So as you move up from 3.5 three, uh, 3 and above, you're beginning to notice an impact on walking. And this is why the scale is not a very good scale. It's driven by a walking, imp a walking dis uh, impairment rather than the other impairments. So this particular, I want you to look at the curve on the right. Um, this actually just looks at quality of life going from zero to one, one being perfect quality of life, zero being death. And you can see as the disability scores go up, quality of life plummets. So the, the, and this is quality of life across European countries. So the, the, obviously if we can stop people becoming disabled, we'll improve quality of life. And I think that's the message that's coming out of all of our trials of disease modifying treatments is those drugs that stop people becoming disabled improve or protect their quality of life. So it's another reason for us to treat, prevent disability. So these are the, the current treatment strategies uh, that we have. We can either start people off on what I call a lower tier, first line therapy. These tend to be moderately effective and we watch what happens. And if they fail those treatments, in other words, have relapses uh, or disease progression, we can move them up to the more efficacious uh, uh, drugs. However, with the licensing now of alemtuzumab, uh, we have the option of using one of the most potent drugs first line. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of us begin to use that drug first line. In other words, use the best, best drug first. In other words, invert the pyramid and start with the best drug first. So G Gavin, can you just talk about the different drugs or maybe you're going to? I will talk about the different okay. drugs, yeah. But also to make the point as we go to more uh, aggressive drugs, there are more side effects, and that is the other side of the coin, isn't it? Yes, but the thing about um, the first tier, if you spend too, too much down on the first tier, so let's, go in, so let's say let's put you on an interferon, and you're on there for a year or two before you fail it, and then you go on to, say, capaxone, and then on to teriflunamide. You spend many, many years on that, what we call cycling, and uh, acquiring damage, and then by the time you get to the, the more effective therapies, it's, it's too late, or we've lost a lot of time. So that's a, that's a debate and a, a decision-making. I'm going to being have... devil's advocate here, as yep. you know. So, um... My personal opinion is we should only spend, uh, you should only have one shot on the lower tier. And if you're not um, responding to the lower tier, you move up quickly to the upper tiers, which are more effective. That's my personal opinion. 
So these are the, that's exactly this philosophy. You can either hit hard and early and try and flatline, in other words, get rid of all the activity with the most effective drugs, or you can go the safe and smooth and wait for people to fail them before moving across, knowing that uh, waiting to fail a therapy, you may be acquiring uh, damage. And unfortunately, the damage that occurs from MS activity is probably not reversible. And the reason why you don't see it, because the brain can adapt to damage, but it's, uh, it's there. I mean, one of the, quest one of the cri uh, <clears throat> criticisms of this is that we can't guarantee you that if we do hit you hard and early with an effective therapy that you're going to remain on a flat line, because some people think that the inflammatory component of this disease that causes people to have attacks is not what causes this disease, it's actually a neurodegenerative illness, and people will come back many years later with secondary progressive MS. We don't know what the answer to that question is yet, uh, but unless we follow people up long term, we won't answer that question. But I could put the counterpoint, you can't, can you individualize treatment? How can you pull away people with very benign disease that you're now gonna treat with alumtuzumab and expose them to those side effects? Because if we knew how a person was individually going to be over time... Yeah. I mean, you can profile people at baseline and say, well, you actually have a, a, most of the good prognostic factors, but those aren't 100% guarantee uh, that you're going to do well. That's the thing about this disease. It's very difficult to be able to give individual prognoses at baseline or early in the disease that necessarily is going to hold out for the rest of the disease. If we could do that, it would make things a lot easier for us, but we can't. So you, say, you would say treat everyone aggressively? No, no, I'd say let everybody have the option of, of having that, uh, that strategy applied. And if they don't like the risks, they don't have to. But then we've got at least a backup strategy by monitoring them. If they then fail, we can move them up quickly. We'll offer them the option. Okay. It's all about choice. So to make a decision about the more risky, aggressive therapies, you, know, you have to know how bad multiple sclerosis is. Uh, at a, um, and I developed a little infographic. I'm not going to go through this, but if you leave MS untreated it's, uh, and given it, given it enough time, it causes problems in the majority of people with the disease. And that's the reality of untreated MS. <clears throat> so at 15 years, about a third of people are defined as having benign MS, which has been fully functional and, uh, at 15 years after, but that drops to about 15% at 25 years, 5% at 30 years, and it keeps dropping as you get older. So, you know, uh, true benign MS given sufficient time is very rare. <clears throat> it's uncommon. I put the layer there, the onions, that's an onion, is that um, some people find the, the facts very upsetting. Uh, so it's to represent, if you peel the layers off, it, it can be, this data can be very upsetting for individuals. So. I wouldn't recommend reading this if you don't want to know the truth. If you want to know the truth, you should read these figures. And um, that little, I'll, put, I'll put up this presentation on our blog if you want to download it in the, the blog addresses down there. So monitoring is important. <clears throat> so this is an example of why we need to monitor. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you if you monitor. <laughs> so this is actually the extension study of another one of the interferons. This is the intramuscular interferon called Avonex. And the patients were in the trial for two years and they were then followed up at 15 years uh, later. And what became very, very clear, and I want you to look at the upper box, is those that were on Avonex and continued to have relapses, and more importantly, MRI activity, in other words, lesions that were coming and going on their brain, were much, much more likely to do badly at 15 years. In other words, end up in the worst proportion of the patients. So what, um, uh, what's interesting is those that are on the dummy, this wasn't predictive. So if you're on a treatment and you continue to have relapses or MRI activity, okay, it predicts a very poor outcome. Basically, it tells you you're not responding to the drug. So you're not just presenting one particular study that no. supports your viewpoint. Do all the studies go this way? Yes. So all those studies that are emerging now uh, go this way. But all the previous beta interferon capaxone studies? Yes. <clears throat> and there's good data coming out of... Uh, uh, some of the more detailed registers supporting this as well. So this is why we call MS the iceberg. So what you see clinically in terms of attacks or relapses, and maybe even getting worse, is just the top of the iceberg. So of every attack, there's a 10 or more lesions that come and go on our MRI scans. And if you look under the microscope, for example, in the gray matter and other areas of the brain that our MRI scans aren't very good at picking up, there's also a, about 50% more lesions there. 
So it just depends how we interrogate this disease. We find layers of activity, which is why we've got to remember that if we just monitor clinically, we're missing a lot of this disease. So what's emerged now um, amongst us is this thing called treat the target. We want to suppress all measurable disease activity. We don't want any disease, and we call that no evident disease activity. That's called NEDA. And we've adopted, adopted this terminology from the cancer oncology doctors. And we use the treat the target has come from the rheumatologists. Because what the rheumatologists did 15 years ago, we're trying to do the same in multiple sclerosis right now. So the rheumatologists treat rheumatoid arthritis. And they realized that any inflammation was bad for joints. So it's best to suppress all inflammation to protect the joint. And that's happened. Uh, I always tell this story. Um, one of my daughter's <coughs> friend's father is an orthopedic surgeon. He lives close. He's a bit older than me. Um, and he said, Gavin, when I started as a consultant orthopedic surgeon, half of my surgical lists were replacing joints in rheumatoid arthritis patients. He said, now, if I do one joint a month in a rheumat rheumatoid arthritis patient, is a lot. So the rheumatologists who adopted this uh, uh, treat the target years ago have seen a dramatic drop off in end organ damage, you know, loss of joint. And I'm hoping we, if we do the same, we will see a massive improvement in the outcomes of people with the disease. But you said hope there. You don't know for sure <clears throat> whether this is appropriate. We have to do a trial. But do you think a trial would get funded? Or because these drugs are now on patent, that it's highly unlikely to have a true comparison of aggressive versus non-aggressive treatment? Well, we have to get NICE to change, and I'll answer this question by criticizing some of the handcuffs that NICE have given us. So NICE have handcuffed us clinicians because we're not really allowed to monitor this disease using MRI scans. We have to make decisions on clinical grounds. And I call this the donut. Um, so we allow to treat people that have active relapsing MS. So this is either two attacks in a two-year period. And we've recently been given permission to treat people with their first attack, CIS, if they're in the high-risk group, if they have a scan that has lots of lesions. But otherwise, if you don't fulfill those criteria, we're not, re those criteria, we're not really allowed to start you on treatment. So that's the first, hand first handcuff. <clears throat> then we're not allowed to monitor you with MRI scans because we're not allowed to escalate treatment on MRI scans. We have to wait for you to have relapses. And sometimes we have to wait for you to have two severe relapses in a 12-month period. And we know that one relapse is sufficient to predict a poor outcome. And we know that MRI activity in that period of time predicts a poor outcome. So we have problems escalating. So we can only go from interferon or glutarium acetate to natalizumab, which is one of the higher efficacy drugs if you have highly active disease. And similarly, you can only get onto fingolimod, a second-line drug, if you fail one of the first-line therapies with clinical relapses. So we have these, this group of people who are not having overt relapses, but are having activity in their brain coming and going. We just have to look at them and say, we can't change your therapy. And I call that smoldering MS, because it's obviously active, but not active enough to cause clinical attacks. So, But I'm going to pause you there and say, the trials for these, these agents were all done on relapses, were all done, done on clinical relapses as their primary endpoint. Isn't that how we should be carrying out our clinical practice? I know there were MRI secondary outcomes, yeah. <clears throat> but the primary outcomes in the phase three trials were done on clinical relapse measurement, and that's what we had to do in our phase four or day-to-day -day practice. Yes, but it's, it's treating the iceberg, so we just treat, we're just waiting for the relapse to present. So inflammation on brain scans, the difference between a lesion that occurs on a scan that doesn't cause a relapse and what it causes a relapse is where it occurs in the brain. So if the lesion occurs in an ineloquent site, it won't cause necessarily symptoms, but it's still causing damage to nerve fibers, and that'll accumulate over time. So the data is overwhelming that MRI lesions are equivalent to uh, relapses. So the current UK practice is, and I've mentioned this to many people before, is we take you and we put you on a disease-modifying therapy, and we have to wait two, maybe three or four years to see who are responders and non-responders. Responder means all activity has gone away. Suboptimal responders means you're not clinically active, but your MRI is active. And non-responders means you continue to have relapses. And we don't have an issue with non-responders because we could switch you to other therapies. It's the uh, suboptimal responders that I'm worried about the most. And the, the way we monitor you um, is clinically only. Some of us use um, 
biological blood monitoring as well for, for neutralizing antibodies. But um, we need to do more MRI monitoring. And the sad news is that in this country, very few neurologists are monitoring their patients with MS and with MRI. And this is a survey we did quite recently. And we got 50 responses from MS experts in this country. And you can see there only 8% routinely monitor with MRI and 26% uh, yes frequently. So roughly a third of neurologists are using MRI to monitor the disease. Two thirds are not. That's why I'm going to ask you, do you monitor with MRI? Um, I don't for first line, but I do if I'm making treatment decisions <clears throat> and treatment changes, and I do for second and third line. So um, we put forward, we want to do a trial to test whether people with MS do better by monitoring them and switching quickly, or if we just run them according to the current guidelines. And we want to, we call the study the NEDA trial. Don't worry about the design of the study. This is what we want to do in the UK to prove to NICE that we should be more active in monitoring. When I presented this in Australia about a month ago, they thought this was completely unethical because they don't have any restrictions about how they use their drugs in Australia. And they said, how can you ethically allow a patient to have continued activity without switching their therapy? So they thought this was unethical. And this is the issue we're going to have to face, is that in some parts of the world, this would be completely unethical, but we are forced to maybe produce evidence in this country to try and help our patients. So this is the, the way it should happen in a, in a world where we don't have restrictions. Is we should define your individual risk. We should allow you to make a, a choice. We should then uh, uh, re-baseline you. For MRI monitoring, we really have to do a second scan after you start the drug, because any activity that occurs in the first few weeks or months before the drug starts working will be, will be counted as activity or failure. But we, so we have to re-baseline with a new scan and then we have to scan you every, say, six or 12 months to see if you're, if you're responding. And if you, if you are responding, we leave you on the drug. If you're non-responding, we will obviously change the therapy by moving to a more effective therapy to try and get this disease under control. So this is what we call treat the target. It's an active process. Gavin, I want you to talk a bit about side effects because the higher you go up, the more the side effects. So alemtuzumab, a third of people have thyroid problems, yep. the PML risk with nazilumab. Isn't that the main counter argument? We're treating everyone with early aggressive disease, with early aggressive treatment. Well, no, because some people who, who don't want to have those risks will become the, those responders and end up in the responder category of those safer drugs. But who makes these decisions? I know it's a, a partnership, but you have to give the person with MS the, all the information. Which is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. We're trying to educate or encourage people to get involved with the knowledge around these drugs. And you don't have the disease. I don't have the disease. So the person with the disease should be make, taking the decision about the risks. Mm -hmm. And to make that decision, you have to know how bad MS is untreated. And you have to know what happens with smoldering MS as well. And you have to know the benefits of the more effective therapies and the side effects. But we can de-risk the side effects in terms of monitoring and proactively treating those side effects, okay. those adverse events. So I think that the fact that they got a license by the European Medicine Agency and NICE mm -hmm. suggests that the benefits outweigh the risks. Okay. So it's not me telling you mm -hmm. this, it's NICE. For NICE to say this is remarkable, actually, because they are a real data-hungry uh, organization and they wouldn't allow a drug through that wasn't pro had a favorable benefit risk profile and wasn't cost-effective. <clears throat> So this is my DMT summary. I don't really want to talk about individual drugs. So this is kind of where I put these drugs about five years ago before the, the latest crop of phase three trials. And things have changed. I put interferon beta in the middle because that's our reference drug, the very first one. So the vertical axis is risks, red meaning bad, green meaning positive, efficacy, uh, red not, not as effective, uh, the plus be more effective. And things have changed. So natalizumab has become more safe, mainly because we can now test for the virus. So you can see there's two clusters. If you have JC virus, a virus that causes that infection on the drug, PML, that's a very dangerous drug. But if you're negative, it falls into that uh, highly efficacious, safe uh, bracket. Does that suit you? Yeah, although I'd actually say it's, you say it's very dangerous with JC virus positive. The risk, again, could, is only about 1% after two years of having, of obtaining PML, 99% of being yeah. well on it. So I would actually support that you be quite aggressive with Tysabri. 
because it is an effective drug. And to be honest with you, there are some people who do so well on the drug that even when they are JC virus positive and been on the drug three or four years, they don't want to come off the drug because their disease was so bad prior to going on the drug that they would rather take the risk of getting this life-threatening infection than take the risk of having their MS back. So this is all relative to the individual. This yeah. is the important message to the individual. Yeah. The, the other drug that's become, uh, has moved up is this drug called BG12 or dimethyl fumarate. Um, it's in orange because although it's been given a license in Europe, we have yet to get it, it green-lighted by NICE uh, or in NHS England. So it's sitting there waiting to come through, and hopefully we'll get it as a first-line license later on this year. Liquinamide has become less effective. It reduces attacks by about 20 to 25 uh, percent. The, the drug's there because it's also got an important effect on the degenerative component of the disease, and the companies now, Tiva, are doing more trials. Teriflunamide moved down because it's kind of got the similar efficacy to interferon beta, it's about the effectiveness as interferon, but it's got a reasonably well-defined safety profile. There has some tolerance issues with it. Some people get nausea and a bit of diarrhea, but overall it's pretty well tolerated. Its big issue is in pregnancy, you can't fall pregnant on the drug. Uh, I put there CD20, there's a group of drugs that target the B cell. This is called the anti-CD20s, and that's looking like in the phase two results to be a very effective drug, and its safety profile is looking very favorable. Fingolim has got a lot safer. Um, I say a lot safer because it's got a legacy of the poor safety of the high doses. So when this drug was developed, it was tested at five milligrams, then 1.25, and now 0.5. When we look at the safety of the 0.5, it's a lot, more, a lot safer than the, the previous ones. And that's another drug that's looking, uh, I mean, it's been used a lot in countries where it's got a first-line license. In the UK, we have to use it as a second-line drug. You have to fail the injectables or the platform therapies first. The Clusimab is another drug in late-stage development. This is given under the skin once a month, the injection under the skin. It's looking very promising in terms of its efficacy. There was a safety signal in the first study, but it looks like once you're over the first 12 months of that drug, it's pretty safe. And Alamtuzumab has come right down. It's probably our most effective drug available. Um, I'll, I'll still leave it in the upper one because there is some serious adverse events with this drug. But with the monitoring and early treatment, we should be able to deal with those side effects. The biggest one being the autoimmune diseases that develop about 12 to 18 months after you've had your last course of this drug, mainly thyroid, and also affects, uh, um, can affect platelets. And, and renal function. So we have to monitor people uh, monthly with blood and urine tests on this drug. Are we going to talk about um, pregnancy and uh, how these drugs stack up, say, alituzumab uh, versus... Yeah, I'll, I'll come to the pregnancy question, yeah. but it's a difficult one. Okay. Because it's not really evidence-based. <clears throat> so looking at your lineup there, on the one hand, one can start in the middle and work our way rightwards. Yeah, like this, yeah. Yep. Or on the other hand, you can start on the right with alemtuzumab, and then if that didn't work, or you say that it would work, then one would say alemtuzumab, you'd work your way downwards from alemtuzumab well, if there are unacceptable side effects. So alemtuzumab is an induction therapy. It's given as a course of infusions in year one and then a second course in year two. And the majority of people only need those two courses, and they get followed up for four, five, six, seven years, or even longer. And that's it. You don't need any more treatment. About a third of patients will need a, sec a third course. Mm -hmm. About 10% uh, have required a fourth course. And there's been about two, only two patients in Cambridge that needed five courses. But outside, so, so what it means is that if you do break through on an induction therapy, you just need to be retreated. It's a bit different to the other therapies where you know, breakthrough means you're not responding. With alemtuzumab means you, you need to be retreated. Okay. So do we need anything else apart from alemtuzumab these days? We do because it's obviously got a safety issue. So we either have to get rid of those autoimmune diseases, yeah. and there is a trial going on right now in Cambridge to try and understand why we get those autoimmune complications. If we can prevent them, then it'll be a fantastically safe drug. Or we need a drug like the anti-CD20s that have the same efficacy, the same effectiveness, without the safety profile. So are we at the end of the beta interferon capaxone age? No, because I think people who are on the drugs doing very well and responding should stay on those drugs and responding. I think when it comes to choice, though, who's going to choose an injection therapy when they can have a tablet? That's the question. 
very few people will do that. So I think in terms of new uh, prescriptions, I think it's unlikely that given choice, mm. people will be choosing in injections. I'm not sure if, if any of your patients want injections over orals. So that's going to be a big change. The orals are going to really change what people choose first line. So what about pregnancy? So these are all the questions that people ask me about pregnancy, but the ones I've highlighted are the ones in, in relation to DMT. How long before I fall pregnant must I stop my DMT? So in the package inserts, the companies tell you to stop them three to six months before, which is kind of uh, based on other drugs. There's no real evidence. So I, with interferon and capaxone, I ignore that advice. They can start falling pregnant straight away. If I fall pregnant on DMT, will this affect the baby? And it depends on which drug you're on. Some of the drugs have been shown to be teratogenic, and you really shouldn't fall pregnant on them. Others, the evidence isn't really there. And some of the therapies now, people are uh, allowing people to fall pregnant on them. So Capaxone, for example, although the company can't tell you, right, there's a lot of pregnancies that have happened on the drug, and there's no background risk to the baby. So a large number of neurologists across the world are allowing people to fall pregnant on so which drugs can a woman not fall pregnant? All of them, really. <laughs> but um, of the, of the, the, one that's, the one that's been adopted most is Capaxone. Some okay. people are, are saying, you should, if you want to have a baby, you should be on Capaxone so you can fall pregnant on it. And the other way around, I mean, the, the drugs where it's a definite no-no not to become pregnant on, so teriflunamide. Teriflunamide is the one that's been shown to be teratogenic. Uh, uh, Alentuzumab, what about that? Uh, no, well, alentuzumab is actually a very good drug because it's an induction therapy, so you have these two courses, and you don't need it again, it's out your body. So it's the ideal drug for a woman who wants to have children in the future, get on top of her MS activity, and then not need any therapy. Um, so the ones that are the worried, the ones that have been shown to be teratogenic. Yeah, okay. I put this in because I want to avoid the question. <laughs> But I thought I might ask you the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's not have any avoidance behavior. So vitamin D, by the way, there is no real evidence that it's disease modifying. In other words, if you take uh, uh, vitamin D, it's going to modify the disease course. And we did a meta-analysis of all the published studies. No difference whether you took vitamin D or not. Okay. But if we look at that in more detail, you might say that s some trials oh, are favoring it and some are not, yep. but the overall average is neutral at the yes. moment. And you say the jury's out? Yes, because these trials are too small. The okay. doses are not optimized. So there are big studies going on. There are a whole cluster of studies going on right now to answer this question. So if you're taking vitamin D, you know, shouldn't be taking vitamin D because it's going to modify your course. We don't know that answer. What you should be taking it is for this reason. Uh, people with multiple sclerosis are much more likely to have thin bones. Uh, osteopenia, we call it, or osteoporosis. Numerous reasons for this, less, out, less outdoor activity, less mobility, um, etc. And uh, to maintain bone health, you should really have normal vitamin D levels. So uh, that's what our policy is to recommend vitamin D supplementation really for bone health. And what sort of doses are you using? I use the, uh, vitam the vitamin D council recommendation, which is 5,000 units a day. So 5,000 units per day of vitamin D. Are there any dangers with vitamin D? At 5,000, no. <clears throat> so the European Food Safety Agency have said that um, uh, their, their recommendation is 4,000 units a day, but they said up to about 11,000 units a day is safe. Thank you. you shouldn't take it with calcium, though. There's the danger if you take it with calcium. So no calcium. So the future, though, I want to talk to you about the future. The future is actually thinking like the rheumatologists. Can we, can we stop joint replacements? So can we stop people needing uh, wheelchairs and all that? So we've got to start thinking about the brain like a joint. Can we prevent end organ damage? And this is a slide from Klaus Schmierer, just showing you the difference between a person with MS's brain when they die compared to control. You can see it's very shrunken, huh? lots of brain volume loss. Uh, and this is a picture I always show. These are two uh, people with relapsing MS that were in a clinical trial while I was doing my PhD at Queen Square. And you can see the, 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 the uh, brain volume loss that can concur. This is over 18 months between the top images and the bottom images over 18 months. This is how much brain people with multiple sclerosis lose. And this occurs across the disease. So the CIS refers to clinically isolated syndrome, first attack, RR, secondary progressive, primary progressive. And now we can add on the NIC, the group before CIS, those that have asymptomatic disease, those people who've never had an attack, and MS has been picked up because they've had a brain scan for another reason, for headache, for example. And everybody in those groups loses brain volume at about the same rate. 
So this process is occurring very early on in the disease. And a recent study, which I think is, very, is going to be very influential, this, this is a study from uh, a statistician in Italy, Maria Pia Simoni. She's taken all the trials done in MS where they've measured brain volume loss. Okay, and they've correlated it with the progression in terms of their disability. And what they found was that the brain volume loss, the middle one, atrophy, correlates very well with disability progression, as well as with the new lesions, those little focal lesions that come on the scan as well. And when you combine them together, they're very predictive, those two aspects of disability progression. So what this is telling us, we need drugs that not, not only switch off inflammation, stop relapses and these MRI lesions coming and going, but we also need drugs that stop the shrinkage of the brain stop the shrinkage of the brain. And we've got those drugs. So go, go back to that, Gavin. So this is very interesting, isn't it? Because it's saying there are clearly two parts of the equation here. There's inflammation, which is the lesions, yeah. and then there's shrinkage, the atrophy. Which is the neurodegenerative components, yeah. And those what do you think comes first? Is it a chicken and egg or we, we don't simultaneous or one after the other? Yeah, so most people would, rec would, would suggest, based on the current evidence, that the inflammation occurs first and then causes the degeneration to occur. Mm. That's the standard autoimmune hypothesis of MS. Inflammation first, then the degeneration. There are some people say the degeneration is there, which stimulates the inflammation. So we haven't sorted that question out. But I put my money on the first camp, the inflammation comes first and the generation second. But what it does tell us, though, is that we need to target both processes. If we want to make the biggest difference to this disease, we need something to switch off inflammation, and we need a drug as, as a neuroprotective drug. So I thought I'd try and model this to give you an idea. So this is what happens to normal people in, the, in, the, in society. So everybody loses brain volume. It's a part of life. And, it's, and I made this linear because it's the easiest way to explain it. And it usually starts at about 35 years of age, and the average person loses between 0.1 and 0.4% of their brain per year. That's the normal range, and that's what happens to you when you get to 80. Somebody with multiple sclerosis starts to lose brain volume earlier, and they lose it at a rate that's much higher than that, probably in the region of about 0.5 to 1% per year. And you can see when you end up at 80, the person with MS has lost about 30% of their brain volume, and a person who's normal about 5% of their brain volume. And now we have drugs that can stop that. So this is results from Fingolimid, just showing you that over a two-year trial, you can see on the right that uh, people on Fingolimid had a 38% reduction in brain volume loss. So they lost about 0.4% per year, which is kind of on the upper range of normal. This is Natalizumab, Tarsabri. I want you to ignore year one data because when you give people who've got MS, a, a potent anti-inflammatory drug, it switches off the inflammation and the brain shrinks because the inflammation goes. So we can't really use the year one data. And that meta-analysis, that study that Maria Piersomani did, she only looked at year two data for atrophy. And you can see in year two that the brain volume loss on natalizumab is 0.24%, which is kind of almost in the normal range, what happens in normal people. So this is a, an example of that. And then the other drug that does this is alemtuzumab, lemtrada. And you can look at year two data. In the first trial, it was 0.26, 0.25%. And in the, in the second trial, 0.22. So these are relapsing remitting patients. These are relapsing remitting patients. Because alemtuzumab didn't work in progressive patients, did it? In that we don't small, know that. That's, but in that small group. No, of, no, uh, that's not true. So what happened was when the drug was given in people with advanced secondary progressive disease, it stopped them having relapses and switched, switched off their MRI activity, but it didn't necessarily slow down, stop them having progression. But if we had a placebo arm there, it may have slowed down the rate. So we can't say it doesn't work in secondary progressive disease because it didn't have a placebo arm. It may, it may work by slowing down, we need a placebo arm. Okay. That's why we have to have placebo control trials. Okay. So what's common, about, what's common with all these three drugs? Golomid, natalizumab, What's common about them is they in the top zone. They're the most efficacious drugs we've got. That's what's common to them. So what I'm, the message I'm trying to get across is if we want to really target these processes, we really need to be on the high efficacy therapies. Yeah, that's the message. Okay. So this is a hypothetical treatment now, using the two together. So if we start a, a drug that's not really that effective, and we start it late, 
we're not going to have a much we're not going to have much difference. And even if we start that drug earlier, we're not going to have much difference in terms of its outcome at uh, um, at 80 years. But if we start a highly effective drug early, you can see it changes the slope, to, uh, the chances of ending up with a protected brain uh, at a, uh, in, in old age greatly. So the message between these two graphs is if you're going to use a highly effective therapy, it's much better in terms of protecting the brain if we use these therapies early. So if I can conclude. <clears throat> so our current first line or platform therapies are only moderately effective. They are safe because we've had them now for about 20 plus years. Associated with troublesome side effects and poor adherence. The escalation therapies are obviously more effective but have potential for more serious adverse events and this is why we have the risk benefit. And we do have strategies for optimizing the risk benefit. Uh, for example, the JC virus testing. Of the emerging therapies, fingolimod is currently a second line therapy and there's some evidence that it promotes remyelination. And there's currently a primary progressive trial that's about to finish. And if that trial is positive, in other words, it modifies primary progressive disease, it's going to have a halo effect. Yeah. It's going to be used, I think, across the spectrum of MS mm. because it's anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective. Teriflunamide is a first-line therapy. And as of this week, just gone past, we're allowed to use it in the UK as a first-line therapy. There's a predictable side effect profile because it's related to a drug that's been around for many years in rheumatoid arthritis. So we know how to use the drug. Uh, I call it a tortoise because the company developed it took a long, long time to do it with this drug. Mm -hmm. Then we got BG12 or DMF. Hopefully we're going to have, I'm almost certain we're going to have it in about three or four months time as a first line. It's got a very interesting mode of action. It may be also neuroprotective and it'll be an ideal drug based on its mode of action to be combined with other therapies in the future. Liquinimod, it's not a, an effective anti-inflammatory, has neuroprotective effects. And it's the dark horse in the sense that it's ultimately going to be the tablet we want to add on to every other drug because it's got a, an effect on your protection. And I can tell you we, we are going to start a primary progressive trial of this drug later on this year. Alimtuzumab can be used first, second, or third line. It's our most potent, but has risks that need to be managed. And then of the other emerging ones, I think Decluzumab and, and anti-CD20 are very interesting. So uh, I'll leave it, leave it there. Thank you very much. I wonder if it would be interesting to have a vote as to who would want to go for a step-by-step -step escalation treatment versus those that would go for early aggressive treatments with, say, alemtuzumab. Would that be reasonable? So who, who, will, who would, would their neurologist go for a step-by-step? -step? So beta interferon, if that didn't work, to fingolimod, and if that didn't work, to tysabri. Can I have hands up? There's about um, eight or nine people, the other way around, the most effective therapy first. Mm. Yeah. So I've been convincing, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Gavin. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you for that very thought-provoking and challenging presentation, um, Gavin. But also, Jeremy, you have to be the politest Jeremy Paxman I've ever I'm very seen. Polite. <laughs> I'm very polite. Um, before taking questions, we're going to briefly just uh, move on to Mary, who um, has MS and has been on the Tysabri trial, I understand. If you want to introduce yourself and say a few words, and, th and then on to you, Nick. Yep. Yep. Um, yes, I was diagnosed with MS um, 20 years ago, uh, relapsing, remitting, and I just happened to be in the right place at the right time in a relapse when my uh, consultant told me that um, they were starting the third phase of this brilliant drug, they thought, would I be interested? Well, yes, I was interested. So I was on, uh, on the third phase of the Tice of Breed trial, not knowing whether I was on it or not. Um, and then it got extended, and then it was withdrawn because of the PML um, scare. And then I got a phone call saying, do you want to go back on? And I was like, yes, I want to go back on. Because in that time, I, I started on Thai Sabri in 2002, and I'm still on it. In that time, I've had two relapses, and I used to get at least one a year, if not two. And um, I am JC negative, but if I was JC positive, I would fight tooth and nail to get it. And I, the, the trial that I was on has just ended in January, and I'm now fortunately on it on the NHS. So, so that's my story. 
Thank you very much. Nick, would you briefly like to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Nick Riker. I'm Director of Policy and Research for the MS Society, and I've spent quite a lot of the last 18 months of my life trying to persuade NICE to say yes to the new treatments, <laughs> mm -hmm. but also not just say yes, but actually say yes in a way that gives you the choice to have the more aggressive treatments early if you want to. And so far, so far they've said yes on both counts. Great, thank you. Well, I'm sure you've got lots of questions, um, so I'm going to open it up to the floor. Perhaps take two or three questions at a time so that we can get as many people into the discussion and the debate as possible. So who would like to kick off? Yeah, we've got... Um, <coughs> yeah, there's a lady here and a, a gentleman here. Hi there. Um, do you think it's going to be easy for the neurologist to take you off an injectable to put you onto the oral meds? Would they do that very quickly? Or would they, if the uh, injectables are working, leave you on that? Let's just respond to that straight away, I think. So you're saying if you're doing fine on the injectables, would you move on to the oral agent? Uh, yeah. So you'd like to move on to an oral agent? I mean, if there's a good reason for moving on, then that, that would be entirely, entirely reasonable, uh, uh, the way I'd see it. Thank you. Uh, Guy there. Hi. Um, the graphs that um, the professor showed at the end, showing combination therapies, I mean, to most people that have MS, they would sort of see that as a no-brainer in terms of why not tackle you know, degeneration and inflammation at the same time. What are the chances that we will actually get combined therapy on the NHS? Um, I think to do combination therapies and prescribe them, we really do have to have evidence that they work as a combination. So the future is combination, but we really need to do the trials first and show that they do work because drugs can interact with each other, they may have a different safety profile, and there's no way NICE or NHS England will allow us to use unproven uh, without an evidence base. So that's what's happening right now. We're about to start a trial in people that are on first line or any disease modifying treatment who are progressing, adding on another drug as a neuroprotective drug to test this exact strategy, so combination therapy. So we're at the stage now where these combination trials are just beginning to get off the ground. Okay, thank you. So those graphs weren't actually evidence? No, no, I was just using them as a hypothetical to show you the um, benefits of early, highly effective therapy rather than waiting. Cool. I was hoping they'd just give you the, if you want to make, if you want to get the best benefit from these treatments, we should use them early and the highly effective ones early. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Lady there. I would like to know if the new oral treatments have got gelatin. I've been, been a vegetarian, you know. Well, do they contain gelatin? I'm not sure I know. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure I know either. Would we can find that? We could. We, I'll find that out for you. Yeah. And uh, the best way, the best way for me to tell you is to, to put it on our blog. If you, um, uh, I will find that out. I mean, with Terry Flunuma, there is probably a way around that in terms of the formulation. I'm sure we. I'm sure the company is now beginning to think about that. I'll be surprised if they've got gelatin. Yeah. Thank you. We've got a question at the back there, and one on the side here. Thank, thank you. And, and then the one in the middle. Great. Back with um, you, you, Ian, at the back. Yep. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Yep. Um, a fairly early comment uh, made by the Professor was that um, probably not reversible damage to MS. <clears throat> um, I guess quite a few people here today would be interested in the possibility at least of reversible damage. Um, we have, I think, uh, sessions tomorrow on remyelination. Mm -hmm. um, are you actually saying that that's a waste of time? Sorry. I can't see where the, the question is it's, it's right at the back there, the gentleman in the blue with oh. the mic. So um, you know, my statement's based on the observation that when you do have uh, relapses or lesions that come and go and people make recoveries, there's usually a lot of uh, plasticity that occurs. The, the brain's very adaptable, and a lot of the recovery that occurs is due to other parts of the brain helping out, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why fatigue is such a big problem, because it requires a lot more um, what I call mental energy to do that. Um, in terms of uh, remyelination, so I think remyelination strategies will work when the actual axon is demyelinated, it's vulnerable to die, and if you can remyelinate the axon um, early, it'll work. 
But there's no point in doing remyelination strategies if you don't get on top of the MS because you'll just remyelinate, it becomes the target for the next attack. So you're gonna, remyelination strategies are gonna have to be as an add-on to drugs that keep the MS the inflammatory activity away. Uh, so I'm, I'm not negative about remyelination. I think, neuro, I think remyelination strategies is, is not work as repair, but as neuroprotection. Okay, we have a question here at the side. Hi. Um, yeah, I've been on Tysabri since summer of 2010 after beta ferron and uh, seems to be going all right. Uh, JCV positive, but ignoring that. Um, I was confused about the comment made about vitamin D because an earlier talk I attended um, and other information suggested that this is kind of critical component um, to the whole process. And uh, vitamin D is something you can take as a supplement or something that occasionally comes out of the sky in this country. Um, and I thought that was a, a, a key factor, and it seems like that's all been disappeared now. I wouldn't say it's correct? disappeared. I'm just saying that... Um, should, do you want to answer the question? I suppose what Gavin showed was the formal trial evidence is neutral. But, of course, there are many components. There's the science behind vitamin D, which is quite compelling. There's the epidemiological evidence. But nonetheless, if you come to do formal trials of reducing relapse rate, or does it have an effect on progression, it's, it's, it's neutral at this moment in time. But there are more trials ongoing, and we will see. But there's also this uh, concept called reverse causation. So what happens is almost all diseases that have got inflammation have low vitamin D levels. So part of the immune system dividing and, and the cells, they consume vitamin D. So it may be the, the inflammation that reduces the vitamin D rather than a low vitamin D causing inflammation. So that's what they call reverse causation. So uh, unfortunately at the moment, uh, most of the biologists think that they, we have to exclude that. That's why we need to do the trials. Thank you. We've got a question. Oh, we've got a number. Right. I'll take, take the gentleman here and then we'll move around the room. I have spotted all of your, your hands. Thank you. Uh, Gavin's presentation was based entirely on clinical data, which um, is, is, is arrived at on the basis of very controlled uh, trials uh, designed in a way to remove any bias. And yet when, the com when those compounds, um, when that data is released, not all of the data is, is released. Uh, uh, not all of the data is released from the pharmaceutical companies because they're not obliged to provide all of the data. Therefore, the data that, which is in the public domain uh, is, may well be biased. So my question is, how much, how much bias do you think there is in terms of the clinical trial data on MS drugs, and, and what effect do you think that, that has on our understanding of the efficacy of these compounds? Just a little question like that. <laughs> Thank you. Who's going to try that one first? On, Gavin. Well, um, I call it the, the, there is the so-called penicillin effect. Uh, you don't need to treat too many people with infections with penicillin to see it works. So now that we've got high efficacy drugs and we have people with highly active disease going on to it, it's quite dramatic. And there may be some people in this audience who've got very active MS who've gone on to these drugs. So I have little doubt that the highly effective therapies are effective. It's, it's, we've seen a transformation in uh, our clinical practice. The number of people with MS coming in for big relapses has plummeted. We see them in our clinics. There's been a real change in the natural history. Um, I do agree that the drug companies um, um, are quite secretive with their data, but there's new legislation in Europe that it for forces them to release their data, and you can access it via uh, Freedom of Information Act. I see Prof Dr. Klaus Schmier is there, and he wants to do a trial of a very exciting drug, which I didn't mention. It's a drug called cladribine tablets. It's also an induction therapy. And he wrote to the European Medicine Agency requesting all the data, and he got the data. Is that correct, Klaus? Yeah. So he got all the data. So things are changing. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you want to add no, anything? No, 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 nothing to no. add. OK, we've got a number of questions. So let's, I think there were, there were hands up here. Sorry, the, yeah, if you go just there, Thirsty, and then we'll come back to you on the left-hand side and move over the room. Yeah. Um, I am secondary progressive, and I do, I'm getting used to the fact that, oh, well, you're secondary progressive, it's only relapsing, remitting, we're really interesting. But the fact is, all these drugs are trying to stop brain atrophy as one of the things. So why can't it go on being prescribed for secondary progressive, even though I realise a lot of damage has already been done? Can't I mean, the original trials were done relapsing, remitting, but these drugs... These drugs are, we'll say, Tysabri is being trialled in second progressive. There's the ASCEND trial, which will 
report um, next year and the Fingolimod informs trial in primary progressive MS. So they've started with the relapsing remitting because that was felt to be their main target, but they've shown to have some anti-atrophy effect. And so therefore some of them are being trialed in progressive situations and we, we will have that data. Okay, there's been a very patient man in a blue jumper there. There you go. It's following on from an earlier question really. It's about if you're on an injectable treatment, like for example, Copaxone, and you're doing well on that, um, does the patient actually have the choice to go on to an oral treatment? Because uh, there was a mention that if there's a good reason, but what would be the reason? Or does the patient have the choice and the right to go on that oral treatment if they want to? Yeah, I think if it's a, if the, first of all, like, whenever, you, you, how do you know your disease is under control? I assume MRI scans as well? Well, no, it's, it, it, well, I've, just, I've been on Cabaxone for about seven years and I'm doing well on it. But if there is an alternative, like to be able to go into an oral treatment, is that actually available for me as a person to have that choice? Yes, I think uh, under the current NHS England guidelines, you would be able to only have, at the moment, choice to go on to teriflunamide or Baggio because it's got a, a green light by both NICE and uh, NHS England. Are you living in Scotland? No, uh, living yep. in England. So if you live in England, then yes. I'm not sure about the Scottish authorities no. yet. And, and we're expecting the same approval process to happen for uh, Tecfidera, dimethyl fumarate. And the, I see no reason why, if you're not tolerating the injections and you're sick and tired of injecting, why you can't ask your neurologist to switch you to an oral. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, just, just over on the left-hand side, Ian, thanks. Okay, great. Hi, back to Lemtrada and NICE guidelines. Um, can you tell me why the FDA have disproved it? What NICE have passed? Well, they haven't really, who, where's the question? Just over here. The well, they haven't, they, I don't know if you're aware, there was an announcement about two weeks ago, the uh, FDA has reversed that decision. They've asked for uh, some more data and the, uh, they're having another advisory board uh, and apparently it's a completely new team of people. So it looks like there's been a lot of politics in the background uh, to that decision. And uh, I, I, I'm very confident now, based on the, uh, what's happened in the rest of the world, that the FDA will give Lemtrada a, uh, a license to be used in relapsing MS in the United States. So the, the, the decision to uh, put the, together an advisory board and make a decision again is not on an appeal. It's the FDA is admitting they've made a mistake. That's the implication of that decision. Thanks, I think there's a question, yeah. I, I've recently been diagnosed with severely relapsing, rapidly evolving MS, and I am now on Tysabri, but notwithstanding, I've had two relapses. So, in my heart of hearts, it's very good to hear all these new drugs are coming out, but how can these drugs be 100% effective when we still don't even know what causes MS? And, and I think just using my nows now, how effective can they be until we actually understand why it happens in the first place? I mean, I think your point is right. If we actually knew the cause of MS, then of course we'd tailor drugs to that. But in an imperfect world, we don't. But amazing progress has been made despite that. But drugs like Tysabri or even Alamtuzumab, 20 or 30% of patients it won't work on or there'll be breakthrough relapses but it's better that a lot better than having nothing that's effective but if we did know the cause and it's not that people haven't been looking for the cause over the last hundred years then we'd be able to make a next stage advance but in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis the true cause of rheumatoid arthritis is not known but there are very effective treatments than the tnf alpha blockers so we can go a long way, but not the full way in terms of treatments. And that's why where we are at the moment is so exciting, particularly with these generation of drugs this year. Uh, Gavin, I don't know if you want to. I'm just saying that sometimes the causes, causation is a complicated science, and we could give a whole talk on, uh, on causation. So the treatments that we use to treat M multiple sclerosis are actually part of the theory of causation. So the fact that people with MS respond to Tysabri means that those cells that come from the periphery are very involved in driving the inflammation because it's a very effective drug at switching off inflammation. So that's telling us that the peripheral immune system is very important. 
And when we take Tysabri away, there's a, there's a big rebound of disease activity. So that's, that's an important bit of information. Actually, the best model for relapse is somebody coming off Tysabri. So if we wanted to study the cause of MS, uh, we should be studying why we get those enormous relapses when you come off Tysabri. And similarly, uh, alemtuzumab, the hypothesis there is if, we, if you've got autoimmune disease and we destroy all those cells and let the immune system reboot itself, those autoimmune cells will go away. And we're seeing a significant proportion of the people going into long-term remission. So Alistair Coles has got a paper that's going to get accepted sometime, saying that quite a large number of people are stable 12 years after their last course of alemtuzumab. Uh, I don't know if that means they're cured or their disease has gone into long-term remission, but that's exciting in my opinion. So that's part of the proof that MS may be an autoimmune disease. So we need to be, um, we need to be I think, positive about things rather than negative. Just a question here on the right, then in the middle, then over to the left-hand side. Um, my question is basically around... Once, once a drug's been approved, and it's kind of around the postcode lottery thing that I've been hearing about quite a lot at the moment, um, I tend to find that whether or not you can have a drug tends to be based on your doctor and whether or not they believe it works, whether or not they want to take the risk of, you know, so Tysabri, you know, someone in their department having PML and things like that. How much, or is there anything that a person with MS can do to push that hand of getting a drug rather than having to give into the postcode lottery if it's been approved by NICE and it's gone through all the rigmarole. Like, what can we do? Well, I think the first thing is information, and you've seen the information, so as to have the true facts at your fingertips and the various brochures from the MS Society. So you've, you've heard how effective these drugs are. That is the first thing, to have then that discussion with your neurologist a bit about weighing up the pros and the cons. And these are NICE-approved drugs. Nick, do you want to come in and say a few words? I do. Um, I, let's just pause for a second. What's the scale of the problem you're talking about? Well, we've talked about the number of those treatment choices that people make and the, that that was characterised as moderate treatment versus aggressive treatment. But actually, the dominant treatment decision that's being made currently is no treatment. Less than half of people with relapsing forms of MS are currently being treated. So that's the dominant treatment choice. And we know from the research that we've done that there's terrific confusion amongst people with MS about what choice they really should be making. A lot of neurologists are passing on a very long-term wait-and-see approach. So it's by the time that, that that shared decision is eventually being made to treat, it is often too late. And that's not the sort of neurologists you have sat to my left, but that is very, very common, and our evidence stacks that up. So what should people do? Well, be more assertive about your treatment choices. We put so much effort into persuading organisations like NICE to make the options available, and that ultimately does rely on, on having really good neurologists who have the time and are given the time by those healthcare commissioners to spend with patients to reach a good decision but also it, it, there's going to be some need for you to look at the information that people like we provide or the MS Trust or even just really quiz your health professionals so that you can get to the root of the problem, the root of the, of the decision that you have to take and be more assertive about your rights because you do have a right to treatment um, and you should be willing to stand up for it and not too easily take no for an answer. And is there anything you'd like to say about the campaign as well? Well, um, to tackle all of those issues, and more probably, um, we're launching a campaign for MS Week this year, which in a sense takes forward quite a lot of what we, we found last year, but with fresh evidence about the, the scale of the confusion which is out there, challenging, in a sense, people with MS to be more assertive and to seek reviews from their neurologists, from their MS nurses, but also challenging the NHS not to leave it to that, to take more responsibility for the, the kind of treatment reviews that people need to have in an ongoing way uh, and to reach much higher quality decisions by investing more time with each patient to go through the ever more complex range of options that people face. Thank you very much. Mary, would you like to add yeah. a point? Um, going on my, my own experience, um, I, I was actually uh, around at the time when the beta interferons were coming out, and my neurologist at the time said to me, I think you're an ideal candidate for these, but I'm not going to prescribe them. 
And I, it was only later I found out, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is still right or not, he, he couldn't prescribe it because he wasn't an MS specialist, because there's different neurologists, uh, you know, with a specific interest, I'm saying now. And uh, so I was advised to go and change my consultant, and I did. <laughs> and I'm very grateful that I did, because since then I, I got on the Tysabri trial, and I know that I would not be as well as I am now if I hadn't have done that. So I would always say, if you're not happy, go and see somebody else, get, get a change. Kevin, yeah. yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the problems we face with adoption, this is all about getting uh, our colleagues to adopt a treatment strategy, is because in the UK, MS is treated at specialist centers. It's only the MS doctors who really have the knowledge and the experience. So um, the interferon experience has clouded the um, perception of the general neurologists about these drugs. They think these drugs aren't that effective. So in countries where the, uh, MS services are provided by uh, private doctors in general, have much higher uptake because the, uh, the general neurologists see the effect benefits of this. So it's also a, a neurology issue. We should be communicating Mm. Uh, to our colleagues who don't treat MS, to please realize that things have really moved on since the interference. Mm. And we've now got a whole host of yeah. very effective therapies, and they need to refer people in as soon as possible, rather than waiting three, four, five years before we get access to these people. When I wouldn't say it's too late, but it would be much, much better if we'd started the treatments early in those people to prevent the damage. Okay, could you just give me a show of hands for any remaining questions? I'm, I'm quite conscious that, uh, Jeremy, just let me check what time do you need to... 10 to, yeah, ten to, ten to six. 10 to 6. Yeah. We, so we, we, we aim to take the final round of questions. Um, if you haven't spoken or asked a question, I'll, I'll come back if we've got time. Uh, if you haven't asked a question, let, one next to Ian there, one here, one here. Got four more questions, so let's... Let's try and be quick, and I'm going to end with a question that we've had in on email. Okay. Are, are all the drugs that you've mentioned this afternoon available to teenagers, i.e. Um, young children? Do the adult children prescribing um, rules apply? Or... Is there restrictions on a younger person? So, so most of these drugs um, were only licensed for adults, but with the interferon and Capaxo now they've got uh, pediatric licenses for children. And the new, the new and more effective drugs, there are clinical trials going on. But if you go to a, a really good pediatric uh, MSologist, I call them, they will uh, apply for funding to treat the children with the more effective therapies. So the, the, the center I'm close, most closely linked to is Great Ormond Street. And the pediatric neurologist there, Cheryl Hemingway, has quite a large number of her patients on um, uh, natalizumab, Tysabri, for example. So yes, they can be prescribed. They're prescribed off, off license, but you've just got to find yourself a good pediatric neurologist who's prepared to do all the work to get them on the therapy. OK. Yep. Hi. Um, why don't they have regular MRI scans? Is there a reason for not doing it? It seems like it would be a benefit. So I, I guess this is um, historical and resource-based, but I think with these new, more effective drugs, as you've heard, we can have the clinical viewpoint, but it's much more powerful with the radiological viewpoint as well. So I think it's just changing the culture, and neurologists will start doing more and more MRI scans, which has resource implications, but nonetheless, to have the clinical plus the radiological is a very powerful combination, and I think necessary when you're dealing with these more powerful drugs. And also, for example, with Tysabri, mandatory, because we want to keep an eye out for any PML risk. Thank you. Sorry, quick. When you say resource, is that like NHS funding you're talking about? Ultimately. Money. Yeah. Hi. How can you know that your neurologist actually knows about MS? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pat so, Patrick, um, if you follow the blog, I've give, there's a list of questions I've put up there for people to ask the neurologist. And if you ask your neurologist those questions, he'll probably tell you who the hell is that Giovanni character. But um, you need to ask the questions, and if they can answer those questions uh, coherently, then you know. Mm. So that's why you do, you ask questions. But, but I think, seriously, I think with these more advanced 
and complex treatment regimes, it is vital to be under a neurologist that deals with multiple sclerosis for a large portion of their practice. I mean, I wouldn't try to deal with advanced epilepsy, for example, these days, because there's so many drugs available, and vice versa. And really, the whole this is a sea change. With beta interferon, you know, could kind of have a go, and that would be okay. But now with these new oral agents, monoclonal antibodies, you do need someone who knows the ins and outs of all of these drugs and how to move them around and how to keep an eye on the side effects and the adverse effects. Okay. Got a question here, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I've had um, relapsed remittance um, MS for about 14 years. Um, I was on Capaxone till about a year ago, and like the lady in front, I had um, injection site reactions, uh, so I came off it. I've been quite fortunate that I haven't had sort of any long-lasting um, symptoms, and so I took the view that I wouldn't take any, any um, medication for it. But from what you've said today, um, there's obviously other factors to consider, regard, um, notwithstanding the amount of relapses you have uh, in making that decision. I haven't had um, an MRI scan um, since the, the day I was diagnosed, so um, it's made me think that obviously other things are going on um, that need, need to be addressed. So, um, in your opinion, <laughs> uh, and obviously you can't give any advice, what what would your opinion be in, with somebody in, in my circumstances? Well, the, ch the chances are if you've been off therapy and you're doing very well clinically with no relapses or any progression, that your disease is probably uh, in, a, in a long remission phase. The, the odds would be favoring that. But to make that call, really, you know, uh, knowing what we know about this disease being the iceberg, we would really need more information than just your history and examination. So if, you were, if, if I was looking, I would definitely get an MRI scan and to look at you in more detail. We really can't make a judgment on pure clinical grounds. Thank you. Fine. Okay, fi final question here. Yeah, yeah lady at the front. Yeah. Um, expertise in terms of neurologists. Uh, I, uh, is there sort of a list somewhere that you can access to say, right, if, if you're in Manchester area, who would be an expert in what? I think often trusts have lists of the specialty departments and who's involved in that specialty. Um, but you could ask your neurologist or your general practitioner. Um, Nick, do you want to? Lists. Yeah, can I jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Get involved in the MS Society, talk to other people with MS, and that's, you'll then find out who the ones to, uh, which is the way that I did it. Um, because the people who are the patients soon find out who, the, who are the consultants who, who know about MS and the ones that don't as much or have an interest. Mm -hmm. But get involved in the MS Society, your local one, if there is one, and talk, meet with people, talk with people with MS, and you'll, you'll soon find out. And the MS Trust has also got on their website, the MS Trust has got a, um, a little map that shows you where the MS specialist services are. I don't know if they go drill down to the neurology, the, the neurologist, they may do. Yeah, both the MS Society and the MS Trust provide that sort of information. Um, and I, I would also recommend that people talk to their MS specialist nurse, because they're such a good route in, not just to your specialist neurologist, or I think that's really important, but to a whole range of other professionals too. So come to our website, have a look at the NEME section, and you'll find useful information. Well, we know that uh, everybody who wants to be here at MS Live can't be, but we have had a question from somebody who's watching live on the internet. So I'll briefly read it out. Um, they want to remain anonymous, but uh, I've been on Jelenia for two years. How long is it to, uh, how long is it safe to stay on this drug? And is there any evidence of problems with prolonged use? And is there any evidence of remyelination occurring uh, when on Jelenia? with symptomatic improvement also occurring at the same time? Do you want to...? No, I wasn't... Uh, yeah, I wasn't listening. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the extension data now, it, um, from the original yeah. pivotal trial, people have been on uh, Fingolimod now, Jelenia, for uh, over nine years, if I remember correctly, and it, it doesn't look like there's a long-term safety issue with the drug. In terms of the remyelination, there are some MRI studies mm -hmm. showing that in lesions that have areas that look like they demyelinated, the, the signal has changed, it's called MTR, to show remyelination. 
That may just be because the inflammation has been suppressed and the lesion has remyelinated spontaneously. It doesn't necessarily mean that the fingolimate, the gelenia, did that. Right. So um, although there are animal studies showing that uh, gelenia, gelenia does promote uh, myelination, the main safety effect long term is that because it's a drug that traps your lymphocytes in lymph nodes and stops you making uh, good immune responses, is infections particularly to new uh, or exotic infections. So th and th that doesn't change uh, whether you've been on the drug two, three, six, seven, or eight years. That risk remains. So um, people go have got to be vigilant on the drug that it is an immune suppressive drug, and they've just got to watch out for infections. Okay. Um, a number of you have talked about your different experiences. So, it, I mean, if you do want to share your experiences, please get in touch. Uh, with us at the MS Society and also with the press team and uh, contact Jenna or Ian and the email address is pressoffice at mssociety.org.uk. We're coming to the point where we're about to close the session but what I wanted to do is pick back up on the Jeremy Paxman point mm -hmm. and put a challenge to the panellists and I'd, li I'd like Mary to be the last person to say in one sentence, starting with you Gavin, uh, what your key message is to this audience? Uh, we just got to diagnose tr uh, and treat MS uh, as aggressively as possible early to make the difference to the population of people with the disease. Thank you. <laughs> Jeremy. I, I accept that, but I still think you need some individualization and stacking up the, the, the risks as well um, for these more potent drugs. I'm certainly not against early aggressive treatment, but uh, it may need to be more nuanced than that. I think there was a semicolon rather than a full, step in, full stop in that sentence. Uh, Nick? I agree with both of those, really. <laughs> um, but my sentence is probably we've made tremendous progress, but we also have a lot more to do, um, both for relapsing remitting MS and for progressive MS, so the fight goes on. Mary? I'd say when you're diagnosed, don't stick your head in the sand. Accept it, but move on because it's not the end of the world. And if you're offered things, then take them. Um, and believe me, it just keep moving, because if, I used to teach yoga. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. So keep moving, and you know, you'll get there. And I'd just say, finally, it's an issue that affects you very personally, but we're also a community of people affected by this issue. So please take part in our campaign, Treat Me Right, share your experiences, show your support, because I think together, as well as making sure you get the best treatment you can get for you, we can help each other to change attitudes out there and ensure that a larger number of people benefit from the big changes and the big opportunities are out there. I'll end with saying thank you very much to our speakers. Really, really appreciate your time. Wonderfully lively session, full of expertise uh, and commentary. And we wish you uh, a, a good journey home. So thank you very much. in the groove.